Ready to roll? Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to our 1 p.m. session of the May 11th, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are being in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meetings. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you have called in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. Please mute, <clears throat> excuse me, when it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Watkins? Here. Kalantari Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cummings? Uh, Councilmember Cummings is currently absent. Golder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner. Present. And Mayor Myers. I'm present. Okay, uh, today we're opening uh, with three presentations under our presentation agenda. First up are Parks and Recreation Child Care Staff Recognition. And our presenter will be Tony Elliott, our Director of Parks and Recreation. Oh, actually, Mayor Myers, Mayer, so it'll be myself, right? Hi, Rachel. Hi. Welcome. Rachel uh, Kaufman will be our you. presenter. Uh, recreation Superintendent, and I'll be joined by Robert Acosta as well, Recreation Supervisor for Teen and Youth Programs. So uh, good afternoon, Mayor Myers and City Council members. Um, I'm honored to be here today to recognize the hardworking heroes of City of Santa Cruz, our distance learning child care recreation leaders. And some are joining us here today as panelists on Zoom, as well as watching from home. Just a brief background on the program before I turn it over to Youth and Teen Supervisor uh, Robert Acosta for our presentation. Uh, when the pandemic hit last March and operations, including city schools closed, we all quickly had to adjust to the impacts. And one of the immediate needs that hit our essential first and foremost was the need for childcare. And in order to keep you know, core city operations functioning, the recreation team, including Loudon Nelson Supervisor Isa Ray, Youth and Teen Supervisor Robert Acosta, and Youth Coordinator Amanda Aries, quickly put together an essential worker childcare program for city staff. And remember, this was during the first month of the pandemic, and that there were so many unknowns about COVID and protocols were just developed by the state and you know, having to be researched by staff. And recreation leaders who worked at the teen center and in summer camps just immediately stepped up to the plate and uh, worked the all day childcare program to provide that critical support. And when we transitioned to our summer camp program, many of the staff continued to work the entire summer. Again, just providing that much needed childcare for working parents. And then as fall approached and city schools transitioned to distance learning childcare for working families, um, you know, there just remained a critical need there. And the youth and teen staff worked and trained with city school teachers to create the distance learning child program at the Loudon Nelson Center um, during the school year, which was an all day program that assisted the students with their distance learning during the day and provided recreation activities in the afternoon. And the program ran September through March until city schools transitioned to their hybrid model of in-person and distance learning. 
and the staff provided a safe space for kids to learn and play Monday through Friday, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And that is a long day to be kind of uh, on each day as they were responsible for keeping kids on track with their lessons, you know, play with them during recess, eat with them during their pods uh, assigned lunchtime, and then provide fun activities after school until they were picked up by their parents at the end of the day. And so today we just really want to recognize these caring, dedicated, and hardworking individuals who show courage and stepped up to help our community when needed. And I also want to recognize the maintenance staff at the Loudon Nelson Community Center who provided the daily sanitation and cleaning at the facility that made the program possible. So that's building maintenance worker and custodian Bob Duran, you know, who led the facility team in their cleaning protocols, and the facility attendant Emilio Galvan. And the programs just would not have been able to operate without their efforts. And they each take great pride in their work and are passionate about providing a safe space for our community to thrive in, and especially for the kids to continue their education. So just huge, well-deserved kudos to Bob and his team. And I also just want to recognize Friends of Parks and Recreation uh, support group, FOPAR, who awarded $14,600 of scholarship funds for kids to participate in the distance learning childcare program. And, and lastly, but certainly not least, just a huge thank you to Recreation Supervisor Robert Acosta and Recreation Coordinator Amanda Aries, who, who worked tirelessly to implement the program. They both provided a critical service to our community, and I'm honored to recognize them along with the staff today. They showed just unbelievable leadership for their team this year, and just a huge, huge thank you to them. And just with that, I want to turn it over to Robert Acosta to introduce you to the outstanding staff and just to talk more contributions. Thank you, Rachel. Um, hello, Mayor Myers and Council. It's an, it's an honor to talk to you guys, as always. Um, yeah, I did want to say a few things. I'm going to share my screen in a second, but, you know, it came to us in March, as you know, and we were told to plan a program for May. And typically, we start planning for our programs that start in June. We start that planning in November. So it was, go, let's do this. And um, But we did. We had to shift immediately. You know, I'm really upset a little bit that Amanda Aries couldn't be here, but she's actually had to, she's, she's taken a lead. She, everything's great. She's healthy and all that. But, you know, she was a really big part of making sure that this program was going to happen. She knows those CDC guidelines better than anyone. It's pretty funny. Like you could ask her any question, and she knew it. Um, and so she helped with our child care program in May, in the summertime for our summer camps, and then the program that started again in September that Rachel was talking about. And um, the funny thing is, when Rachel talked to me about doing this program. I freaked out because I we were going to have a dis on it, and I freaked out because I said we are not educators. That is a that is a different group of people, and it's not us. And 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 you know, much respect to educators, and you know, it's they're two different animals, you know. But we did the thing. We trained with Santa Cruz City Schools. We learned how to aid the students, and you know, that's that's what we did. I'm going to share my screen. Purely to show you a, the names of our people, because I think the names need to be out there, these heroes, as Rachel called them, to show, uh, to show, the, to show the hard work that they, that they did. So let me, let me get that started here. Can everyone see that? So. Everyone can see that, correct? So these are no, the names. It's these the presenter the, view now. Pardon me? On our end, we see the presenter view. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, and I appreciate it. Um, so these are the people that did it. These people that, that ran these programs did this amazing job. We got a call from Bayview Elementary School saying, uh, we know the 
people that are in your program because they're being helped and they're they're doing the work and not that trust me not that the parents at home couldn't do the job but you know when you're trying to do your own work and help your kids and chase the dog we understood so we were able to do to do this the people that did these programs the people just listed here have 126 years of experience with our city with our department um and all of them work other places throughout the county we had some of our employees leaving harbor high school after a full day work then come and work the afternoon for us we had had people who work in the live oak school district we have people that would leave our job and go to another job and like i said come there from from this job um some of these employees are former teen center members who are now working in their teen center that is closed to provide a child care program for the uh for the kids in the community. Because of this job, and one of my employees took a leave from their other job to continue to do this program just so they could, because they love working with youth so much. Um, and we had a hand, couple of employees that would leave their home in Watsonville to be at the Loudon Nelson Center for their 7.30 a.m. shift. This is the kind of stuff that they did to work for us. Um, since the program has ended, we have a staff member who um, who is now working at the house of one of those parents because they still needed childcare. So they're um, you know so they're doing they're still doing the work and it's pretty cool to see it. Um, there is I wanted to show you some some pictures. I unfortunately in the great world of Zoom I can't find those, but. Um, <laughs> I will say I will say uh, that most of those staff that worked for us this throughout this time are going to come back and work for us this summer. Uh, and a great thing too is we we do we do a uh, buddy request when you sign up for summer camps. You do buddy request during COVID so your kids could be with kids they know well. We got, we got buddy requests from parents who want their kids to be with the leaders who were in this child care program. <laughs> so I, to me, that's very telling and very exciting. And it just made me realize what, I mean, I knew it already, but it really made me realize, you know, what heroes our staff were. These are some of the kids in our, and you guys can see this now, right? We can, yeah. So these are the kids in their distance learning this is just it's a, a farther away picture, but this is during the distance learning time. This is time on the playground in in Loudon Nelson. We actually got a phone call from a parent saying, "Can you tell me that noise?" Like, well, there are actually kids out there now, so we got to uh, we got to help these kids with their distance learning, get them outside exercising, teaching them PE, doing all the different things that the kids have to do in order to. Um, do distance learning and at the same time create what we expect to be a quality recreation program. And I think we succeeded in that. And it's um, it was just a very a very good time and a very positive experience for me. And the last thing I want to show you is just a message from a parent who um, who just had who sent a letter to us. And I know it might be in that same view, but I will read this to you. Can you see this? Yes, we can. And I'm just going to read it to you as well. Um, I'd love to send our deep appreciation for the kind support Baron Erichel, Araceli, and Amanda and all the staff offered during such a critical time for our community, especially for working families. Personally, as a single mom, this was a priceless support, which I needed desperately. As an essential worker, a working parent, and a member of this community, I cannot tell you how great I are for the support the child care staff offered. Being able to have my child in the program allowed me to show up at my work in healthcare to support the health of our community. We are all interconnected and if parents are supported, we can all do better as a community. And that that is why that is why we do what we do. So I just wanted to to thank my people, you know, that worked for us there. 
I, they are, there is no better in the field. They, they do the best job, and I'm really looking forward to our youth in the community that are just looking forward to seeing them again to come to summer camps and continue the fun. And thankfully, nothing, no offense, but thankfully with no distance learning, just recreation. Um, so that's, that's my presentation. If anyone has any questions, I would love to answer them for you. Thank you, Robert and Rachel, um, and thanks to the whole Parks Department. Um, you guys did amazing work, and I knew several parents that were using, you know, your service. It, it just was amazing. So it takes a disaster or a pandemic to, to get creative. So thank you for everything that you and all your staff did this past year. Is there other council members that would like to either ask questions or have statements? I see lots of hands, boom, all went up. Renee, please, Council Member Boulder. So as the one that works at Bayview, I can attest to whoever you talk to that um, that's 100% true. And I just can't thank Rachel and Robert and the entire staff for all of the work that you guys did to bring this forward in such a short amount of time. It's just really a monumental task. And it just was astonishing to see how happy these kids were. And I saw them out being in the community at Neary Lagoon and you know, it just, I think, I, from the bottom of my heart, can't thank you guys enough for providing this super essential service to the youth in our community. Thank you. It was wonderful. Uh, Council Member Collins, Harry Johnson. Yes, I'd like to echo those sentiments. Um, as a mom school-aged kids, the last year has been incredibly hard, and these services are really invaluable. And, and heroes are exactly right. I mean. It, it, it really saved our community. So thank you, Rachel and Robert. Thank you to the whole team. Really, truly, truly invaluable what um, what the city did for our community and our families. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bruner. <clears throat> Rachel and Robert and uh, Amanda, and I see, or I saw JD um, on here. Thank you so much. I, uh, my son is grown now, but uh, I heard from many parents um, how appreciative they were that these services continued uh, through the pandemic and through the uncertainty and the unknown and really contributed to the well-being of children. And uh, thank you. And I, I just want to say a special shout out to Misha Levy and Araceli. Um, I know they've been, you know, they're they're part of a great team, but I've known them to be just amazing caregivers for over 10 years now, um, at least through Boys and Girls Club and so on. So thank you so much. I just want to acknowledge the hard work and, and appreciation. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Council Member Watkins. I too just want to thank you all and your entire team for really stepping up in a time where it was really a scary time, right? Also, we didn't, there was just a lot of uncertainty in terms of what, who and how and kids and the impact and, and the risk and also a commitment to see our essential services continue and not everybody has the opportunity to work from home, as challenging as that is, but also to be in the field and have your kids in a safe and nurturing environment is, is just incredible. Not every city stood up what you stood up, and it's so important to take these moments to celebrate all of the great work that you've accomplished, but also not to lose sight of how we can um, better inform and change our systems moving forward. So, um, your team, and uh, really just job well done, and thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Cummings? Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and echo the sentiments of my colleagues and, you know, express my deep appreciation for all the work that you all did. I mean, it was it was special for, you know, everyone in the city, but I can only imagine, you know, having children and then having to, you know, especially for some parents who are single parents as well, you know, how do you, you know, balance trying to provide income for your family and, you know, child care and, um, and it was, you know, the, the effort that you all were able to um, lift and that you all were able to move forward, uh, I think it's just, you know, it really goes to show how much our community cares about, you know, support 
supporting families and supporting, you know, our essential workers. And so I just want to thank you all for everything that you were able to do last year. And, um, you know, it really demonstrates how as a community, you know, during tough times, we're able to come together and take care of one another. And I think that you all really, you know, did a great job at helping to take care of, you know, the youth and the children of many of our working families. So thank you. Thank you, council member and council. I will just, I'll say ditto. Um, it, you know, thank you all so much for the work. It's just amazing. I mean, you already uh, go above and beyond uh, in the work that you do. Um, I, I know that. And uh, the, the way that you were able to bring this together, I think is a real reflection the the amazing city staff we have and uh, the connections in our community that allowed you to bring a, a team like this together at a time when um, everything what ha was so scary and uncertain and um, so I, I you know I just want to also acknowledge that uh, you know students who were able to ha have access to uh, uh, and um, in this way, um, like you said, the um, schools could tell, and I, I imagine absolutely. I, you know, we see so many young people who have been, you know, pretty traumatized by this experience, and um, so that support that you've given that those students, those young people, um, means so much, and I have much gratitude. Great. Thank you so much. It, it gave us a new respect. I mean, I've all, I have many friends and family in education, and it gave me a new it gave me a new respect for education for sure. It's like, okay, I see this. So, but thank you for the support of, of our management team, Rachel, Tony, and Lindsay, and Travis, and the city council and the commission. And we felt the support, and it feels good to be able to do what we do. So, thank you all for that. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so appreciate everything you guys do. And um, sounds like we're going to have a, a better summer this year. So that's exciting. It's great to see all the signups for, uh, for classes and everything else going on. So back to normal. Back to seeing the little red lifeguards walking up and down that hill. Yes. <laughs> right. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Next up, we have a uh, mayoral proclamation proclaiming May 16th through May 22nd as National Public Works Week. And we will have a presentation, but first I'm going to read a few lines of the proclamation, and then I'm going to turn this over to Mark Dettel, our Director of Public Works. Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, quality of life, and well-being of the people of the city of Santa Cruz. And whereas pr public works personnel provide essential services and thus are continuing to work hard each and every day to keep our communities functioning with various responsibilities related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas the City of Santa Cruz Public Works Department continues to be recognized as a regional leader in innovative and forward-thinking projects and services that include active transportation, infrastructure, waste and reuse, solid waste, energy efficiency, and sustainability. And whereas the year 2021 marks the 61st first annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association and is themed Stronger Together, in recognition of how the impact that citizens and public works professionals can have on their own communities is magnified and results in the ability to accomplish goals once thought unattainable. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the week of May 16th through 22nd, 2021, as National Public Works Week. And I'll go ahead and turn this over to Mark Gettle, our Director of Public Works. Congratulations, Mark. You've got a week, a week in your honor. Great, thank you. Actually, the honor of employees, I really appreciate it, Mayor Myers and members of the city council. Every year um, this week is recognized as Public Works Week and gives a little recognition to the hardworking employees that you have in the Public Works Department. And then although this has been a very strange year, Public Works continued to deliver core services and keeping our residents and businesses and visitors safe. Um, staff was very creative and, and had to be flexible to continue service deliveries. 
but they came up with innovative ideas and, and continued to make it happen and took whatever came their way. While much has been accomplished, many of the challenges still lie ahead. And as we accelerate towards recovery, I'm confident your dedicated and talented public works staff is ready to meet those challenges. I'd like to thank every employee in the public works department for their commitment to public safety and customer service and their professionalism in dealing with whatever came their way this past year and continues to come their way. It's my honor to work with them and I dedicate this proclamation to them, uh, your public works department. And this year, the theme is stronger together. Uh, I think that's really, really poignant, I would say. Uh, you heard the parks presentation um, pulling together. I think that that works with public works also. We are a community and we're working very strong together. In the past year, um, no years has proven more, more of this given the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the, C, the CZU complex fire on all of us and through it all delivered their services. To celebrate Public Works Week, previously in years, we've offered construction site tours, uh, facility tours, touch a truck, street fairs, uh, this year, we're going to try something new, and we need all of your help to make it a success. We, we're going to offer a fun and easy way for everyone to acknowledge Public Works Week by entering our Stronger Together Selfie Contest. This is stepping out there for Public Works. We don't do this kind of stuff, so we're going to give it a try. And we, need, <laughs> and we need your help. So to enter the contest, it's very simple. Just take a selfie that relates to one of our public works divisions, uh, and you see them listed here in traffic engineering and parking operations, which is streets, uh, uh, maybe traffic safety, uh, resource recovery, and wastewater systems. And take a selfie, and you can forward that to us through the public works uh, or our Facebook page by May 23rd, and all the instructions are on our website. And there are prizes to encourage more active use here. The top five winners in, will each receive $100 in downtown dollars, so you can come back and spend that money downtown and help support our businesses. Ten will, winners will get a $50 park card, and 25 winners will receive a $20 dollars wharf locals parking pass all these all these prizes support our local business and, and continue to seem stronger to be, stronger together all the details are on our website city of santa cruz.com backslash public works everyone is welcome to enter the contest so help us celebrate public works week well congratulations mark and thank you to all everyone in your department um we, we see some of them, but we see, I know we don't see most of them. And so anytime anyone in the city of Santa Cruz is riding their bike on a bike trail or, uh, you know, visiting the landfill or, uh, you know, basically also flushing your toilet. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you are, um, you are experiencing the wonderful work of our public works department and, um, uh, it's just great to be able to celebrate, um, the work of public works this week. Um, you really are the, the front lines for public health and safety, as well as transportation and active recreation and so much of what we enjoy here in Santa Cruz. So, um, again, we're, we're lucky to have such a capable and accomplished and nationally recognized public works department. So congratulations, Mark, and happy to open this up to um, any council member comments. And also, well, most importantly, I, I, have, I have one other item, yeah. Madam Mayor. And as you know, the city completed the first segment of the rail trail um, with the rebuilding of the trestle walkway. And this innovative project extended the walkway off the existing trestle, eliminating the need for a new bridge and saving millions of dollars. This, this project has been recognized um, for numerous awards and we actually received an additional award. And I'd like to introduce Chris Schneider 
the assistant director, engineer. It was his his innovative design team that came up with this innovative approach. And Chris is here to present that award. So Chris. All right, thank you, uh, Mayor, Council Members, and Mark. Um, this is, you know, um, uh, clearly an example of Stronger Together. Um, the project you see before you, um, the trestle walkway under construction, is the first uh, segment of the rail trail that was constructed. Um, Bonnie, can you go to the next slide? You were doing the slides for me, right? There we go. So, you know, the project was originally uh, conceived in 1987 as part of the uh, work on uh, the San Lorenzo River design concept. And what's important about that is just to recognize that these planning documents are where we get a lot of our projects. And these planning documents get a lot of public input. Um, and so, you know, it's important to think that something that's 30, 40 years old is still really valuable today uh, because at some point in time, we're gonna get the money and the effort to put these wonderful projects together. Um, originally, this was owned by Pacific and they were gonna tear the walkway down because they saw it as a liability. Um, the city uh, took on the project to uh, make it a little bit better, to make it safe and to actually maintain it into the future for uh, public access. The project had um, on the Western ramp was constructed, um, you know, a few years ago with the anticipation that we we're gonna have a wider path. The one on the east side was constructed with the East Cliff Bridge and that was built, I think it was under construction during the earthquake. Um, so over 30 years ago, was also in anticipation of uh, an, a, a bigger project. It complements a lot of uh, pedestrian and bike projects that we have done on the San Lorenzo River Walk, as well as uh, the Beach Street Bikeway. And it supports all the city goals, which is uh, really critical. Next. Um, environmental permitting and funding. When we look at a project early on, we try to figure out a way to reduce um, the environmental impacts and uh, the, the amount of permits and the conditions on the permits by making uh, the project um, easier to construct and again, having fewer impacts. In this case, what was critical was finding a way to not touch the river. Touch water, whether it's the river or the ocean or creeks, you're increasing the complexity of the environmental review and the per permitting requirements, as well as the funding. It gets a lot more expensive. In this case, uh, the land trust uh, paid for a feasibility study to attach a walkway to the uh, trestle bridge that was not going to touch the river. And it turned a feasible idea, so we went with that in a, a particular um, later with the environmental review and design. Um, this project took five years and people go, well, why did it take so long? Actually, five years is pretty short. Um, it could have been sooner if we'd had all the money at once, but um, really what happens is on pieces as we move into the future and often to get construction money, you have to have the environmental review done and um, uh, the design done. And uh, so that's uh, why also it may take a little bit longer. But again, if we had touched the water, this project could have easily been another 10 years and uh, you know, four or three times as expensive. So this is really important. Um, next. The, the, uh, the approach was to remove the old walkway, build some scaffolding under there, and then uh, design a steel uh, support system that is protected from the environment with uh, galvanizing. They did a lot of the work off-site um, and brought the, and fitted the pieces on-site. And uh, so there was very little actual uh, field welding or bolting that took place on-site. The contractor that we had for, for that was part of the team, Cushman Contracting um, near Santa Barbara, uh, they were just a wonderful group to work with. They came up with this scaffolding idea that um, was uh, better and cheaper than any of the other contractors that had proposed on the project. They were great to work with. Their submittals were on time. Their um, 
uh, construction scheduling was just excellent, and they're just a bunch of great people. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the innovations, not touching the water, using the existing uh, structure, um, you know, bolting uh, and welding assemblies off-site and bring them onto the project, using a lightweight fiber-reinforced polymer decking um, made a big difference as far as the structural uh, integrity of the project and to reduce the weight on the old bridge. Next. Um, so they, uh, the contractor used the actual trestle to, uh, with, uh, some, to actually work from there uh, to place a lot of the steel, and so that helped a lot with getting the uh, project done on time and within schedule. Um, I think we already talked about the other items there. Next. Just some of the pictures you can see on the picture to the left the um, eucalyptus tree, that was the only tree that was potentially going to be removed. Uh, we ended up uh, saving it as the um, roots were not impacting where the, uh, the path was being uh, reconstructed. Next. Uh, construction, uh, bringing in a crane to place two larger beams for the, um, for the west end. Photographs there. Next. Uh, the finished product. This is really the, one of the most well-used and loved uh, projects we've had in a number of years. Even when the project was, or when the path was removed and it was being constructed and people can use it, they were riding by on East Cliff, you know, telling the contractor how much they loved the, and, and, and were anticipating the new path. We had very few that people had to go almost a mile around to get back to their original path. It was really um, great, great uh, support from the public. Next. Um, so we've received five awards, uh, which is pretty amazing uh, for projects. We usually get one or two. Uh, the League of Cities, uh, the um, ACE, which is the, um, uh, the American uh, Consulting Engineering uh, Groups, American Public Works Association, American Society of Civil Engineers, and the California Trails and uh, Greenways. Um, we, we couldn't have done all this without just having a great team. And the photograph is a part of the project team to the right. At a number of local consultants, MME Engineering designed the project, uh, Dale Hinsby um, was great in uh, working with the RTC on the design requirements as well as the railroad. And then all the contractors and their team that were great. Uh, the environmental review was by Harrison Associates. Kate Giberson, who's also local, uh, led that effort. And um, we just really had a, um, a wonderful team that worked on that. Uh, next slide. And again, that was all the, the people that worked on the project, most of which the consultant teams were um, all local. Uh, Ifland Engineering, uh, Deese and Associates, uh, RM, uh, who've done the design on our rail trail projects, Harrison Associates, Ecosystems West, and Rincon Consultants, all um, a great local team. Um, and then Dale Hinsby and Rodney Cahill and their team at a MME um, who've done a number of projects for us in the city as well. Uh, next. And then we have our own self for submitting for um, <laughs> the award. Uh, that's me with one of the awards. And then uh, to your left is uh, Miguel Lazaraga, who was our project inspector, who's assistant engineer in the Public Works Department. And then uh, Ricardo Valdez on the other side, with the other two awards. And Ricardo's an associate engineer, was the project manager. Um, he's recently uh, promoted to uh, senior engineer uh, in traffic engineering, um, moving from general engineering over to the traffic section. Anyway, it's been a great project. It was one that uh, went, it didn't always went, it didn't all go smoothly because it's construction, but because of the quality of the people 
and uh, the collaboration that we had on the project, it went very well. Anyway, thank you for recognizing APWA, uh, or American Public Works Association Week, and um, all the wonderful people that work. And I, I want to acknowledge Parks and Rec, too, because uh, our employees took advantage of their program, and that allowed them to, do, to work on some other wonderful projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, uh, and congratulations. It's a, it's a great, great bridge to go on. Yep. Um, really enjoy it. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you. I just wanted to express um, not only my appreciation for our Public Works Department, all the work that they do, but um, really uh, just acknowledge the appreciation of that, the, the path that was created on the bridge and um, the fact that you all are winning, you know, continuing to win awards for that um, just goes to show how great it is. Uh, as someone who lives in the beach flats, I take that route every day to kind of go grab coffee. And from what it was to what it is now, it's such an improvement, um, not only for, you know, people being able to go across it, but, you know, in terms of safety, because previously it was so narrow trying to get across. I know people were always wondering, like, how can we – get something better and you know the fact that you all were able to put such an amazing um you know path through our community that's highly utilized and um it's such high quality i just want to express how grateful uh, i am and i know many members of our community are for the work that you all were able to do for that and i'd just like to say that you you all deserve all those awards and then so thank you thank you thank you council member uh next i have council member brown Yeah, I just wanted to uh, appreciate the all of the work that Public Works staff do on the ground to keep the city um, functioning. And uh, you know, in addition to these amazing projects that um, that come forward, um, just the day to day uh, you all do uh, really appreciate it. <laughs> and um, you know, the bridge obviously is um, something that. Uh, we all can be proud of, and uh, so that is, you know, I mean, it's amazing, you know, have, it's just the, the difference between, the, I think um, uh, Council Member Cummings said, the difference between uh, riding your bike across that bridge now um, yeah. and the way we did it for uh, decades before, um, it's a di difference, it's amazing. Um, I did, um, as, because I'm on the RTC uh, uh, Commission. I also um, just wanted to say that I, I believe that the um, you know the land trust has been an amazing partner um, in the process of developing our our rail trail uh, <clears throat> segments, and so I just wanted to acknowledge them as well for their work in this piece of it, and so appreciate everything you've done to bring it to fruition. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I have Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much to the Public Works teams. Uh, Chris, thank you for that presentation and those photos. Amazing project. I was there when it was groundbreaking day. I remember it was quite an accomplishment. And Mark, thank you for leading the Public Works team. I really want to acknowledge the maintenance workers that do the day-to-day -day things to keep our, our city clean and safe, and that includes our restrooms downtown and the maintenance and the restocking of toilet paper, constantly mopping floors, sidewalk scrubbing, emptying, you know, refuse and garbage. Um, all of the things that we don't stop to think about and acknowledge. And every time I see any of them, seeing them for, um, you know, their hard work and through the pandemic. So what a great um, week to have to be able to honor all the hard work. So thank you. Thank you. That's great. And... Didn't miss anyone. I have Council Member Colin Johnson and then Council Member Walk. Great. Yes, I'd also like to gratitude for the work that you all do. I, I know that it often goes unnoticed, um, but we notice it and we are grateful. Um, thank you so much. And I plan on dragging my kids out there and doing some selfies. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much. Great. Council Member Watkins. 
I too just want to say thank you. And it's so nice to have our meeting start off with these celebrations and acknowledgements of just the everyday work that keeps our city going. So an extended entire team and staff. Um, just echoing my, my colleagues' comments in regards to the bridge, it's amazing and awesome to see how it's being recognized. And yes, I know that we used to cross that bridge all the time. And, um, you know, you, you sort of like hold your, like hold everything in as the bike or the stroller comes by. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so beautiful now. And it's just such a way to access all parts of our city. And it's just, you know, just kudos to, to your recognitions as well. And just appreciation for your, um, you know, just acknowledgement of the stronger t together and the cross between, you know, the staff that provides these daily activities to keep our city running with our Parks and Rec team that provided the child care amongst really challenging times. So, indeed, we are stronger together, and I look forward to seeing some really awesome selfies. And nice to see you, Chris, and your team kicking it off with a really cool selfie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Chris, and please um, extend the council's uh, congratulations on Public Works Week, but also all just the great work that you guys do. So thanks so much. All right. Thank you very much. We will, definitely. Great. Okay. Next up, uh, we have a presentation on City Workplace Reopening Plan, and uh, this will be Lisa Murphy, our Human Resources Director. Welcome, Lisa. Hi. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council Members. My shout out to the Parks and Recs and the and Public Work employees thank you for all their good work. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to present to you our City of Santa Cruz Workplace Reopening Plan, and I'm going to share my... Okay, great. So thank you again. This is the uh, City's work, Workplace Reopening Plan through COVID-19. Uh, this plan is our opportunity to share with the community and to codify all of the things that we are doing presently to keep our employees safe and to service our community and for uh, our opportunity to, to make sure that we are following our plan and to uphold our, our obligations to our community and to keep our employees safe. This workplace reopening plan documents our principles, the logistics, and our operations through the different tiers as we move through. And as you know, we may be moving uh, to, the, to the yellow tier and beyond quite quickly. So this plan, while it documents our, our, where we are today, it will also document as we move into the future. It balances our operational approaches with our safety restrictions and our employees' personal needs. Again, this is a communication tool, and please be aware, this is an evolving document. It will change. It will probably change next week, as I just received a new email regarding OSHA's uh, updates for our workplace standards. The development of this document, we utilized some five guiding principles. Employee health and safety was number one. The status of the schools in our child care, our public health guidelines, the vaccination ability, availability, and obviously what tier we are in. Utilizing these principles is how we created this workplace reopening plan. So as we started this planning process, there was really three phases. It was the planning, the research, and communication. Then in April, develop our operational assessments and where we are today with a full reopening plan. In this first phase, what we had looked at was we had each of the departments assess their current and future operations, and they participated in a study, a survey, excuse me. Uh, continuing our, our open communication with our employees and to balance the sensitivity of their needs with the operational needs. I've been noticing with the bargaining units and the employees of our reopening plan. And we have been preparing our employees for re-entering, retraining on onboarding of safety protocols, work hours, and et cetera. In the second 
part is really where we got down to developing our plans for each department. It's really important to be flexible. Every department needs the setup. It's, everything's different and needs to be really tailored to approach for each department. However, it was really important that as the directors work with their staff, they were consistent with those principles that I mentioned earlier. Again, return to work varies for each department. Though, is employee safety. And then secondarily is we need to keep communicating with our employees where we are, what are we going to do, what are the expectations, and how are we keeping you safe. So the, the plans for each department have been completed. I'm going to put them up on the web after this meeting. The format of how each director and their staff went for the, to develop their plans is we had three different tiers. So we, I had them complete this form for each of their facilities. What does it look like in the orange tier? What about the yellow tier? And what about when we're in the all clear? What does that mean? What does that look like? So each one of the, the, the facilities had to develop a staffing plan. What are your public counter hours? What about your meetings? How are you going to conduct your meetings? What facilities are you going to open or are you going to stay closed? What's your vehicle usage? What are your worker safety policies? And overall guidance of the bare minimum baseline with worker safety is that we will follow Cal OSHA rules, we'll follow the state and local public health orders and the CDC guidelines. So each one on the attachment to the plan will have for each department will have their outline of what, how they'll move through these tiers. Now, some departments may not want to reopen all of their counter, even when we are in the all clear and limit their counter hours, working with the employees to see what works best for them. Some things to keep in mind as we go through this, the reopening stages, there's things that we can control and that we got, we've got to keep communicating as to what does that look like? Because again, it's going to evolve. We can control our physical facilities. We can control our operational strategies and we can control our personal behavior. With regards to the operational strategies, things that we have done to help reduce our contact and our, our exposure is we have staggered schedules for our employees, adjusted our field work, implemented cleaning protocols, where possible single occupancy vehicles. Many of us have moved over to online services, uh, not just regular open hours. You have to schedule uh, in person. If you want to do in person, do it uh, by appointment only. And this actually, as we've come to learn from many of us, has really been successful and provided better service to our customers, internal and external. Obviously, one that we continue to utilize and will continue to do uses Zoom, even into the future, or even another platform. Other operational strategies, obviously, is continuing telecommuting. And that is something we'll, we'll most likely continue into the future. Other things we can control is our facilities. One of our statistics I'd like to share with you is that uh, as of this uh, beginning of May, we had 29 confirmed positive employee COVID cases for the city of over 800 employees, none of those that we have been able to document as employee to employee transmission. They were transmissions that occurred at home. And so that is a testament to how uh, well our employees are adhering to the safety protocols and uh, standards. And some of those which you're all very familiar with, obviously the plexiglass barriers, the signage on the floors, the capacity, sanitizing stations, entrance enforcement, such as screening uh, for employees and for contractors. And finally, the thing that we really is, is most difficult, but it's really our own personal behavior and how are we behaving in, in the workplace and in our community. The biggest thing to remember is that we need to be flexible, that the environment is changing. This is a uh, scary time for employees to come back who may have been very much working at home and isolated and coming back into communities and uh, groups of people. We have to change our mindset about spacing between each other and overcrowding. We'll continue to be patient. 
and how we interact with each other. We can continue to follow the guidelines and we may be even more stringent than what the local public health orders might come down on the face mask. We're working with employees to, for their comfort level of how do they feel about uh, maintaining face masks even when you're vaccinated. And obviously the choice to, make vac to be vaccinated. All of these things come together to guide our plan to remain flexible, open, uh, and to, to be ready to adjust as we move into the different tiers and make sure that we're communicating with our employees and our, our community. I have brought all of this to our, our bargaining groups and tomorrow, is it tomorrow? Yeah, we'll have an all employee meeting and we'll, we'll be presenting this tomorrow to all of our employees as well. And with that, that concludes my presentation on our reopening plan. You'll be able to find it on our website on the COVID-19 banner head uh, towards the end of the day. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them from you. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, thank you for all your work um, in creating the plan. And also just um, wanted to just say a personal thanks to all our employees for everything they've done over the last year and a half. Um, and uh, yeah, just amazing work um, from top to bottom and um, very relieved to see that, you know, employee transmission was, looks like non-existent, which is wonderful. And um, it's a testament to everybody's hard work during these really trying times. Um, I see that Vice Mayor Bruner her, has her hand up. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Thank you, Lisa, uh, for sharing that. Uh, my question was the all employee meeting landed in my council calendar. So um, is that for us to attend as well? It, it sounds like it will be informational. I believe you're invited to attend as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Is there any other council member questions for Lisa at this point? Okay. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thank you. Okay. Next up, um, I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items the council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are items number 12 through 21 on the uh, agenda with the exception of item 20 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions to today's agenda. There are none. Thank you. I'd like to also just make an announcement regarding oral communications today. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item number 19 on today's agenda. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item number 19. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on our closed session. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor Myers, members of, this, of the city council. This uh, morning, the council met in closed session by a, a Zoom at 9.30 a.m. to uh, discuss the following matters, uh, item one, was public employment involving the uh, city manager recruitment. Item two was a conference with labor negotiators. Council met with uh, its negotiator, uh, uh, HR director Lisa Murphy to discuss the OE3 and SEIU temporary employees uh, negotiations. Item three was real property negotiations. Council met with and gave instructions to its negotiator a public works director Mark Dittle with respect to the following uh, properties uh, 11, 26 to 28, 
1126 to 1128 East Cliff Drive, 1130 East Cliff Drive, 1134 East Cliff Drive, 1140 East Cliff Drive, 1148 East Cliff Drive, 1152 to 54 East Cliff Drive, and 1156 East Cliff Drive. Um, then it concerned the acquisition of a pipeline easement uh, adjacent to the San Lorenzo River along uh, East Cliff Drive in that location. Uh, item four was liability claims. The council met uh, with its legal counsel uh, concerning the claim of the UC Regents of California against the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, that is also listed as item 16, I believe, on your consent calendar this afternoon. There were two in litigation. Uh, item one was Regents of the University of California at all versus the city of Santa Cruz, currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Item two was Santa Cruz Homeless Union at all versus the city of Santa Cruz, currently pending in the United States District Court for the Northern District of California in San Jose. Uh, item six was a conference of legal counsel concerning litigation, uh, in specifically significant exposure to litigation, and the council uh, discussed one matter of significant exposure. There was no reportable action. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. I'd now uh, move on to item number 10 on our agenda. This is the city manager report. I'll invite uh, city manager Martine Bernal to make the report today. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. I have uh, three items for you today. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic, an update on encampments, and also a recognition of National Police Week. I'll first start with uh, our fire chief, uh, Chief Hyduke, who will do an update on the COVID-19 pandemic status in our county. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Mayor, City Council, Jason Hyduke, your fire chief. And uh, today, um, I'm going to start on some sobering news and hopefully end on some more hopeful news for us as a whole. Um, two weeks ago at our last city council meeting, uh, I showed you the John Hopkins uh, COVID dashboard. And since that time, nearly 11 million new cases have been reported worldwide with a really significant portion uh, being in India itself, in the midst of a uh, large outbreak there. And unfortunately, it does not look like that is slowing down. Um, so cases are still going up, even though um, you know we're getting uh, in front of a spread with with vaccinations and whatnot. Next slide. So bringing it um, from uh, the worldwide view back here, to, um, and this has been updated uh, as of about 45 minutes ago. Um, so it's actually better news than what I'm showing you. And this is statewide showing that. Our cases per 100,000 uh, within the state are at 3.6 per 100,000. Um, and, and as you can see, this is a rolling seven day average. And um, you know the graphs are showing that we are definitely heading in the right direction, especially when compared to the world or in the nation. Um, bringing it down to the uh, Santa Cruz, if we can go to the next slide. So here in Santa Cruz, um, one of the key indicators that was keeping us in the orange, uh, cat or orange tier was we were just above 2% uh, cases per 100,000 uh, for our adjusted. And uh, this one shows 1.7. Uh, that's when I grabbed it this morning. It was just updated and it's at 0.5. So if we can stay within that till next week, we should be able to uh, move into the yellow tier, which is the good news. So all the indicators are uh, moving in the right direction. We were held in the orange tier just by the smallest of margins. And then if you look at, uh, there's been no new deaths, um, which is a great indicator and one of the reasons why we've been taking all these precautions. Um, like Lisa Murphy uh, talked about reopening the city and all the all the, um, the PPE and the precautions. And this is really what we want. We wanna see low transmission. We wanna see low um, hospitalizations and no deaths. So here locally within Santa Cruz, we're doing better than the state. Um, and uh, that's good news. Next slide. So again, uh, looking at the statewide, uh, the number of vaccines uh, going into arms has gone up pretty significantly. And here in Santa Cruz County, um, almost 270,000 doses uh, have uh, two people. Um, one of the issues that we're seeing right now is that there's actually a growing uh, supply of vaccine and not enough people who are actually getting vaccinated. Um, and so, Again, I've said this last time, but uh, I urge everyone, if you are eligible to get a vaccine, to get a vaccine. That is what will get us out of this, um, this pandemic that we're in. Next slide. 
So this is um, vaccinated group by status. And um, if you look at the 18 to 49, uh, you know, we're approaching um, almost 60%. We're a little over 57% either have full vaccine or at least one shot in their arm. All people who are eligible. That 50 to 64 group um, is close to 85%, and the 65 and over is um, over 80% as far as people who've been fully vaccinated or have at least one vaccine uh, shot. So they're partially vaccinated. And that's here within uh, Santa Cruz County. Within North County, um, we are um, almost at 70% people have received either uh, full vaccination or at least one shot in that process. So our numbers here are really looking good, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we're seeing those um, indicators for the orange tier, the yellow tier, and just the uh, lack of hospitalization for COVID, as well as the, um, the, the number of deaths. Next slide. So um, again, right now, today, um, all who are 16 and over are eligible for vaccine. And I'll keep plugging these sites, but go to myturn.ca.gov or go to santacruzhealth.org and that will show you where you can get vaccines. Um, I, uh, I have a child who's 15 and a half, so I've been watching this really closely, wondering you know, uh, when we're gonna be able to get a uh, vaccine for that uh, younger age group. Tomorrow on the 12th, the CDC is having their meeting and by tomorrow afternoon, they should um, approve use of the Pfizer vaccine for that age group of 12 to 15, which will really kind of complete that, um, you know, the population that we have here and get us back to normal. So all indications are that that will be approved, that that, that will be available. And so again, go to those um, websites, the My Turn or SantaCruzHealth.org, find out what providers, um, you know, you can sign up for an appointment, either for yourself if you're currently eligible or after tomorrow, all expectations are that we will be able to vaccinate that 12 to 15 age group, uh, which will really help with getting people back to normal. Uh, taking the workload off of Parks and Rec for running, um, you know, schools, which they normally don't do in daycare and whatnot. So it's good news um, for us here locally. Um, we're still not done with the pandemic as a whole, but all indicators are that we right in that right direction. Next slide. And so again, I'll keep plugging this uh, every single time. Uh, take those steps you can to minimize transmission, uh, washing your hands, wearing a mask, keeping your distance, don't come, uh, don't leave home if you're sick, and then uh, go to santacruzhealth.org to find the list of providers um, that you're eligible for to, to get a vaccine. And uh, especially after tomorrow, give that approval at the CDC level for that age cohort uh, that we're able to include them and the overall number of people within our community that uh, can really blunt the spread of COVID and get us back to normal. Um, that's a report I have for you, and we're happy to answer any questions if you have them. Chief Hydrick, is there questions from council on this item? Very good news. We're still going the right way. Thank you, Jason. Okay, thank you. Um, next, I'll have uh, Lee Butler do an update on the uh, campus. Thank you, Martine, and good, after, good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Um, I'm going to update you on two things, um, the bench lands in San Lorenzo Park and then Highway 1 and 9. And um, first, I'm happy to report that the team has implemented a successful move at um, San Lorenzo Park. The, um, the team first um, moved individuals from the bench lands up into the upper areas of the park so that the area could be prepared. And then um, they put various resources down into the park and began moving people down. That move has been um, completed and all of the refuse has been cleaned out of the top area of San Lorenzo Park. The county is um, providing services out there at the park, outreach services through the HOPES team and um, the HPHP team. Um, and um, we um, are still um, under the federal injunction, which you all know um, has another hearing um, later this week on Thursday. Um, and I just want to acknowledge here um, the great work that the team put in on this. We had um, a whole lot of uh, staff time between um, the city manager's office and police and fire, parks, public works, water. Um, we, we really had a team effort and want to appreciate uh, the, the great work that went into that um, 
smooth move between um, the bench lands to the top and back down. Um, and then uh, secondly, I wanted to update you. Uh, you're probably all aware that um, Caltrans, um, they posted 72-hour notices to vacate at the intersections of Highway 1 and 9. Um, that was on Friday last week, and um, they began the up on uh, Monday, yesterday. And um, our understanding that that is progressing smoothly at this point, and it's, it's continuing today. And I am available for any questions that you may have. Are there any council members with questions? Council member Cummings, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you for that update. I, I've been hearing um, about other encampments, so like Harvey West, and I think there's an area along the San Lorenzo River as well. There's other encampments down there. And I'm just wondering because, you know, I just want to make sure that the information we're receiving is correct. Are those uh, encampments also being cleared currently or what's, what's kind of happening with those as well? Because I'm getting emails from people saying that, you know, the city's going out and clearing all these areas and where those people are going to go if they try to go to the bench ones they can't get in there. So I just, and, and then I think the biggest concern is that um, if those areas are clear, the people are going to go into Poconet or some of the other open spaces. So just like to understand kind of, you know, what's happening um, overall in terms of how people are going to get connected to any are available or, um, you know, kind of what's happening in those other areas. As well. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Councilmember Cummings. And you're, we share that concern with individuals moving into the Poconip and other fire prone areas. Um, right now, there is one other area that we are working on, um, one encampment, and that is um, at um, Harvey West Park um, in the Friendship Garden area, so the very back um, area of Harvey West Park. There's a group of roughly 30 campers out there, and we've been coordinating with the um, individual who has sort of organized that group, and we've also been coordinating with the campers out there, and, um, and we are putting plans together to have them move to the bench lands um, in an area south of the pedestrian bridge. So, so right now, everyone from San Lorenzo Park moved to the north side of, um, of the pedestrian bridge. And um, we are working with those individuals um, who are currently camped at Friendship Gardens to relocate them to the um, bench lands south of the pedestrian bridge area. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bruner? Unmute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Council Member Cummings did bring up my question, received some emails regarding Harvey West Park. And so um, that answered the first part of that question. Um, and can you just explain why that's being moved? Sure. So um, Parks has had um, a, a number of issues that have risen out there, and um, we have uh, that use, uh, that area is actually rented out. Um, you know, there's a picnic area that's rented out, and we've got campers coming in for the, um, the summer camps. And so it's really a combination of issues with, um, you know, that area being right adjacent to um, potential fire hazard areas, as well as some of the issues that have, um, that Parks has seen, um, as well as the other alternative uses there. And so all of those things have um, uh, led to this situation. And really, you know, we're, we're in the, a COVID reaction scenario where we're still um, responding to the, the COVID um, uh, crisis that Jason was just highlighting. Okay, uh, that's helpful to know. And so it was it was somewhat of a temporary um, space that was allowed, but um, in preparation for the the upcoming some potential summer use and uh, picnic areas and wildfire risks. 
which brings me to pogo nip and wildfire danger there. Are there any uh, encampments there as well that you know of? Um, there are, we are aware of some individuals um, in Poganip. Our, our parks team went out last week, um, and I believe the fire team is going out next week or the week uh, following um, on reconnaissance, both to understand um, the risks associated with encampments, but fires also going out to look at the, um, the fuel that's out there, um, and Jason could speak to what he's going to be doing out there next week if um, if you'd like. I, I was curious if they would be directed also to Benchlands. At this point, the number, the capacity that we have at Benchlands is going to be very constrained. Um, you know, we have um, expanded slightly, um, however, um, there is not going to be capacity for everyone um, at the benchlands, and that's part of what we're doing as we're going out and really assessing how many individuals are in these areas. Okay, and really quick, can you just again clarify HOPE's team and HP, what that stands for? Uh, the HPHP is Homeless Persons Health Project, and uh, the HOPES team, I, uh, the acronym itself is uh, slipping. If anyone else can jump in, I appreciate it. But it's essentially, uh, it's a multidisciplinary team at the county level that provides a variety of outreach services and uh, aims to connect um, individuals to um, the, the various resources that the county operates. Great, thank you. Um, great, that was, those were my questions, appreciate it. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Brown. Uh, yeah, uh, just a couple of questions and then a comment uh, reiterating concerns about the Pogo Nip. Uh, so you said that park staff have had issues with uh, folks at the uh, Friendship Garden Encampment. I'm just wondering if you could uh, provide a little bit more information about what that means. Sure, and I'll you, ask. It. I'll look I have one you. other question. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I see Tony's on the line. I'll, I'll see if he wants to jump in and um, and clarify. And I will um, also, while he's jumping on, Homeless Outreach Proactive Engagement Services, HOPES. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. All right, to follow up on the other question, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council, uh, Tony Elliott, Parks and Rec. Uh, we've seen a number of issues at the Friendship Garden encampment from uh, drug use, perceived drug dealing, uh, illegal timber harvesting, uh, terracing of the hillsides, uh, destruction uh, of property, um, and so forth. Thanks, that's helpful. And then another question uh, about the, um, oh, any sense of the timeline? Uh, so I have actually two more questions. Any sense of the timeline for uh, moving the encampment. I ask this because, um, you know, we're, I'm sort of, I feel like I'm hearing a little bit conflicting information um, in the questions I'm asking of folks um, behind the scenes or not during the meet this public meeting um, that about the, you know, what's anticipated when the move w will be likely to happen. Um, and uh, I think particularly given the fact that this is a group um, that at least the conversations I've had with people who are camping there as well as, um, you know, Brent Adams, who's been trying to, you know, help facilitate the, the conversation and, and um, you know, move forward. I have heard from a lot of people that, they, you know, many of them left the um, San Lorenzo Park area and they're, you know, they just really are um, worried about moving back into the benchlands. Um, and are, you know, I know that there's been requests for looking for alternative siting, particularly given the, the concerns about that and the fact that um, we're out, of, we're running out of space in the benchlands and the potential for that just to be more people moving into the Pogo Nip um, with all the fire danger. It seems like it would be in our interest to um, try to identify some alternative. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. 
So um, we did hear those concerns from individuals, and one of the things that the individuals requested was uh, delineated fencing um, in that area, and so we are working to um, get that fencing um, as well as hygiene resources ordered for the park. Um, I would say as far as timeline, it is gonna be um, dependent upon um, how quickly we can get some of those um, resources in place, but it could be as soon as a week. Um, I can tell you um, when um, a number of us were down there meeting with Brent and others yesterday, um, we had a, a camper show up and say, hey, when can we move? You know, So there are people who are interested in, in coming over, but there were also some of those concerns as well. And uh, having that physical separation um, was one of the things, not only um, with the fencing, but also um, the placement um, south of the Ped Bridge and trying to provide as much uh, separation as possible so that we could um, uh, recognize and respond to the concerns that were raised by some of those campers. Thank you. Um, I think, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thanks, Council Member. Uh, I have uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. I just thought of one more question in this conversation uh, with the separation of uh, what I'm understanding the, the Harvey West Park Friendship Garden Camp would be south of the pedestrian bridge separated from the other benchlands portion and with fencing separating the two, would there also be separate um, restrooms, hygiene stations? We are um, procuring additional hygiene stations for the, the newly relocating camp on the south side of the Ped Bridge as well. But not restrooms? Yes, yes, so restrooms, oh. hand washing, the both. Hygiene stations means the whole thing. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, so so uh, restrooms, hand washing, not not showers or laundry or anything, but restrooms and hand washing. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. Thank you, Lee. Um, Chief, did you, Chief Hodges, did you want to discuss or update us on some of the fire related question, fire risk related questions that have come up? Yeah. So um, first of all, you know the. A fire that doesn't start is the best one. And we are moving into a wildland season that is has the potential to eclipse last year just because of the fuel moistures um, and the lack of rain. Uh, things are ahead of schedule within the state. They're ahead of schedule here. We've been in red flag warning just on the other side of the hill. Our saving grace uh, this morning is fog, and so that coastal marine influence. But as we get closer into June, July, um, those fuels are going to be re very receptive to catching on fire. Um, and within Poganip, which is our largest continuous open space, all of our fires in that area have been human caused, uh, not lightning, not other activities. And so whether they're intentional or unintentional, that is our ignition source. And um, last year we went out and we identified all, all of those ignitions uh, that were primarily within encampments. Um, and then in August, uh, right as the CZU fire was coming down the valley, we uh, evacuated all those people from that Sycamore Grove, Lower Poganip area. And uh, that was something that was in motion prior to the CZU fire because of that risk. And so they were moved for two reasons. One, they were at risk if the fire came into uh, the city limits. And then they were also at risk of uh, being the ignition source for a fire. Next week, we'll be going out and doing our proactive outreach that um, we've been doing on an annual basis for those folks out there. And then when fuel conditions get to that point that are critical, um, I, I cannot in, in good faith do my job by saying it is okay to be in those areas and encamped. Um, it, it, it's a danger to the environment as a whole. It's also a danger to the people who are sleeping in that area because of a fast moving wildland fire. That, that's, a, that's a big concern for me. There's no addresses, there's no warning systems. There's um, a lot of risk you know, beyond it. And, you know, the environmental damage is one impact, and I think the CZU fire brought that home for a lot of people. Um, but the very real risk of a wildland fire within that area is unacceptable to me, and we have to have a zero tolerance for that. I know there's uh, real challenges for where do people go, how do people um, be. Um, as a community, I think we can recognize that stopping that type of impact before it starts is the least impactful uh, process forward. And so 
I would ask that we identify with the county uh, a location that we can uh, have people be. But being in that area when fuels are dry um, uh, is just an unacceptable risk, in my opinion. Thank you, Jason. I have a question just on follow up of that. Do you forecast sort of basically closing our open spaces at some point due to conditions, or how do you manage that in terms of your authorities to do that? Yeah, and so a lot of it, it it's double closure. Sycamore Grove is closed, and uh, yet we have people. So when the fire risk becomes to that elevated level and some of the, uh, the people on this uh, council have done site tours out there and seen that direct impact mm -hmm. of what it is and prevention is easier than response. So um, we have closed all open spaces to all activities uh, when we've reached that really critical threshold. Um, my preference is not to close it to all activities but at night and to close it to camping, which uh, really comes with warming fires, cooking fires, to allow uh, transit where people can walk on a path, uh, similar to what COVID was last year, where you were allowed to walk across the beach to get in the water. That activity was allowed, but setting up camp on the beach was not. And so within our open spaces, um, as our fuel moisture gets to that level, and we do get reports on that, um, I do foresee absolutely saying zero tolerance for anything other than transiting through, walking through, biking, hiking, um, but setting up shop, um, sleeping, or having any type of open flame device, uh, we, it, it has to be a zero tolerance policy just because the risk of a catastrophic event is so large. Uh, it outweighs that, that singular person's need for uh, a place to sleep, in my opinion. Yeah, I guess, you know, I, what I've noticed in communications um, and, and folks contacting me, you know, there's there's a growing set of, uh, I think they're called FireWise communities or FireWise neighborhoods. I think we have, gosh, probably, what, three or four, maybe five now in the city, just in the city limits. And these, I know, are throughout the whole county now. Um, but it does seem like there's really concerted efforts for organized around evacuation and people who are, do live on their own. So a lot of that work is, to, is being done. Um, but that clair, clair, clarity around, you know, some of these are, are adjacent city lands and how, how they, you know, work with city leadership and, and fire in particular um, is something that I think many people have um, been in contact about. And I know there's some, you, you've been, I know, on a lot of these Firewise meetings in the last few months. So it seems like people are aware and trying to get organized, which is greatly appreciated, you know, to have neighborhoods really take their the, the initiative to get each other organized around evacuation or being able to know who lives alone or if someone is, you know, needs going to need help getting out of their home. Um, also for us to obviously take into consideration all those conditions out in our own properties is, is great. So thank you for your work. Yeah, you know, the Firewise communities were something that we started a few years ago. The first one in the county of Santa Cruz was started in Prospect Heights uh, with our help. Um, and then we've grown that to other community, other neighborhoods. And um, so, you know, they're concerned about the land fire, which I completely understand. Uh, what's really important for those Firewise groups, other than being concerned about a fire starting, is hardening their neighborhoods and their homes having a plan that they can enact. And we've developed those brochures and those plans and those checklists. Um, and if we have a fire happen, but it doesn't impact those homes, those neighborhoods, uh, or the environment as a whole, um, that's really our goal is trying to harden those areas. And that's why we've done the vegetation management. And we've also reached out to those neighborhoods to give them the tools that they can do. Um, and we had a pretty successful meeting uh, last week and we will probably be meeting more frequently as we get into summer months here and um, you know wildland events start growing uh, throughout the state. And is there anyone particular in your department, Jason, that that we could direct people to who are interested in these firewise groups? Uh, do you have any? Do you have a lead staff person on that, or do those things all go through you? Or uh, Chief Rob Young or Rob Odie is our uh, fire marshal. Um, and also, if you go to City of Santa Cruz and go to the fire department website. We have all that literature uh, available. Uh, we have physical handouts that we uh, can give out to people, but all of that uh, uh, information is available on our website. And if you send, uh, if you click the link for the email on that website, it will get routed to the right person. And uh, we will work uh, with, with those individuals in those neighborhoods. Uh, that's been one of our big outreach efforts in the last two years. Um, and we'll continue to do that. Great, thank you. Martine? Do you have any, you have one more item, I think? 
Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Uh, yes, I'm going to just uh, spend a few minutes on National Police Week, and then in a few minutes I'll ask uh, uh, Deputy Chief Bernie, Bernie Escalante to say a few words. But first, by way of background, um, so in 1962, President Kennedy, Kennedy proclaimed uh, May 15 as National Police Officers Memorial Day, and National Police Week uh, pays special recognition to those law enforcement officers who have lost their lives in the line of duty uh, uh, for the safety and protection of others. And uh, in the city of Santa Cruz, we, uh, as you all know, uh, tragically uh, saw the loss of two of our officers, uh, Sergeant uh, Butch Baker and Detective uh, Elizabeth uh, Butler. Uh, and that had a significant impact on our police department, our officers, and, and certainly our community. And uh, only just yesterday, the uh, city of San Luis Obispo also had a tragic loss of officers in circumstances very similar to ours. And in fact, I spent the uh, last evening talking uh, with their city manager and sharing our experiences and offering resources. It's something that happens uh, unfortunately uh much too often and uh so with that i just want to uh and i know we're going to uh, do a rec additional recognition at the next council meeting but i wanted to ask uh, uh, bernie if he could just share a few words in, uh, regarding uh, this uh, important week thank you martine and uh hello mayor myers uh thanks for having us um uh yeah it's it's kind of a a solemn day with yesterday's events in San Luis Obispo and a, a, um, a tough reminder of the dangers our men and women um, take on and, and face every day. Uh, in 2020, they had the highest number of uh, officers that lost their lives in the line of duty uh, since 1974. I think it was 264 lives uh, were lost across the country. Um, of course, COVID-19 was a big part of that. I think over half of those numbers come from uh, COVID-19. So, um, but it is a very dangerous job, a very unpredictable job, uh, very challenging. And, you know, the men and women of this department should be praised for their efforts um, and the resilience, uh, especially through 2020. Um, as we're all aware, it was a challenging year for, for all of us. Um, in, in government work and, and definitely no less for the men and women out in the field day in and day out um, fighting pandemic and issues and, and obviously a lot of other issues. So um, I, I appreciate on behalf of the men and women of the organization, I appreciate the recognition. Um, we are thankful for your support and the community's support. And uh, we will keep striving forward and, and pushing forward and, and getting better and, and providing a high level of service to our community. So thank you. Thank you uh, for all your work and the department's work. And um, yeah, we are we are lucky that we have the department that we have and the leadership we have. And um, I know you guys have been through so much in the past year, both all of our first responders. And so just um, really heartfelt thank you we certainly will be celebrating you with a proclamation next week. Just want to recognize and so thankful for everything you do. And I'm happy to have any council members, if they have any comments to say, please raise your hand. Like we're, we're, we're we've got claps. Well, thank you very much, uh, Martine. Great to see you, Bernie, and uh, thanks for all the updates from the staff. Thank you. We'll move on now to um, the review of the meeting calendar attached to the agenda and revise it as necessary. Uh, and I'd just like to ask on the, the call on the clerk to provide any updates for this calendar. Thank you, Mayor. We have no um, edits. No edits, great. Okay, we will now move on to our uh, consent agenda. And these are items 12 through 18 on our agenda today. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 12 through 18. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand, the queue saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to pull, to comment on or pull any of our consent items today? And this is items number 12 through 18. Uh, let's see, I see council member Brown. Oh, 
You're muted, Sandy. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I just want to make a comment item 14. 14. Okay. Any other council members wishing to? Uh, council member Cummings? I'd also like to comment on item number 14. Okay. Uh, others, council member Golder? Same item. Other council, other items from either 12 to 18. I do have a, a just a quick question on item 18. So I'll put myself down for that and I will make a comment on item 14. Any other council members? Going, going, gone. Okay, great. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and um, let me just catch up here on my here. So for uh, members of the public who are streaming this, um, now is the time to comment on items 12 through 18. Um, and we are going to uh, take a motion on all the items um, that we're not that we're not either commented or questioned on. I think I'll go ahead and do comment and questions because we did not have any items pulled. So we'll do comments and questions. We'll we'll take uh, the consent as as one item uh, and look for a motion a little bit later. Uh, so why don't we go ahead with the comments on item number 14, which is the um, supporting um, Senate Bill 380. End of Life Option Act, Sunset Elimination and Revisions. And I believe Council Member Brown uh, had a comment on this. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the mayor. Um, thank you, Mayor Myers, for getting this on our agenda. Uh, when I first was approached about uh, this, it, and was able to talk with the folks who were um, asking us to do this. I um, I thought it was going to take you know that we needed to, it was going to take longer. And so I just really appreciate you expediting getting it onto the agenda. And I'm I'm glad to have been able to sign on to this. Our uh, uh, state senator John Laird and our assembly member Mark Stone have both signed on as co-sponsors of the legislation. And I'm just really pleased to that be supporting it as well. Thank you, council member. And I've got council member Cummings. Yeah, I was just gonna thank um, the member of the public who reached out to us uh, asking for support. And then additionally, I uh, wanted to thank the mayor and my colleagues who were able to bring this forward. I was in the field when this came, when we when I received the email about this, it was wanting to get back to it at some point, And then I saw it on our agenda. And so I was really excited to see um, the council members who were able to bring this forward with the mayor. And so just wanted to express my appreciation for being able to bring this forward. Thank you, council member. Uh, council member Golder. I want to echo the sentiments of um, council members Brown and Cummings. And I just also wanted to um, say uh, gratitude to everyone that works at hospice. And it's just, um, you know, uh, such thank thankless work and really difficult. And I went through it with a close uh, friend this year. And, you know, I fully support this. People should be able to choose to, you know, die in a dignified way when it's, when it's their time. So thank you. Yeah, and I just want to also make a comment. I just want to um, acknowledge the, um, the public members who reached out to us. Um, and for those listening in today, the council did support this um, act by resolution back in, I believe it was 2015, was uh, when the council initiated a, a resolution in support of this. Um, of the the end of life options act and um, what we'll be doing is um, we'll be submitting a letter in support of uh, SB 380 which will extend that um, act which has a, an actual uh, termination date so again we're we're following on our uh, other council uh, tales and they're already their support of this but obviously expressing um, as a community that uh, we're uh, supportive of the End of Life Option Act um, and trying to avoid that sunset. So thank you to the council members who um, uh, also uh, wanted to sponsor this. It was a quick turnaround, but I also want to acknowledge um, Ralph Demercutt from uh, the city manager's office, uh, as well as Martin Bernal um, and gave guidance on trying to how to make this happen as quick as possible. So um, it was really <coughs> that got this made this happen. 
I just happened to read the email and uh, try to get it get it rolling. So thanks to the staff for their support in helping us put this on. And then we'll move on to item number 18. Um, and I just wanted, uh, just had a quick question. Um, I wanted to make sure I understood um, regarding the Bay Drive storm damage repair project. Um, and I guess this is a question for either Mar for Mark Dettel, if he's still here, or Chris Schneider. Uh, Mark, I just had a question. So I know this is, I believe this is also considered a city park. Is that correct? Or is it really just a median that people use, you know, the trail to get up and be able to walk through the, you know, without having to walk along, uh, you know, that steep hill and Bay, Bay Drive? Uh, Chris Schneider here. You know, that's a great question, and I <laughs> don't know the answer to that, but I'll get back to you with that. Okay. We do try to protect the path because it is the only one that essentially goes from Escalona up to uh, Nobel. And, um, you know, this been, uh, has suffered some damage about four years ago, and it was not part of a declared disaster. So it's been difficult to get the money to do the project. But I think we have a, a great project coming up there now, and um, we'll be ready to go out to bid shortly once it's okay. That's great. So this will really be um, basically um, it'll 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 basically address a lot of that erosion and some of those failures along that path that have made it quite to either walk it or I know a lot of people mountain bike up, up it too because yeah. it's or, well it's at one specific location but mm -hmm. the path paving uh, goes further out further than where the damage is um, because there are you know it it, it is suffering from. Uh, from uh, deferred maintenance, and uh, we could use more funding for further improvements as well. Okay, great. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Okay, I will look for a motion on the uh, consent agenda. Mayor, do you just need public comment? Oh, sorry about that. I will go ahead and open up our consent agenda for public comment. This will be for items 12 through 18 on the agenda. And for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 12 through 18. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star 9 to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying you've been unmuted. Let me see if we've got anybody in the audience. Hand raise. I'm not seeing any. Bonnie, are you seeing any? No, I'm not. I don't see any. Okay, great. So I'll go ahead and bring this back to council for a motion, and I see Councilmember Cummings and then Councilmember Contar Johnson. I'll go ahead and move the consent agenda. Great. And I'll second. Okay. So we have a motion by Council Cummings, seconded by Councilmember Contar Johnson, um, for uh, approving the consent agenda. And could we have a roll call vote, please? Council members Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, next uh, we will um, be starting up on item number 19. Um, we are a little bit ahead of schedule, so I think we'll just take a um, about an eight or eight or nine minute break, um, and because we're going to go into um, a couple of items that might be lengthy. So why don't we get back here at 2:55 to start on time for this item? Thank you, everybody. Breaks always go so fast. <laughs> okay. Looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five. If council members are back, if you could flip on your cameras, that would be great. And I will go ahead and open back up the meeting. 
So next up on our agenda is item number 19, transition to city council district elections. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. Uh, this is again, item number 19, transition to city council district elections. The presenters today will be Ralph Demerkut from our city manager's office and Victoria Thompson from our, uh, who's our deputy city attorney. And they'll be doing a presentation. We'll take questions um, from council and then we will um, take public comment after questions from council. So without further ado, I'll have Ralph start us off. And Ralph, I don't think we can hear you. I'm not sure if you're speaking yet or not. I, I was not in such a good role too. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, that can, and that concludes my presentation. Okay. Uh, I'm done yeah. here. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor and uh, members of the City Council. Uh, Ralph America, Principal Management Analyst with the City Manager's Office. And I'm here today with uh, Victoria Thompson, Deputy City Attorney for our City Attorney's Office um, to discuss uh, the transition to district election. And before we started, I, I did want to say that um, this presentation, um, including the content and actions, um, and including the content actions that are being presented, um, they're consistent with the direction provided in Council Resolution Number 29657, which was passed on May 26, 2020, and we'll get into that a little bit more as well. And um, that we want to highlight that this is going to be the first of many conversations to come, as well as first of many additional opportunities for the community um, to provide feedback on the process, maps, and schedule. And um, as the proposed schedule will show, um, this includes sharing key information with the community now and um, coming back to council in August with an update with an updated schedule with more details on that schedule and um, sort of a summary on the feedback we've received since today's presentation in August. So um, let's see, let's jump into the next slide here. So today, um, the requested action um, that we are asking for from council is one to receive the presentation on district and transition requirements, which uh, Victoria will get into, and um, also to provide direction for staff to proceed with the recommended next steps and proposed general timeline um, to transition to district elections. Yes. Yeah, so good afternoon, council members. Um, we wanted to go over background information on the California Voting Rights Act, which is shortened to the CVRA. What exactly is the CVRA? So the CVRA was signed into law in California in 2002, and it amends the 1965 voting, Federal Voting Rights Act for California. The Federal Voting Rights Act outlaws intentional discrimination in voting practices, as well as unintentionally discriminate. The CVRA expands upon the, the Federal Voting Rights Act and increases protections for minority voting rights and creates additional liability for entities that violate those rights. And so under the CVRA, if a minority group can show that racially polarized voting undercuts their to elect or influence the election of a minority preferred candidate, a violation of the CVRA exists. And as background, racially polarized voting is voting where there's a difference between the choice of candidate preferred by voters of a protected minority class and the electoral choices preferred by voters of the electorate. The city currently holds at-large elections, which means that voters from the entire city select, elect all members of the city council. The CVRA does not outright ban at-large elections, uh, it just discourages any election system that impairs the ability of one of the protected minority classes to elect candidates of their choice, or their ability to influence an election's outcome. And it's important to note that the threshold to establish liability under the CVRA 
is very low. And at this time, no California government entity has successfully defended its at-large election from a CVRA lawsuit. In February 2020, the city received a notice of claim of violation of the CVRA letter from a prospective plaintiff. And that prospective plaintiff alleged that the city's at-large elections violated the CVRA and threatened suit unless the city transitioned to district-based elections. And again, as background, a district-based election is where the city is divided into dis geographical districts and voters residing within each district choose their council member who must also then reside in that geographic district. The city denies that its current at-large system violates the CVRA, but as I mentioned, no California government entity has successfully defended its at-large election against CVRA law, a CVRA lawsuit. And so to avoid the uncertainties and costs associated with a lawsuit, the city agreed to consider a transition to district elections for the general election in November of 2022. And to discuss the city council's May resolution. Sure. Um, so on May 26, 2020, um, City Council passed resolution number um, 29,657. And um, in that resolution, it states that the City Council will, will consider adoption of an ordinance to institute the district based election system as authorized by Government Code Section 34886. And that prior to considering an ordinance to establish district boundaries for a district based election system, the city will follow the requirements set out within Elections Code. 10010 to solicit public input in the district map drawing process. And um, so today's presentation includes a schedule of how we uh, plan to meet that. And um, uh, in November, of the center, the city entered into a professional service agreement with National Demographics Corporation. And um, the scope of work with NDC includes developing and refining the city's election district. Um, working with city staff to develop a redistricting database, preparing draft maps and an election schedule, and assisting with public meetings um, and plan adoption, including um, with our voters. And um, the uh, professional service agreement and the resolution um, what was included as backup material uh, for the time. So what are the district election transition requirements? There are various statutory requirements uh, in, the, in the California Elections Code that we must follow when it is going through this process of considering the transition to district elections. First, the city must hold two initial public hearings, and this is before any maps are created. And these meetings are for the public to provide the city and NDC with its input regarding district composition. And again, this is before any maps are created. Secondly, the city must publish at least one proposed district map and a proposed staggered election schedule if council members will be elected for staggered terms of office. Uh, Current practice is that the city holds staggered elections for city council members. Four council members are elected. In one year, two years later, three council members are elected. Thirdly, at least seven days after the proposed district map and schedule are published, the city must hold two follow-up hearings. And these second public hearings are for the public to provide their input regarding the proposed map and schedule. Fourth, if the proposed map and proposed schedule at all are at all revised during these follow follow up second public hearings, the city must republish both at least seven days before it goes to council for consideration. And then fifth, the council can vote to approve or reject an ordinance establishing based elections. Under the government code, 
the city council can adopt an ordinance requiring council members be elected by district. This does not need to go to the voters um, for their approval. And, but then also please note that the city's charter does specify that council member elect at large. And so it would make sense at some point to clean up this issue and have voters consider this. Okay, so um, we understand that this process and the schedule we come up with is, should be specific to the city of Santa Cruz and that it should meet um, the needs of the community and so, but we did take a look at what other cities um, have done and the process they underwent um, to kind of give uh, some, uh, provide some insight as to what the community and the council can expect uh, throughout this process. And um, we looked at cities that had comparable variables such as you know either population, uh, geographical size, annual budget, um, university proximity, and um, other variables. Um, to better understand um, how they went through this process. And um, the cities that I'll be discussing today include the cities of Davis, uh, Santa Rosa, and Santa Barbara. And I'll just quickly go over um, some highlights uh, during in the process they took. Um, so the city of Davis has a population of 68,000, and they completed their process um, to transition from at-large elections to bi-district elections during the fall of 2019. And um, the first council members who were elected by district um, were elected in the 2020 election. And um, the remaining two um, districts are going to tra transition from at-large to district ele elected um, representatives in 2022. And um, the structure of the council uh, remained the same. Uh, they held five public hearings and um, community workshop. And uh, during these events, members of the public were invited to provide input on uh, maps that were created by a demographer. And um, I will share um, Davis's schedule after I go over Santa Rosa. Um, that way I'm not going back and forth uh, from different documents too much. Um, in Santa Rosa, um, they have a uh, larger population, they have a population of 174, 175,000. Um, they began their transition from at-large um, to district-based elections in 2017. Their process was interrupted by the uh, 2017 wildfires, and then they had to redo their process all over again. Um, but in 2020, um, their final at-large council seats uh, were transitioned to district seats. Um, there, there are seven people on their council, and um, their, the structure of their council remained the same. Um, six public hearings were held um, for community feedback. Uh, first two hearings were held prior to the publication of the maps, and the, the remaining hearings were held following the publication of the, the draft district maps. And um, I'm going to switch over to a different document here and kind of share what those schedules look like um, really briefly, just so members of the council and the community get an understanding of what uh, the process was like in those cities. So um, in Davis, um, they adopted a resolution of intention, which this council already did. Um, in September, they, heard, they held their first public hearing where they discussed the process with the community. Um, identified um, neighborhoods and communities of interest and considered criteria criteria for the formation of districts. And they held a second public hearing in September and a community workshop in um, September as well. And uh, we had presentations um, for the public. Um, after those initial meetings were held, um, the maps, the preliminary district maps were released and um, Public hearings were, were held after that, which included input on the proposed map, uh, district maps from the community. And um, it was an opportunity to um, provide direction to modify map options. And then a revised district map was released after those meetings. And then um, they had follow-up meetings on late October. And in early November, um, City Council held a meeting to adopt an ordinance to transition districts, which includes selecting a final map. Um, and Santa Rosa um, talked about how their uh, other process was interrupted by the wildfires. 
So they started their process all over again in February, where similarly they held initial public hearings before uh, maps uh, were, uh, and um, after the uh, maps were drafted and published, they held follow-up meetings and gave the, uh, the community and the public an opportunity to respond to those um, maps. And then um, it gave an opportunity to post uh, amended maps based on the feedback. And um, council action, um, they had they held follow-up meetings after that, and um, council action um, occurred on in April of uh, 2018 to adopt the map and the ordinance. Um, so that's sort of how it looked like in Santa Rosa and Davis. And then we'll go back to the power. Santa Barbara is another city we looked at. They have a population of 88,000, and um, unfortunately, we didn't. Um, I wasn't able to get a hold of their schedule, and I wasn't able to share that with you. Um, but um, what's interesting with Santa Barbara is that um, the creation of an independent redistricting commission was required an agreement. And I know this is an item that's come up through um, public um, emails and questions and all of that. Um, but their um, independent redistricting commission um, was created after council um, decided to move forward with creating districts. And um, that, that commission, um, their goal is to issue an updated map by November of 2021 for going decade. Um, and I understand that um, due to the delay in um, the 2020 census results coming out that this this is becoming uh, a little bit of a challenge for the um, independent redistricting commission, but I added that in there just to show that you know we can, um, the council can um, create a commission, but ideally it would be after the creation of or uh, of, of um, after passing an ordinance stating that we're moving to districts, creating initial districts. Um, so next steps. Um, this is where we talk about. Um, the city of Santa Cruz's um, process um, within our city. And um, the first thing that staff did um, was create a district, a district election webpage where FAQs and really um, fundamental information um, is currently um, available to the public. And um, we could, I will share how the public can access that right now. Um, if Members of the public are interested in learning more about this. Um, they can, okay, you guys, my screen is highlighted. Um, they can go to our homepage. Um, we have this pinned right now under transit elections kicks off. And they could click on that and it'll take them to um, this page to our city newsroom. And it just gives a brief overview of what we're doing over the next 12 months. And um, there's a link here that goes to the landing page. Um, and uh, members of the public could go um, to this landing directly as well by going to cityofsantacruz.com slash district elections. Uh, but we just heard that it was easier to have something on the home page uh, to make it easier for people to remember. So they could click on that link. And um, here we have a brief overview of what's going on. Um, uh, some FAQs, um, some basic questions, and some newer questions that were uh, over in our presentation today. Um, the proposed timeline that will also go over pending council approval, of course, and then um, uh, some space for notices and press releases, which we'll all keep in this section so people could follow it or um, read previous uh, notices and press releases that went out. Um, documents that relate to this item, additional resources, and uh, contact info who they could contact if they have any questions um, or comments, and uh, that's me and uh, my email address and phone number. And then we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Sorry to keep going back and forth. Um, so that was the uh, initial step um, that staff took. And then uh, we're here today with our initial presentation um, to give um, council an update to request um, you know, direction to move forward with the schedule we're proposing. And then um, we're planning on coming back to council in August of uh, this year um, to give you an update on the feedback received and to give you more details 
um, on the schedule. And, um, and then we plan to have introductory public meetings in, Aug in August, which Tori will get into. Yes, so in August of 2021, we plan to have those uh, Tori required introductory public meetings. The reason why this is in August is one, to account for council's um, July uh, period where there will not be any meetings. And then also the 2020 census data is currently set to be published in September of 2021. And NDC and the city cannot begin to prepare draft maps until that census data is available. So uh, it's our current belief, the federal government is saying that this data will be released in September. However, this data has passed. And so there is a chance that it could be delayed again. If so, that will impact our proposed timeline here. And if so, we can update council as to that change in August um, at the August update to council meeting. Uh, let's say that so long as the, the census data is published in September, we anticipate that by November, the city's expert NDC should be, prepared, should be able to draft maps. And again, this will take into consideration comments from the public um, and council members at those introductory public meetings, as well as 20 census data. And we anticipate that in, in by November of 2021. And then council should be able to review the maps and the proposed elections, uh, any proposed staggered election schedule in November of 2021. We anticipate that by December of 2020, the city will be able to publish that their proposed map and election schedule. And again, we will provide links to the proposed map and election schedule on the city's webpage for district elections so that the public can easily access that. In, by January of 2022, we believe that we can hold those post-publication public meetings where the public can comment draft map and the draft schedule. And we anticipate by March of 2022, council can vote to approve or they can consider whether or not to approve the transition to district elections. Um, the, uh, the, is, and that March date is, is, is sort of important because in order for the county to process the district maps in time for the November 2022 general election, we need to have that map and that schedule to the county by mid-April of 2022. And that again will allow for the November 2022 general election in the city to be the first with district elections. Now, a comment we received um, from the public was at what point can the, com when can the public comment on the process or um, give some input in the maps and, um, and just the whole content of what's being discussed. So in this um, overview of this general schedule, um, in blue are opportunities or um, times when the um, community and the city will be going back and forth and communicating and getting feedback and all of that. So we just wanted to um, highlight that with the council and the members of the public that are. So um, we thought we'd get into some frequently asked questions um, to maybe go over these. Um, uh, before we took additional questions from the council, as maybe it'll answer some of the questions you might have, or maybe they'll um, spark new questions that we could get into today, as, and I'm trying to answer for you. Um, one of the uh, questions that we uh, received from the public, uh, from many members of the public, was um, relating to is this a time to change the structure of the council? And that encompasses, you know, is this a time to switch to an at large? Um, elected mayor, um, can we change the number of council members um, on, on the uh, on city council? And um, can we change the number of districts? 
and um, all of that. And the response um, right uh, to that right now, and um, the answer to that is um, the transition to district elections has been directed through Council Resolution RS-29657. Our direction does not include changing the structure of the council. And um, the, the one thing to highlight here is um, there is a general or government code that allows the council to pass an ordinance to transition to district elections. Um, and the process to change the um, city council, the structure of the city council, however, um, may need a process from the, from passing an ordinance. So they are uh, separate conversations um, that should happen. Um, but as far as this item goes and um, the process that we presented, it strictly is focused on um, transitioning to district elections at this point. Um, another question um, that we received a couple of emails, and we switched to a rank choice voting system. And um, similarly, um, it's we're considering this a separate item or discussion from the transition district elections, and um, additional direction would be needed from the council to begin the process required to transition a rank choice voting system uh, for similar um, reasons. And that um, the direction provided for our presentation today um, was provided by the resolution we mentioned, which focuses specifically on transitioning um, to districts. And um, that this is a you know, major um, change in the charter that may need to go to um, a vote and not necessarily um, um, allow the council to do so through an ordinance, which the transition to districts does. Sorry, Tori, is there anything else you wanted to add on that? Okay. No, nope, I think you covered it. Okay, will an independent redistricting commission be formed? Um, many jurisdictions have created independent commissions um, after transitioning to just district elections. And um, we're recommending that this item be re revisited in the future to allow for appropriate time to discuss and implement the process and structure of uh, the commission with the public. Um, and um, government code also allows the council to um, transfer the redistricting um, powers independent body. So this could be done through an ordinance in the future as well. Um, However, with this timing of everything and all of that, um, we think that this would be a good idea to um, maybe um, do after we transition into district elections. Number four, um, how are the number of districts determined? Tori, did you want to get in this? Sure, so under the city's charter and specifically charter section 601, there are seven council members, and so there will be seven districts. Currently, through the, the council's May 2020 resolution, there is no direction to include changing the structure of the council. Again, we're focusing on the transition just to elections, and so there will be seven districts. Uh, we also received questions about can some council members continue to be elected at large while some are elected based by district? No, under the government code, there is only one member of the council from each district. And so if you had district elected council members, so elected council you know, elected at large council members, there would in effect be two council members from that geographic area. So it would violate the government code. We also received questions about whether the candidate or council member needs to live in their district. And yes, per the government code, a person isn't eligible to hold office as a member of council unless they reside. And then related to that question, um, how does this impact council members who may be forced to move during their term? And un unfortunately, the government code says that the council member needs to reside in their district. Uh, we understand that this might be an impact on council members, um, and there might be a way to address this in, uh, in city code, but the government code says that, yes, the person must reside in the district. 
And uh, one more time, the um, the website that members of the public can visit um, if they want more information on um, this process or this transition um, is right here, www.anacruz.com slash district elections. And as we receive um, more questions, we'll continue to post those on the website and answer them for members of the public. And um, here is my email in case um, any members of the public have any questions or comments they'd like to share. Um, I'll be sure to summarize those and share them with um, members of the council and staff as appropriate. And um, lastly, um, just a reminder of what the requested action from staff today is, um, one is to receive the presentation on um, district election transition requirements. And uh, two is to provide direction for staff to proceed with the recommended next steps and proposed general timeline uh, to, transi to transition a city council district election. And of that concludes our presentation. And uh, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ralph, and thank you, Victoria. Um, complicated and also a major shift for our community. So thank you for the thoroughness and sort of walking us through the process certainly is uh, important. And it looks like we have uh, several several ways that we can engage with the community as we move forward, but it's a, it's a big shift. Um, so thanks for the presentation. Uh, the three council members with their hands up, uh, council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I have a couple questions and, and I think Mayor Myers touched on it when she was saying how this is a big shift for our community. Um, and, you know, we're, there's a lot of folks that are concerned about process and really how they can engage in this. I wanted, I'm just curious because you, um, you, um, the potential for a redistricting commission and bringing that back later rather than having that introduced sooner. Um, before I get on into that uh, item, I'm just curious if you can kind of walk us through the, the um, like how these maps are created and what is the process, if you know, for how the maps are created, because it sounds like those redistricting commissions oftentimes play a very large role, having members of the community who can help weigh in on the drawing of maps. And if we don't have that commission in place, you know, who's really responsible for coming up with those maps? Because I think many members of the community are going to be concerned with, you know, how can they provide input at the early stages rather than having like, here are the maps you know, here are your options, choose one or the other. And um, so included in the um, scope of work for NDC or demographer is um, the, there is this media outreach meetings, um, which we have two scheduled prior to any map being released to really um, get feedback from the community and um, to share the uh, process and sort of um, the, the um, ongoing work that will happen and to kind of get their feedback on communities of interest in the city of Santa Cruz. And um, with that feedback from the community, um, NDC will prepare draft maps um, that the council and the community will have opportunities to provide feedback on. Um, and um, Tony and Victoria, if there's anything else you guys want to add, please feel free. I can add that some communities have permitted uh, or have opened up map drawing to the public and have had on their websites abilities for public to submit their own maps. So that's something that we can consider. Uh, NDC will, when they are putting together their proposed maps, will consider the city's demographic, er demographic information. They will consider where there are minority or protected voting blocks. They will, um, my understanding, there's no intent for these to be gerrymandered districts that they will be districts, uh, no contiguous districts that, uh, geographically contiguous districts. And um, yes, does that answer your question, council member? Um, yeah, for the most part. Uh, and then two other questions. One, um, it seems like we have, you know, there's a bit of time before, um, back to council, it sounds like the timeline is to have something come back in August. And I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity to have a public hearing um, before then to get input so that community members have more of a heads up um, rather than it being a council meeting. I know many people are probably at work right now and can't weigh in, you know, right now, but I think it might be good if we could have another, like a public hearing um, 
process where we, you know, do an initial introduction um, of where we're going so the community can weigh in on that timeline um, prior to us adopting a, a formal timeline. It sounds like because that would be adopted in August. Is, is that correct? That's correct. So we um, definitely at the direction of council, we can consider having earlier public outreach meetings. That could be a council meeting. It could be a community meeting. Under the, the, the statutes, there is a requirement that some of these public hearings must be outside of work hours or on weekends. So there will be a chance for members of the community to comment at a time not at three in the afternoon if that doesn't work for their schedule. Um, but yes, at this point, we are just thinking about this August council meeting, but if you would like for us to add something else, that's something that um, if directed, we can add. Okay. And then I guess the, my last question is, um, as it relates to the kind of redistricting commission, I mean, what what's kind of holding us back from potentially creating that? And I ask because it seems like, you know, we have, again, we have about month and a half, you know, we could have something come potentially at the second meeting in, in June, for example, if each council member was to appoint, you know, a person to serve on this, what could be a commission, and, the, and to have them play a role so we have more of a community engagement in this process. And so I'm just wondering, you know, what are some of the constraints around um, kind of creating the redistricting and for the purposes of this redistricting effort? And I know that the county, uh, county supervisors, when they're considering redrawing the maps for their districts, they appoint members of the public to help with that process. And so I think it would it would seem, you know, and I think many members of the community would um, would really appreciate being able to, you know, weigh in and, and to have us have a consistent process um, within the city and within the county. I could take a crack at that. Um, I think ultimately the, the methodology that the council employs, whether it's uh, a decision that's made by the city council or if you want to establish an independent commissioner committee to make a recommendation to the council on district boundaries or to appoint an independent commission to establish district boundaries. Those are policy decisions that the council can um, can. Um, there, there's no legal requirement that you do so, but, but that's a policy discussion for the council to have. Can I add uh, the uh, the other thing to consider, of course, is that it's a it's a pretty extensive effort, and so it does require staff resources to be able to staff and, and create the process. So it would uh, uh, require us looking at uh, priorities uh, in terms of our work plan and workload. Um, lastly, if I could add that um, a part of this discussion too is for council to decide um, if we do want to move forward with districts first. So until that decision is made, um, it's, it's a little difficult for the independent redistricting commission to continue with the work, not knowing, you know, if the council will decide to move forward with this or not. So that decision is um, what we're trying to uh, get to um, at this point. Yeah. Well. Okay. Um, well, I guess so. Just my comment would be that I think that um, you know that there'd be a lot. This is a very big um, transition for our community, and and I think that. To the extent that we can maximize community input in this process, I think the outcome will be in the more um, community buy-in we'll have for this. Um, so I'll, I'll end my comments there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Colin Tar Johnson. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I wanted to touch on the. Um, the process to the structure of the city council. Um, I wonder if you could touch more on that. Uh, you mentioned that this would be a separate process, and in particular looking at uh, an elected mayor structure. Uh, you mentioned this would be a separate process from what we're doing right now in terms of um, moving forward with district elections. Uh, what would it look like for us to explore, even if it is as a separate process, but simultaneously? Right, so under the government code, the city council can transition to district-based elections via ordinance. Some of these other changes, like the change to an at-large mayor or um, um, uh, going to ranked choice vote, 
that's something that would need to be addressed by the voters through a charter amendment. The charter currently allows or currently requires that the mayor be appointed by council members. So if you switch to an at-large voter, or excuse me, an at-large mayor, that needs to go to the voters for a charter amendment. This is something that can be done. It just, our concern is that do we have the time to do this right now simultaneously with the change to district, district elections? And as Ralph mentioned, we, um, we need to first determine if the council you know, wants to move to district elections. And so it makes sense to have that step first and then to look at other charter amendment, other structural changes that could then go to the voters for consideration. If I could just follow up on Tori's sure. comment really quick. Um, the reason why it's a different process is that the remedy for a voters, uh, California Voting Rights Act uh, lawsuit is uh, to, to order the city to transition to district elections. And so um, other cities, including charter cities, have adopted ordinances to transition to, the, to district elections uh, as a result of either a demand uh, made under the CDRA or uh, be sued for a CDRA uh, violation. And, and the only remedy that the court can impose under the CDRA is to um, order the city to, to switch to district elections. A court could not compel the city to have an elected mayor or to um, adopt a different voting methodology like ranked choice. Uh, and so that's why a charter amendment would be required for the latter two, but not for the transition to district elections. Okay, so I understand, but it, it seems like um, even though this we're pursuing this um, because of a, um, a lawsuit or a risk of a lawsuit, um, it's an opportunity for us to really look at across the spectrum how we structure our city governance and, and where there may be gaps and, and how we want to address those gaps. Um, and I just wonder if I understand that it would have to be a separate process, but I wonder if we could leverage um, the work that staff is already doing, it's one issue, um, to to move simultaneously. So I would just like us to, to think about that and explore that. And then I have another question um, around the independent redistricting commission. Um, do we have a sense of, um, I, I hear that it, it takes time and staffing and capacity. Do we have a sense of, of what that looks like for other like communities? How much time, how much staffing, how much resources has it taken other communities to um, form this type of a, um, independent commission? Uh, we looked at um, other cities and the process they underwent to create these commissions. Um, we could come back with more details on that. Um, but a lot of it is, um, you know, I'm having the city clerk uh, and the city council really can determine the process of how individuals are chosen and um, added on this commission. There are a few legal um, rules um, that we need to follow as to who can serve, you know, such as city staff, current elected officials, or family members of elected officials and all of that. But um, it does give a lot of um, authority and power to the council as to how and um, you know, the process that undergoes um, creating this independent redistricting commission who could serve and all of that. Um, but we, um, I, I started, I have started looking at the process other cities have undertaken and if this is an item that council would like uh, additional information on, I could definitely provide that at a future meeting. Great, thank you so much. Those are my questions for now. Thank you, council member. I have council member Brown next. Um, thank you. So I, I first wanted to just comment in response to Council Member Kalantari Johnson's question uh, about uh, trying to incorporate some consideration of other changes in this process and, and leveraging the, the process to look at those. Um, so we did have a charter that was established in um, when in my last term as mayor or as a council member, sorry, and um, I, um, I at the time I thought that that charter review committee was going to kind of look at it, and we directed that it, they look at all of those things and um, and more, and that was suspended, and um, 
my recollection is that in uh, a grand jury report, the city's response to a recommendation that we have such a committee, um, the city's response was that, no, we're not going to do that. So um, I, I guess I, so there, there was a process. It, um, you know, it, it didn't get, have it didn't have the time and the space to um, produce any kind of recommendations that would help us figure out what to do. Um, so, you know, but I agree that I think that those are conversations that we should try to ha have and open up space for them because there is so much community interest and those are the questions that uh, I mean I'm consistently getting um, and. You know, and you put them up in the Q and A, Ralph. So um, obviously, people are wondering. Um, so I, I think that it is um, worth trying to find a way to <clears throat> open up space for those conversations in this process, um, recognizing that we're not statutorily re statutorily required to do so. Doesn't mean that we, you know, might doesn't mean that we wouldn't want to do that, right? So, like, just to see that happen. Um, <clears throat> and I have other comments. But this is question time, so I'm going to save those. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the uh, restrictions on council members representing uh, <clears throat> a district in which they do not live, I um, I recognize that that's um, that's not uh, that's not the point, and that there is something in our government code that would prevent that from happening or from being allowable. And I, I guess I'm just, because it is such a burden on um, renters to, you know, to try to find housing in our community, um, I, and I myself, as a member of the council, had, you know, had to scramble to find housing at one point. Um, and thankfully, no longer, that, that's no longer an issue for me. But I reckon there are many, many people, and we are a town that's majority renter. And if you are a renter without some kind of commitment of stability from your landlord, then you are at a serious disadvantage. So I, I think that, um, you know, I, I guess I just wonder, the question would be then, could we muni code to accommodate for situations when, um, if it were to occur, uh, uh, an elected a person elected by district was forced to move to allow them to be able to finish out a term? I mean, it seems like uh, that would be something that we, you know, we would want to consider in the interest of fairness. I mean, the, the whole point of California Voting Rights Act, at least purportedly, is, you know, equity and access in voting. And so it seems to me that that would be an important one to, to look at. Uh, so just one, is that, could Victoria, maybe you could speak to that? Is that what, how we would go about making that possible is a, a muni code change? I, let me jump in. Um, I think that's something that, that we would have to research. Um, and, and, if, and if that's the, if the council's if the council's interested in going that direction, we will certainly do our best to figure out the the most legally viable path forward if if that's if that's doable. And I'm happy to look into that matter and get back to council. That'd be great. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Um, okay, my questions uh, have to do with uh, the public meetings prior, the two public meetings required prior to the map drawing process. And it, I think it may have been somewhat answered in Council Member Cummings' question. Um, why wait till August? And um, is is there, you know, what does that look like? Would it be at council meetings or separate? And so you had mentioned that one meeting or, or both have to be outside of work hours, so evenings, weekends. Um, so it's, in, you know, how are, what do those meetings look like? Is it, I know things are unknown with virtual versus in-person versus, uh, surveys versus, you know, is there any requirements on what those public meetings look like or what is the plan for those public meetings and is, is there a way to start sooner? So if 
I recall correctly, at least one of the meetings, of one of the required meetings needs to be outside of, of business hours or on the weekends. So, so it's just one. Uh, those meetings, staff is still figuring out what exactly those meetings would look like. Uh, I believe at this time it's our intention for some of those meetings, uh, for those meetings to be during city council meetings. Um, there's the opportunity to have community meetings. I, I believe that's something that we've we've heard that there would be nice to have something outside of the context of a city council meeting. So that's something that staff can consider. Um, but the exact how the meetings, the details, those have not been been worked out yet. And so is that direction from council or is that staff decision? Can we have as many meetings as capacity allows in many different formats and different Spanish and English and in-person weekends, evenings, um, really feeling like we did our, um, you know, due diligence to have that public input before the map drawing process? Yes. Sorry, Council Member uh, Bruner. I think um, a part of the process too was to really introduce the, the topic to the public today and to use the time between now and August to really um, determine what about at these um, community meetings before uh, maps, the draft maps go out. Um, you know, what concerns do does the community have that need to be addressed at these public meetings? Um, and um, working with NDC to answer all of those questions, but to really use this um, today, this um, presentation as a way to introduce this item to the community and the council and really begin gathering that feedback from, from everybody to help draft uh, a more detailed schedule um, moving forward, including um, you know what items or what topics will be discussed at these um, public meetings before the maps are drawn and what needs to be covered um, to help council make uh, an informed decision at the end of this entire process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I also was wondering about um, the community input once the draft maps are done, and I think that was November was in the timeline. Timeline. Um, those uh, the put on the, any draft maps when we get when and if we get to that point um, would also be through council meetings, the first and second reading. Is that how that part would work? No, it would be before the first or second reading. It would be before it's introduced. The okay. ordinance is introduced by council. It would be a separate matter. Okay. So the draft would come out and there would be more public meetings regarding the draft maps. Correct. There would be two meetings just having to do with public comments about those draft maps, about the draft okay. proposed election schedule, and that would be before council considers the resolution or the, the ordinance. Okay. Great. Those are my questions to clarify. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, council Member Watkins. Yeah, I have my questions or sort of the issues that I had um, have been raised by my colleagues. I um, share sort of we've ha we've had community outreach and input around things like ranked choice voting or a directly elected mayor. So it seems um, like this opportunity is sort of um, it would behoove us to to sort of think about a simultaneous process there potentially. Um, and then I guess the you know I, I think what I'm hearing from staff is just this is sort of a preliminary kind of get a sense of where the council is. So I'll maybe I'll shift my from a question to more of a comment, but. Um, I think that you know the commission that was formed by the prior council was before the lawsuit had been filed and was really more sort of exploratory. So there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, but I will, if we're thinking about true kind of equity of voice in those who aren't necessarily able to serve on these volunteer commissions, if we want to look at um, some of the kind of outreach work that that Tiffany Wise West is doing with the with the Green Mining Institute and sort of thinking about how we're um, making this process accessible to folks who may not find these processes accessible, um, whether it be sort of offering food or childcare or whatever types, obviously Spanish translation, but, you know, full community representation with, um, you know, 
us not only expecting them to come to us, but us going to those populations that we need to go to. Um, so that could be, I was going to frame it differently as a question, but I think what I'm, is you're wanting kind of input and that will be forthcoming in terms of how you're going to use this information. Okay. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions from state council at this time? Not seeing any. I think I will go ahead and take this out to public comment. Um, so this will be for item number 19 on the council agenda. And for those members of the public who are streaming, um, if this is an item you want to comment on, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. I see two hands up now. And when it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement. You have been unmuted. So I see a caller with the name Ann S and you are, go ahead and uh, you will have two minutes. Hi, thank you so much. This is Ann Simonton and I appreciate all the work that's going into this and I am uh, just wanted to suggest also that we really consider changing the municipal code or whatever, whatever it takes in order to be able to consider the fact that we live in a city that is predominantly renters and they are under the auspices of the whims of the owners of those uh, rental units. And that we, we are, are hardly being equitable if we do not allow for that particular change to happen. It's, I think it's, um, it will be imperative to, be, uh, to go along with the whole thought of this particular uh, district election change. I'm, I'm concerned about uh, Tony Condotti's comments about, you know, it, uh, it, it all has to do with the council being interested. It has to do with, um, you know, uh, you know, the fact that they suspended the current, uh, you know, or what was once a redistricting, you know, commission or thinking about the rank choice and at large, you know, mayor. I hope that we can reintroduce that. I appreciate everybody's work on this. I know this is a change and I hope we can also keep this very transparent for our community as I hope we can continue to, or have some more transparency about what, who's on the commission for the electing the city manager and how, who, who decided that and who are they on this city, uh, you know, who's, who's representing the city con connected with selecting the city manager. I still haven't gotten a list of those people and I appreciate, you know, just that that would be more transparent. Thank you so much for all your work. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next up, I have phone number ending in 3158. You're, go ahead and you've got two minutes. Yeah, hi, this is Scott Garrett Phillip. Uh, the MDC has many credentials, but missing is a discussion of their overall strategic objective standards that will be used early on in the process to guide redistricting. Gaining compliance with California Voter Rights Act to avoid lawsuits is certainly one of those, but no others so far are mentioned and secret city progress meetings at public expense don't do it for me. From Wikipedia, redistricting is like an election in reverse. Usually the voters get to pick the politicians and redistricting, the politicians get to pick the voters. Let's not really do that, okay? The NDC hasn't revealed their map and uh, uh, looks to the city for sole direction. Therefore, the city should present their map of objective standard process for public consideration and discussion before becoming the rules and weightings NDC should only use in map drawing. The optional features of allowing the public to draw maps doesn't do much for me without their justifications behind them. It reminds me of giving children crayons to play with to keep them busy. Will absolutely be some process formally used where various factors and their weightings are considered, and I, for one, want to know what those are and will be. No good is a process formula that is unspoken or involves data that is never made available to the public, and their weightings and map drawings hidden and are really needed for verification transparency. Uh, a few standard uh, objective uh, examples are the represent roughly equal adult voter population count. Districts must represent roughly rational, justified, contiguous geographic boundaries. And consideration of incumbents, vote strength, or residency should be a minimized factor to draw boundaries. And as to which staggered districts vote first in 2022, they should be chosen by random drawing only, not to protect incumbents or uh, to do social justice warring priorities, but be 100% fair and not uh, create some privileged uh, voting block. Rules such as 50% of the vote needed to win needs consideration. Okay, thanks. 
Thank you. Any other pub members of the public um, interested in speaking on item number 19 on our agenda today? I see, uh, oh, hand just went down. Okay. Oh, I do see, uh, Ron, your hand is up for this item. You can go ahead and speak. Press star nine to, uh, excuse me, star six to unmute. Ron, if you're interested in speaking on um, item number 19, which is transition to city council district elections, is that the Hello? item? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm not on the phone, so uh, good afternoon, council members. I find that in item 19 puts the cart before the horse. Any change to the city charter must be done by a vote of the people according to the law. Establishing district elections is a change in the city charger, tar charter. Therefore, before setting up district elections, an affirmative vote by it appears to be required. Having a vote after district elections are established appears to be a way to avoid, to evade the required process. The city attorney's conclusion that district elections could be done without a public vote doesn't adhere to the law. The city attorney's judgment says we can go to district elections without any judicial ruling that says that the city of Santa Cruz is in violation of the CVRA. The purported violations a firm that is in the business to extort money merely by saying jurisdictions are in violation of the CDRA. The city attorney told the, the council that Measure O's 15% affordable housing requirement could be reduced to 10% by ordinance without a vote of the people. Lawyers make mistakes. Changing how we vote must be taken very, very seriously and thoughtfully, not dictated by an ambulance chasing law firm. For a vote to change the city charter first, then if approved, go forward with the process to set up district elections. I don't know if district elections are a good or a bad idea. District elections may be the best way to go forward if they provide for expanded voting rights and equity. Maybe it's ranked choice voting is the best way to comply with the CVRA. Can six seats be in districts and one at large? Why can't we be in compliance with CVRA by the 2024 elections? Why go through a districting process and then go through another complicated process to comply with the CBRA. Take care of it now and and one at a time, as Shevra stated, as other council members have. That's the conversation that must be had now. So please don't circumvent how we get around this and, and go forward. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who want to speak on item number 19, which is transition to city council district elections? Please raise your hand if you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other atten uh, attendees who would like to do that. Um, I see um, council member Colin Terry Johnson. And then council member Watkins. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I would like to make a motion to approve um, staff's recommendation to move forward with uh, pursuing district elections. Um, and I would also like to add that staff explore um, uh, elected mayor as a simultaneous process so to come back when you come back in August to um, share with us what that could look like as a simultaneous process. And in general, there was a lot of really great input from my colleagues today around process and direction. So, so to take all of that into consideration when you come back in August with um, what our next steps would be. Thank you. And Council Member Watkins? Um, I was just going to make that a similar motion, so I'll go ahead and second the motion. Second that. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor, and then I'll open it up for further deliberation from Council Member Colontari Johnson to um, direct staff to proceed with um, the next steps and propose general timeline to transition to City Council District elections. Um, including bringing back a information on potentially the process or process for an elected mayor and including um, what I've heard from many council members is um, the consideration of some kind of um, some kind of uh, possible ind independent redistricting commission, as well as additional public meetings, especially during um, non-work hours and in the weekends. I think those were the main three 
points that I at least um, caught as we were discussing things. Um, and then I guess I, it, it, so we have a, a motion. Uh, Shiver, did I capture that primarily? Okay. A second by council member Watkins. So um, we'll go ahead and, and take further uh, comments and deliberation. I have one uh, question just real quick. I'm going to check myself here real quick since I didn't ask questions before. Um, Tony, could you speak to the last um, uh, public member who disputed sort of the, the timing on whether or not we should go first with the charter amendment to the voters and then and then into, so the question to the voters would be, should we go to districts? Should the charter be changed to become a district, to, to go towards districts? Right. Uh, can you speak to that? And my understanding is part of our issue is that it's the settlement agreement that we're in as well. So there's the legal sort of component that we're trying to uh, also accomplish during this period of time. But could you speak to that? Yes, that's, I mean, that's right. That's the rationale for bringing it forward as an ordinance is that it's pursuant to a demand made under the California Voting Rights Act um, and an agreement to place a charter amendment on the ballot doesn't uh, resolve the California Voting Rights Act claim unless the voters approve of the charter amendment. And if they don't, then you have a, uh, you know, a, a voters take an issue on something over which ultimately a court would likely uh, direct the city to transition to district elections anyway. And that's why other cities, uh, and I didn't make up the part about other cities having transitioned to district elections by ordinance, even if their charters specified at-large elections. Um, it's common practice done, or it's not a common practice, darn that, but, but it's done, uh, there's established precedent for it and it's um, uh, recognized as a, uh, an appropriate way to proceed. Um, so I, I reject the argument that the charter um, or that going by ordinance would be illegal under the charter. Okay, thank you for those, for that clarification. So we'll go ahead and continue. We do have a motion on the floor. So council member Brown. Uh, uh, just a couple of comments and one more question. Um, so we've been at this for a while now um, and um, uh, lamentably most of that has been behind closed doors uh, so the public really has not been uh, privy to the same information that we have and and so you know i think that um, this is very new as uh, mayor myers and other council members have said this is a, a really major change and uh, in ha in how we do business how we um you know our, our city representatives are picked and um, and so I, I do think that having some additional uh, community in, input, um, you know, either additional public meeting, town hall meetings, um, you know, some kinds of you know, maybe community workshops, things that would give the public an opportunity to in um, in a in a form that is not simply. Uh, you know, everybody lines up and says we support it or oppose it, right? Because that's not really going to tell us much about how to move forward. Um, so getting meaningful community input, I think, and, and finding ways to do that is really going to be critical. Um, <clears throat> so what's become clear to me in all of this time is that um, I'm just going to say this for the public record and for the public watching um, or listening, um, that it, it doesn't really matter if um, there is racially polarized voting in our community or any given community. And it really doesn't matter whether or not um, districts would be an appropriate remedy or for that matter, if it might actually undermine the goal of <coughs> increasing diversity of candidates, um, which is frustrating. I mean, that's a function of the CVRA and the way it's been interpreted by the courts. So um, here we are. Um, it's, you know, there is a, there are attorneys out there who are literally going around to California communities, um, cities and extorting money out of those communities and forcing district elections. And, you know, it's, it's really frustrating to see this happen, it to be successful in this way. Um, but we are in, a, um, a situation now where we're part in an, in a settlement agreement, essentially. So I am, I guess I'm wondering, um, 
because we've never been asked to actually approve an ordinance or any particular plan for district elections, um, what point um, do council members, do, do we actually get to go on record saying whether or not we support this? Because we've kind of been all been moving along this, you know, down this path, um, understanding that it's, you know, we, we're kind of, in, we're just in this bind. But at the same time, we're, you know, I, I've heard other council members and I've asked, um, you know, serious concerns about, uh, you know, whether or not this is actually going to support the goal of inclusion and access. So um, I just want to clarify, I guess, our, so today we are being asked to accept this report, um, give input on what else we want to see happen in the process. And um, we're not being asked to make a statement of clearly yes or no on district elections. Is that I just want to be clarify that because if that is the case, then I'll be voting no. Um, <clears throat> so if anybody could just help me understand, yeah, um, I didn't see anything in the in the agenda report that said that's what we're doing today. But I'm starting to just feel there. Yeah, and today's no. item was. Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor Myers. Please. No, I was going to say maybe Ralph, you can clarify. My understanding was. Um, the, the former that you described, not not going as far as saying you support or non-support of a district election, but um, Ralph, please clarify. Correct. Today's item is following up on the direction that was provided in the resolution that council passed in um, May of 2020, which includes um, bringing an ordinance for a council to consider um, that would transition the city to district elections um, by 20 by the 2020 elections. So at the end of this um, process, that ordinance, including draft map or including a final map, would go to council uh, for final consideration um, in this process. But um, today's action is really just presenting that schedule of how um, staff plans to meet the direction that was given in the resolution that was passed back in May. Thanks. And then I guess the last thing I would ask um, my colleagues if you would be willing, who made the motion, and second, uh, if you'd be willing to include uh, some information about rank, rank choice voting coming back to us as part of that. I know it's a huge can of worms and there's a lot, um, you know, a lot that goes into that, but at least just something so that it we can understand it a little bit better and um, kind of put it in the in the mix for conversation. I know there are many community members who are interested in it and um, I don't want to, I'm not suggesting this to try to derail what the road we're going down, but I do think it's important to be responsive to community's interest and, um, you know, at least, you know, open up the space to talk about it. Council Member Brown, yes. Um, I think Mayor Myers also um, named those specific pieces. I didn't list them exactly, but it sounds like rank choice voting, voting um, the Independent Citizens Committee and elected mayor were three pieces that came up um, by uh, community members and colleagues. Um, so for staff, we can add those specifically for staff to come back in August to let us know what those would look like. Thank so you. I'm okay adding that, yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear it, so I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, I have Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Golder. Thank you. I have um, a couple questions related to the timeline. Um, I know one of the things that um, I mentioned earlier and it might be taken for, that I'm, I'd like to offer for consideration is that given the timeline of, um, you know, we have about, we have a few months before. Um, August hits and we get, um, and this comes back to, and so one of the things I was maybe going to suggest is that we, um, if there could be a public hearing, um, you know, between now and when this comes back to council, preferably in June. Um, but in addition to that, I think one challenge too is, you know, if we, if we get feedback from the community that, you know, we'd like to move forward with an independent commission, my my thoughts are that we'd probably need to establish that commission sooner than later if we want that commit that body 
to have any kind of influence over this process for the upcoming, you know, for when we're drawing these maps. So that's one thing to take into uh, consideration. And so I'm wondering, you know, if, if we want the independent commission, if we want recommendations on that, would it make sense for us to have a public hearing to allow the public to weigh in on these timelines and then, and also specifically on that independent commission, and then we could have a report back at the second meeting in June. And the reason why I say that is because if uh, the community strongly feels that we should move forward with that independent commission, and maybe they'll be able to provide us some feedback on that timeline um, during the summer months or during when we're off, uh, that, would, that could provide us with an opportunity to select members to serve on that body if that's the direction we're going to go in. And so, um, I don't know if I need to make a friendly amendment, but um, if I were to make a friendly amendment, it would be to um, direct staff to hold one public hearing um, prior to the second meeting in June to get feet on the independent commission and the timeline uh, for the district map drawing process and to return to the council at the second meeting in June for recommendations. As the seconder of the motion, I think that I feel more comfortable with just moving forward as we originally outlined in terms of the timeline. I think it seems really rushed to have it come back in June. And frankly, I, having been mayor, I'm not, I know that sometimes you have a full agenda, right? Particularly before you're about to take the break in July. Um, we're looking at having a meaningful engagement. I think we want to have our due diligence. So I feel comfortable. So I, I, I'd rather not have it go fast forward in terms of personally. And I was pausing because I was um, just thinking about staff's comment about um, the feasibility and the capacity of staff to accomplish that in a short period. If that's the case, then I um, then I'm wondering if there's the opportunity to have an additional public hearing before this comes back to us in August on all the items that you all have listed because. Um, when this comes back to us at the meeting in August, we're going to get an update on the timeline process and any feedback received from the community. And it's not clear that we that there will be any kind of public hearing before that. So I guess that is a question as well for for staff is um, given that you know what's listed in our agenda is that um, we're going to get an update in August. Um, what's the I guess what's the expectation between now and then as to what kinds of meetings will take place? Because it sounded like there's going to be two public hearings required. It's not clear whether that'll be, you know, one of those will happen before August or after. And it sounds like there's now a discussion of, you know, the independent commission, um, ranked choice voting, direct elect mayor, and that will require some time to receive input. So can you kind of provide any feedback on what are your thoughts around timelines for how to make all this happen? Um, so the, um, the reason why we wanted to come back uh, to council in August before the public meetings um, occurred was to clarify what would be discussed at these public hearings and to um, really determine when and how they were going to be held and just to kind of share that with the council um, before we move forward with um, the initial public hearings, which, you know, will cover the process content and um, uh, answer concerns the community might have before any maps are drawn out or drafted. Um, if the council feels that we should have those initial meetings sooner, that's something we could change and um, you know possibly come back to council before the first public hearing um, occurs so we could share with you what is going to be expected at the public hearing or if council wants you know, for staff to move forward the public hearing before returning to council um, with a finalized schedule. Um, that's fine too, but that was sort of what the thought process was of um, why we wanted to come back to council um, before the initial public hearing occurred was to clarify with council that, you know, this is what the um, public hearings are going to look like. This is what's going to be discussed and um, this is when they're going to happen and um, kind of give council the, uh, the heads up before we started rolling out with the public meetings. Yeah, and the hearing that I'm, the additional hearing that I'm kind of referencing too is, is really an opportunity to get some input on the various topics that we've brought up today, you know, and to get that before 
you know, we start this process. So I don't know if the make or the second of the motion will be interested in us um, okay. having an opportunity to have a public hearing prior to this coming back to us just to allow the public, especially given that, you know, again, we're hearing this at, you know, three in the afternoon on a Tuesday, um, more of an opportunity to just understand the process, weigh in, and then before this comes back to us in August. I'm sorry, can I just add something really quick? I think a quick question. I think some of the uh, reasoning for the timing too was related to, because uh, the focus uh, again is on the maps and getting input on the maps was the time needed to prepare the maps and to collect the data. So that was in part mm -hmm. driving the timing. Mm -hmm. um, and at, at some point the census data was delayed. And again, the, uh, you know, whether making them sooner will allow for the maps to be available and drawn and then you know, which is the main purpose of the hearings. So that's that's was the reason for that. And I don't know if, uh, if Ralph or, or Victoria know whether that can be accomplished because of the work that the demographers doing. So that's. So the, the, yes, the purpose of the meeting is to, to specifically focus on the maps and on the election schedule. These other, you know, ranked choice voting, independent voting commission, uh, at large election is something different. And so that could be a different process. Um, but yes, our, the reason for those meetings to be after our August meeting was, as, as Ralph said, and, and, and to account for the census data and to come back to you with an updated schedule based on that. Yeah. And I'll just clarify that I totally understand that, um, you know, for the purposes of the mapping, but I think there's another question around process and having opportunities for the community to weigh in on the process. We're adding things um, for consideration, you know, creating another opportunity between now and August for the community to weigh in. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a council meeting. It can be a time when, you know, members of the public are not at work, which is, I'd say, the majority of people are probably working right now. So I'll put that out there again as another friendly amendment. Um, if there's the opportunity to have a public hearing for the for community members to weigh in on the process and all the alternatives um, under consideration before our next meeting in June and before this comes to us in August. Mayor, may I jump in? Sure. Absolutely. Make the motion. Um, yeah. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, I'm, I'm sort of going back and forth. I appreciate your comments and and also um, would like to see a meaningful public engagement process. Um, one of the reasons why I'm going back, a couple of reasons why I'm going back and forth. One of them is um, if if staff is going to come back with more information, the public can weigh in and give input with um, uh, more informed, right? So if if we get information from, then the public will be will be also receiving that information, and then a public hearing after that. Um, will be everyone will be more informed. So that's that's one thing. And then the other thing I'm thinking about is when will this happen? I know that lots of folks are um, there's a lot of moving pieces in summer months. Um, so we would ju I just want to make sure the timing is such that it, it it will work for community members to be engaged and involved. Um, if if staff and council are gone in July. Um, that seems like an unlikely month. And then is it feasible to happen in June? So those are some of the questions. That's, that's why I'm not sort of jumping in to say yes or no. Um, I'm going back and forth and trying to weigh what are the benefits of waiting and what are the what are the challenges or um, drawbacks um, of not. I wonder if, if, Mayor, I can offer like yeah, maybe a potential solution is that I know a staff mentioned their contact information to be in touch. I wonder if we could do maybe some like virtual outreach in terms of our mini list serves to solicit input in between now and then, and then in August revisit this discussion. Given that um, the concerns that were raised by Councilmember Kalantari and trying to balance that, but also a recognition that the office generally closes in you know the month of July, as well as a number of uh, people are out of town. I think that summer month is kind of an off month for a lot of people. Um, so I also just know that, that Councilor Golders had her hand up for a really long time. So I just want to acknowledge that um, she hasn't had a chance to speak as well. Okay. Council Member Golder. Mayor, if I could really quick before we move on too far into the weeds. Was that friendly amendment not accepted? Yeah. 
it wasn't exactly not accepted, but it wasn't accepted either. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm but, looking. I'm, but, so you amended it to um, instead of like a schedule, do like a virtual outreach to the community to involve the community, not schedule it. On a scheduled public hearing. At the public hearing. I think what's clear is that we would like an additional a pub, either public hearing or some um, form of um, meaningful outreach around these three issues that we're exploring that's separate from the maps. I think that's clear. That's what I'm hearing from Council Member Cummings is that we want a separate um, opportunity to engage the public around the three topics. Um, how we do it is, is the question, and, and Councilmember Watkins suggested that we um, do some direct outreach, um, maybe virtually. I know we're getting in the weeds, so. Yeah, I'm, yeah and it, it makes sense that. when you guys are talking about it, but putting it on paper is, in this manner is difficult. Sure. It's okay, we can, we'll watch the video. You've got the toughest job, Bonnie, so thanks yeah. for being patient with us. If I could also just clarify as well, though, but I, I also want to add that the, the district election process is, is also getting input on that is something that would be incorporated into that outreach. So, and maybe if it's helpful, I can try to just clarify that this will be providing direction for staff to conduct additional outreach, could be in the form of online outreach or a public hearing on district elections, independent commission, direct elect mayor and ranked choice voting prior to this coming back to us in August of 2021. Does that sound like you kind of yeah, said that? I'm okay with that. Then there's some flexibility for staff to figure out what's feasible. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, Thank you. Let me just check with staff. Is that, <laughs> is that doable? Yeah, I think that's something we're going to have to uh, look into. I, I, if we do have an outreach meeting with the public, I think we want it to be informative and to be able to, you know, have speakers that are really informed on the subject, on these subjects that could answer questions they might have instead of just, um, you know, listing questions or gathering thoughts and all of that. Um, so it's something we could look into. Um, and those are three um, topics that are very different and um, that would require different approaches and then trying to meld them all together would be um, uh, quite, quite a challenge before August, um, but it's up to the council and I see Martine jumped on too. Yeah, go ahead, Martine. Yeah, I was gonna say, we could, I think, uh, you know, we'd have to do some, some uh, work and research on some of these topics, which we haven't really, you know, really delved into at this point and the focus has been on the uh, districting process um, but we can certainly at least uh, uh, perhaps just uh, call for input or, or, or comments or that sort of thing. But I think to expect a, a robust process that we normally do would be unreasonable given the time frame and, and all the other constraints that were noted. Thank you, Commander Johnson. Do you, do you want to direct or Council Member Watkins something either virtual or a way to because I do, I do think that there's a little bit of kind of separate, separate um, uh, components going on. But obviously, voters don't separate these things, and so I understand the intent. You know, a voter who's being asked to change a way that they've been voting for their entire since they're 18 is, you know, something that's very important to be able to explain and there's a lot of other ways that people are starting to look at you know for the public it's it's really it's that lens of you know how is this going to affect the way that i that i vote for who i want to you know be on the city council so i'm wondering if there's a way that we could um to martine's suggestion you know either do this virtually maybe initially through some surveys or i i'm not sure how to manage it but we're all, we are in an, under an obligation, whether you like it or not, we are in to obviously move towards district elections. So it's sort of a little bit of a, a, a you know, slightly different sets of questions that could be asked. So I'll look to the ma motion maker. And then I do want to get to, uh, to Council Member Golder. Um, so maybe the maker of the motion, Council Member Colin Dory Johnson. Or, sure, yeah. Or complicate this, and I certainly don't want to make it not feasible. 
um, for staff to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Um, so um, let's let's go with what Council Member Watson suggested: is that we do some engagement and outreach virtually, um, and if that's feasible and doable, um, then we return in August with a more robust discussion. I'm comfortable with that as a seconder, for sure. Yeah, yeah and, and I was just—I was just going to say that um, since I made the, the friendly amendment, I was just going to say too. I'm—I was just trying to be very inclusive, you know, given that there are multiple topics. You know, if it makes more sense to focus just on the district elections at this point in time for that feedback, I'd be fine with that as well, and, and with the independent commission. But if you know, it seems like a. Uh, you know, doing the virtual outreach and coming back with a more robust discussion, if that seems like something that's doable, you know, I'm, I'm all for that too. Uh, again, I don't want to overcomplicate this, but, um, you know, just given that in the, um, the staff report, you know, it's August 2021, staff will provide an update on the timeline process and any feedback received from, from the community to council, trying to, you know, create another opportunity for the community to weigh in um, where they can, you know, receive notice and provide feedback on all this. I, I, that's my intention behind all of this. So, thank you, Council Member. Thanks for that clarification, Council Member Golder, and then I've got Vice Mayor Bruner. Um, thank you. So, I'm not sure um, who organized the timeline in the process when city schools switched to district elections, whether it was the demographer or the school. Board. I don't know if Tony knows the answer to that, but I wanted to say he's on his way back. As I wanted to say that the process was really smooth and there was a lot of opportunity for um, public outreach and engagement. And so I realized I, um, this might be the first that people in the community are hearing about this, and we've been hearing it about it in closed session for over a year. And I know Council Member. Brown and several of us have expressed that we don't like how we we got here, and you know we feel like we're being extorted almost. But here we are. Like, um, and so I just was wondering what process the school board used with those because it was really smooth and successful. I'm sorry, council member, but I don't have that information. Okay. Um, my involvement in uh, the redistricting or the the transition to district elections for the school district was really focused on uh, the charter amendment that that came after the district had already converted to district elections. And my understanding with that, Councilmember Colder, I attended some of those. Um, I believe the school board actually, you know, was directing, and I, I believe we may even have hired the same demographer for ourselves. So I think there's some overlap there, and and. Uh, I went to at least two or three of those hearings and they were very well attended and the demographer was very clear on sort of the process and how before showing maps and then after maps, how all of that data had been uh, crunched to be able to produce, you know, via the intent of the CBRA it was very clear in terms of how that data was uh, basically utilized to create proposed districts. It was, I agree, it was well done. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the discussion, this is great. Uh, so let's see, we have a, a first, a second, a friendly amendment. Um, my comment is, um, you know, Council Member Cummings brought up the Independent Redistricting Commission, and I just did a quick search on that, exactly what that role is. And um, they're established to draw electoral district boundaries and, um, uh, and, and responsible for determining boundaries of districts. So I think the concern to get in front of and to consider as we move forward is that with the demographer and any draft maps before we get to that point, uh, understanding if an independent redistricting commission um, 
is needed in that process. So that part would come first, it seems. And I think that was the point that Council Member Cummings was was trying to address. And so looking at the August well, we have an August 10th council meeting and an August 24th council meeting. And, um, you know, it, it almost seems like the August 24th council meeting would be the, the better option to allow time for that public input. And, um, you know, just taking into consideration today's recommendation is um, directing staff to move forward with this proposed timeline. Um, and I think we've really brought up the key points. I would like to really emphasize the communications around this. So that landing page, uh, Ralph, thank you for screen sharing the landing website, the city website is crucial as one tool to get this information out and maybe to bullet point district elections, elected mayor, rank choice voting, independent redistricting com committee or commission, and brief little blurbs about what that means, um, I think will be really important to, you know, we can all share that and um, to consider other ways of getting that information out um, besides the online website so that um, as much of this information is in front of everybody so that come August, it's not a complete surprise. Um, so um, uh, thank you for all of, all of the points brought and the discussion. Okay, great. Um, we're running about an hour late, so I'm gonna call, I'd like to just get the vote um, going. Um, we've been on this item for it, and we do have people waiting, members of the public who are waiting for the, the green uh, business and builders recognition. So council member Cummings, do you have additional comments? Sorry, there's a lot of car outside my house. I guess the one, you know, to follow up on that, um, would it be worth us, you know, with the independent um, redistricting commission, if that's something that we're interested in, I'm wondering if we, may want to, you know, have an item on an upcoming agenda in June, because if we do want to consider that, you know, it's going to take some time for us to select individuals and what's that process going to look like? Because, you know, is it each council member gets to appoint an individual to serve on that body? The staff is recommending I mean, that at this point. So I think, I don't... I, well, I think, I mean, I, I'm... I, what I'm interpreting from the agenda is that, you know, they want to have feedback from us and if that's something we're interested in doing, we can provide that direction. And so I think um, Vice Mayor Brunner made a good point that, you know, if that body's role is to provide, to help draw those maps, if that's something we want to do, my, I think, you know, if we could have that bring back an item related to that, we can have a further discussion on that at that point in time, just to not hold up, hold us up any longer. So. I mean, I'll look, I'll look to staff, but my understanding was that they had been hired to basically draw the maps and then... Yes, you're, you're correct, uh, Mayor Myers. And um, a clarification might be that uh, these commissions were intended to redraw districts, whereas council members, uh, uh, they're able to transfer that authority to redraw, redraw districts in the future to these independent commissions, whereas council members cannot transfer the ability to decide whether or not we go to district with an independent body. That's a decision that still needs to be made by the council. And um, to get there um, is sort of the process we're presenting today, um, which is why many um, jurisdictions in California do decide to um, have independent redistricting commissions but to redraw districts um, with that commission after um, they have decided to move forward with districts and that original districts are there and then um, have a very thorough vetted process to determine who serves on these commissions and then um, getting um, a lot of feedback from the community to determine if, you know, in the future with new data from the census or any major population shifts in the city, um, if those lines need to be redrawn. Um, but I, that is definitely um, the main um, use of these commissions. Look at the jurisdictions and the districts that are already there to see if they need to be amended. Um, however, the authority to move into districts, that's um, 
uh, given to the council members, and I don't think that's transferable to an independent commission. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll go ahead and um, uh, call, get the here. I'm just checking on a timing issue with the clerk. Um, okay, great. So we have a motion on the floor by council member Kalantari Johnson, seconded by council member Watkins um, to provide direction for staff to proceed with the recommended next step and proposed general timeline to transition city council district elections, uh, including the solicitation of public input, um, the district map drawing process prior to council considering adoption of an ordinance to institute a district-based election system. Um, staff is also, was also requested to um, come back with additional information on process around elected mayor um, and there's been a request that uh, additional public outreach be done as soon as possible um, virtually to begin to provide as much to the public as possible on, on the process uh, and including information about the roles of independent uh, redistricting commissions and possible other types of, um, of, of uh, voting, including ranked choice voting um, and as I said before, the elected mayor. I think that's kind of what it is captured. Is that correct? So I will go ahead, Bonnie. Did you get all that? Uh, yeah, the gist of it. We got it. Okay. Um, well, council members. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead and call for a roll call vote. Council members Watkins. Aye. Kalantari Johnson. Brown. Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. I'm going to go ahead and take item 20 now, the green business and green builders recognition. I know that we have uh, members of the public, actually the awardees in the um, in our uh, in our uh, attendees today, so I want to I want to not tie them up any further. We're running a little bit late already, um, and so I will go ahead and take item number 20. We will then take oral communications after this, and then item 21. Um, so next up is our our agenda is item number 20: presentation on green business and builders recognitions. Uh, this is going to be a presentation of staff. Kurt Hurley, our green building specialist and awardees of the green business and green builders recognition. We will not be taking public comment on this item as council is not taking action. So welcome, Kurt. Thanks welcome. Thanks for Of course, I'm gonna share my screen. Can everyone see? Good afternoon, Mayor Myers and council members. I appreciate the time to make this presentation to council on behalf of the Green Building Program. The city of Santa Cruz demonstrated continued dedication to responsible and sustainable building practices by providing green building review for over a decade and including over 1,100 all electric dwelling units in our development pipeline this fiscal year. Our green building program identifies projects developed and completed by forward thinking members of the community. The award process recognizes utilizing the highest standards for techniques in construction and design. Today, I'm pleased to present two new awards for achievement in exceptional design. Since the start of the program, the city has recognized 86 projects with green building awards. Please join me in recognizing award number 87 for 231 Oregon Street. Owners Heather Waltz and Craig Waltz, the designer and builder Craig Waltz. At this time, I would like to share a short description of the first project receiving an award today. This project went far beyond the requirements for a remodel. Stone concrete sidewalk pour containing slag from the steel recycling process in the lower left. 
the reclaimed wall and flooring materials reduce environmental footprint. Radiant roof barrier assists avoiding interior overheating without resorting to air conditioning. Formaldehyde-free insulators improve indoor air quality. Placement of deciduous planting materials to avoid unwanted heat gains during shoulder seasons further enhances the passive design and resiliency. Reused wood framing reduced the sensitivity for the project. The award plaque for 231 Oregon Street and certificate will be conveyed by physical mail at this time. The owners would like to express their thanks. Please join me in also recognizing award number 88 for 192 Hollywood Avenue. Owners, Bentalon and Luke Bentalon. Architect, Peter Spellman and builder, Scott Rogers, SLR Construction. At this time, I would like to share a short description of the second project receiving an award. This project went far beyond the requirements for remodel. The owners specified a suite of electric appliances to reduce the environmental impacts. Heat pump conditioning and heat pump water heating significantly reduces natural gas usage and shifts energy consumption to electricity. Photovoltaic panels installed help offset daytime electric loads and battery energy storage helps reduce peak load reliance for grid import electricity, especially during weekday evenings. Sun tubes increase natural lighting efficacy and reduce electricity use for artificial lighting. The award plaque for 192 Hollywood Avenue and certificates for the project team will be conveyed via physical mail at this time. The owners would also like to express their thanks. In closing, I want to remind our community that the city of Santa Cruz is still a leader in the push towards a new era of sustainable communities, which are also affordable. We have chosen to recognize the importance of quality and climate resilience in our built environments. There is, this is especially important as we enter the era of neutral energy and positive energy buildings. The Green Building Program is motivated by our continued leadership role to inspire through engagement with the creative minds with our community as we work together for a more secure future. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. And I uh, just want to open this up for council member comments. I'll take a quick one myself. I just want to congratulate the, all those involved, um, the designers, the builders, um, lucky enough to live a few doors down from Craig and uh, watched him put all his heart and soul into that building project and uh, watch his kids love to uh, play in that garden with the deciduous trees and um, it's great to see little Bo in that picture. So um, special uh, congratulations there, Craig. And, um, and also as, um, as Kurt said, uh, you know, the city's been a leader in this for over a decade. So. Many communities are just getting their green building programs up and running in, in terms of climate change, and we've been leading the way for a, quite a long time. So congratulations to the Vatalans and to Mr. Rogers, and uh, thank you for doing this with your homes. It's a great example for, uh, for this, um ability to really put, their, put that green uh, building uh, concept into reality and for people to be able to see in their neighborhoods. So thank you for all your work. I'll see if any uh, council members have, and thank you for your patience and we're running a little bit late today. Um, I'm happy to have any council members make comments as well. Uh, council Cummings. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, congratulations to you all and, and, uh, and thanks for making these green buildings a reality. I know many people want to see these come forward. And I just had one quick question, which was, um, you know, a lot of times people are curious about the difference in cost between traditional building materials and these green materials. And then oftentimes there's, you know, benefits that come with 
the green building materials and how they help um, save on, you know, energy with, you know, if you don't have insulation, you can, you know, you don't, well, I'll, I'll reframe frame that, but, um, you know, in terms of heat exchange throughout the day that uh, oftentimes some of these green buildings are much better at that. And so I'm just wondering if you can speak to some kind of the benefits of these green buildings, how it relates to costs currently. Sure, I, I, can, I can speak to that briefly. So in evolving the green building program, as we have an increased emphasis on electrification, I've taken some of those measures in place that can help reduce the total occupancy cost of the building by avoiding electric rates during hours where electricity will be more expensive. There's also materials that many of our builders are learning about, like refabricated, remanufactured paint, some of which is made in our own state in Sacramento, that can save 12 to $15 a gallon for a mid-grade paint. So just a couple examples of things that change um, the equation for first costs, which generally people are more sensitive to. What's the upfront cost before I move into the building in the example of the paint? And then those things which have longer uh, economic um, uh, you know, time frame to them that, that you, 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 um, you have a savings based on an initial investment that, that you realize by reduced utility bills. Um, there, there are many new features um, as, as we're going to a uh, time of use electric rates dated a year and a half ago, which we'll be seeing people adopting things such as heat recovery, ventilation, interfaces so your utility can communicate rate information with your appliances. So there's a lot of things um, that we have now and that, that, that we'll see uh, implemented going forward. Great. Well, thank you all again. And uh, program, I'm so glad to see um, more buildings in our community receive these awards. Councilmember Golder. I just wanted to congratulate all the recipients and then also acknowledge Kurt for all of the work he does uh, behind the scenes in the city to promote um, sustainable growth and green building. So thank you. Great. And Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you for sharing those photos. Um, Award number 87 and 88, does that mean there are 88 green buildings in the city of Santa Cruz or in the county? How are those numbers related to those award numbers? So the green building program has two different award levels. The awards that were, the two awards that were granted today are at the highest level of the city's building program. And mm -hmm. the total since the beginning of the program um, well, today's award 88. Does that answer your question? Is that within the city of Santa Cruz? Within the city of Santa Cruz, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, congratulations again, and uh, thanks to staff and to our community members, and uh, congrats on those plaques on your houses. Take care. Okay, we will go into oral communications next. Uh, and this is for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you're in, interested in addressing the council, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required to state your name for the record. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. So again, this is um, oral communications. I see two members of the public. Uh, Mr. Garrett, you're up first. Hi, this is Brett Garrett. And I'm very happy to see the city of Santa Cruz listed as an endorser of the Save California Solar Campaign. Um, I hope you'll take this a step further and pass a resolution to oppose AB 1139, which is anti-solar legislation at its worst. AB 1139 claims to be an equity 
that will hurt everyone by increasing transmission costs and by reducing distributed resources, resulting in less resilience and more environmental damage. AB 1139 obliterates net energy metering by changing the basic solar production uh, compensation from a retail rate to a wholesale rate, and it imposes a monthly grid access charge that will actually result in some solar customers paying higher utility costs than if they never installed solar in the first place. Fixing the duck curve requires more batteries, not fewer solar panels. Net energy metering reform should be oriented toward encouraging more energy storage, not discouraging solar panels. Please pass a resolution to oppose AB 1139. And closer to home, Central Coast Community Energy, formerly MBCP, is proposing some very bad changes to their rate plans. It's sort of a reverse Robin Hood. Take more money from the smallest residential customers who don't use much energy and provide excess savings to non-solar commercial and agricultural customers. Please oppose the fixed monthly charge of four and a half dollars, which will disproportionately impact low income customers. And please oppose all provisions that will harm solar customers. I'm very concerned about 3CE's so-called uh, cost of service plan. Um, I mean, I, the general concept seems okay, but the details concern me. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next up is uh, caller with the phone number ending 3158. Please go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, first, I'd like to say that uh, by changing the order of uh, who who is to speak uh, tells a little bit about the mayor's priorities. But anyway, uh, I want to talk about the child care impact fee from the last couple of meetings and uh, was suspiciously lumped in with the developer fees, but those are to charge developers for city services they're receiving but not yet paying for otherwise because they're unfinished construction sites or are charging a city services directly done as part of the construction. Child care impact fee is neither. The argument new developments create an additional child care impact is than saying any population increase has an impact. Well, any population increase does have an impact, yeah, on everything. We have a tax that takes care of population growth's impact on government spending. Oh, yeah, there are property taxes, sales taxes, income taxes, et cetera, that uh, additionally you seem to forget we'll be paying uh, in, with these new developments in full forever. Exactly, exactly in the same way just like everybody else pays for it now. You may slather this with sympathy and pity for the poor children, but those who can't afford to have children, but that's like slathering mayo on a bologna nut burger. If you single out who in this town are an undeservedly politically unpopular group called developers who are no more responsible for near and dear social programs than anybody else and contribute plenty, maybe more than most, into the economic tax system. This woke gen version of equity is building an awful future, if that is an example. The county smokescreen expense a study trying to calculate the child care cost per bedroom, comparing residential and non-residential developments uh, that you relied on is grossly flawed because only parents cause the need and only they receive child care services for their children. Buildings don't, in fact, have children. Uh-oh. Seems simple to me, but not to politicians. It's been baffling the public with expensive sheepskin data latent consultant services to justify whatever they're paid to justify is an old trick in business and in government. Grandparents, trusted parent co-ops, parent qualified independent preschools are preferred preschool options. Thank you. Thank you. Next up for oral communications for on the agenda is Sabina. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I'm calling uh, today to request the city council opposes the sweep of the Harvey West agreement camp. It's rising force, it's quiet, clean, and it coexists well in that space. I've heard rumblings that traditional families don't like seeing the camp, but I have a traditional family and I think that it's a great thing and we need that space and it's working. Um, I think from what I've heard that you're looking to sweep them into the bench lands and increasing that, and that doesn't seem very tenable to me. Um, and I think it's an opportunity for the city to test and refine the emerging model in the interest of moving away from the move along policy and into solutions. And I would love to see you try. Uh, I know that there's other things that are on the agenda, but I think this one is really important. and. 
Uh, I'd really love to hear you guys talk about that when you're going over that. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Edward Estrada for oral communications, items not on the agenda. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Edward Estrada. I'm the current president of the UCSC College Democrats, uh, so I've met most of you. Uh, it's great to see you all. Um, I wanted to bring to your attention SB 379. Uh, it is a, a bill that the College Democrats have endorsed uh, that ensures that UC Health not discriminate uh, in provision of health care to uh, provide gender affirming care as well as um, as well as uh, reproductive health care like uh, you know a wide uh, range of services so I would love to see the council sign on in support of that it's a really important thing to our UC community especially as students are coming back onto campus and many students rely on uh, UC health care uh, and I also wanted to echo what the previous person said about the Harvey, West, uh, Harvey Westland um, encampment. Uh, I'm a bit concerned about, um, you know, uh, pushing uh, more and more uh, encampments uh, to uh, the bench lands and the increasing population there. And uh, I hope that we can look into better solutions for our homeless community. Uh, but thank you all for listening. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Joy. This is for oral communications, so for items not on the agenda. Go ahead, please. Hello. Um, I am calling also in support of letting the Friendship Gardens Agreement Camp stay where it is, especially in light of the of people living at Highway 1 and 9. Most of those people did not have a clear place to go. The vast majority did not have a clear place to go, which is just horrifically stressful for them and the people who are trying to help them. A few of them did go to the Benchlands area and were forced to squish in between the already crowded sites that are in that space, um, being told that the small area below the pedestrian bridge was being reserved for people from Harvey West um, who are anticipating uh, uh, being dislocated very soon. The small space that is available to the Harvey West people is, it's really, it's really too small. The space should have been let to the people who were displaced first, the 80 to 100 people from Highway 9 it's absolutely disgraceful that all of those residents were displaced. They had community help, but there wasn't a good place to take them. And there's already been a 911 call reporting that some of those highway residents were moved to an unsanctioned location. The criminalization of these people continues and moving people from where they're, where they're making do on difficult circumstances is just inhumane, absolutely unforgivably inhumane. So please let that camp stay at Harvey West. It's working. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other members of the public uh, in the uh, this point in time. So this will conclude our oral communications item. Um, I'm going to take um, a just a 15 minute break um, before we come back to begin item number 21. I apologize to those who are queued up, but we have been back in session for several hours and we all need a little bit of a break. Um, so let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break. We'll start. Those of you who are, have called in, you're welcome to stay on the line. Um, we'll come back in at 515. Thank you. And we'll be here uh, starting for item number 21, which is the ordinance um, on uh, the new camping services and standards ordinance.
Okay, we will go ahead and get started again. Um, I believe Vice Mayor Bruner is sort of in transit, so she let me know she might be a little bit slow coming back on, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so appreciate every again, another short break. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and restart the meeting. Um, we are now on agenda item number 21. This is the ordinance amending chapter 6.36 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code relating to camping services and standards. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order tonight will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Please note the following for this item. Public comment will be limited to one hour. Each person will have one minute to speak and the groups who have requested extra speaking time will have two minutes. Uh, and those groups will include the Seabright Strong will be first for extra time. Next will be the Santa Cruz Business Council Third will be Stepping Up Santa Cruz, and fourth will be West Side Cares. Those will be the folks with the extra time. I'll take you first um, at the beginning of the, of the uh, public comment period. Okay, so I will go ahead and we're gonna turn this over to the staff and just for council members tonight, I will try to um, just try to manage as much as possible the amount of time um, you know, that we spend, um, you know, with our deliberations just so that we we have enough time to, to really get through the item at an hour and respectful of people watching tonight in terms of, of the outcome. So I'm um, gonna try to try to move away from a lot of the uh, <laughs> extensive, uh, extensive back and forth if we can. Um, and, and I'll just be sort of watching to make sure everybody's queued up and got enough time to do what they need to do with regards to asking questions and co making comments um, so that there's enough um, time between all of us to get, to get uh, our, our thoughts and uh, questions out in a timely and, and uh, hopefully uh, efficient manner between all of us. So with that, I will go ahead and turn this over. Um, this is item 21, the ordinance amending chapter 6.36 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code relating to camping services. Um, and our presenter tonight will be Lee Butler, the Director of Planning and Community Development and Homelessness Response. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Mayor Myers, and good afternoon, council members. Um, I am going to share my screen here. Okay, can you all see the presentation? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. All right, um, this evening we are talking about the new Camping Services and Standards Ordinance and I'm going to focus on a number of things. First off, providing a bit of the context around homelessness response. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about city services and investments. Um, I'll provide an overview of the ordinance and I'll do a brief um, series of next steps. I will try to uh, go through this quickly to reserve a lot of time for council deliberation and public input. So, um, the County of Santa Cruz is a new division and they are working on a five year, uh, excuse me, three year uh, plan for um, reducing homelessness. Um, and um, they have goals of reducing the unsheltered population uh, by 25, uh, by 25% um, over the overall homeless population and 50% for the unsheltered population by 2024. And you can see the, the main categories on the slide here of how they are um, proposing to accomplish that. And of note, um, they estimate that to achieve all those goals, they do have about a $35 million shortfall right now. And funding is a significant challenge um, across not just the city, but the region and the state and federal levels. And we'll talk about that um, 
in just a moment here as we talk through a little bit more about their three-year and six-month um, work plan, um, including a, a range of um, steps to help address um, the data collection, to um, help address the individuals who are currently housed that um, are um, at risk of losing that um, shelter because of the COVID-19 um, funding that's going away. Um, there are a variety of um, shelter programs that they're looking to fund. Um, they're looking at um, permanent supportive housing, for example, and how that can be funded. And um, with respect to that um, $35 million shortfall that I referenced, it's worthwhile to note that um, just today, the governor released a statement that um, spoke about a $12 billion statewide package that the uh, governor is releasing to address homelessness wide. That was just released today, and so um, we'll have to see how that impacts Santa Cruz, but it's a great step in the right direction because funds for these facilities are, are just really, really needed. Um, it's important to, to distinguish the different roles that the county and the city have. And the county is related to health and housing and human services. So mental health services and addiction services um, and um, medical services, um, those rest with the county. The city's roles and responsibilities are more on the property management of the city's properties and uh, regulation and enforcement, the rules that are in effect. And, and we serve as a conduit, as a pathway to the county services. And um, some of what this ordinance um, has included um, does actually achieve that goal of um, facilitating connections between homeless individuals in our community and the county services uh, our county offers. Um, some of the things that we do as a, a city, we invest in outreach programs, primarily at the county, but also um, in uh, nonprofit organizations, specifically in the city, like the downtown streets team. Um, we invest. And, um, like rental assistance monies, um, and we invest in infrastructure, like the hygiene bays at, um, at Housing Matters, um, and um, shelters and safe parking, um, affordable housing development, and of course, federal and state advocacy. And all of these are pieces of the puzzle that we, in our role, to um, support uh, as a means to um, provide services to and assist those who are homeless in our community. So moving to the ordinance itself, um, there are four primary goals, um, eliminating the impacts of large encampments, and in a time, place, and manner for how camping can occur, Again, helping support people on their path to county services, and then um, making sure that we've got a uh, ordinance that is both effective and legally sound. So we have a couple of updates. The, the first one was really a part of the prior um, ordinance as well, but it is it's paired with the second one differently. So the the prohibition of daytime camping remains when a storage program has been put in place. And the biggest change as part of this um, proposed ordinance, the draft that's before the council, um, is prohibition of nighttime camping throughout the city when there are available alternative sleeping locations that can be offered to an individual. And so that's the, the primary change, and that has changed a, a number of the sections, mostly um, 6.3, 6.040, 
um, related to prohibited areas and 050 related to permitted areas for camping. Um, we did receive a, a wide range of comments um, on the ordinance and we've got three um, proposed edits uh, council's consideration that I'll talk to you quickly about here. Um, the first is related to personal effects. We, we heard a comment coming back saying, hey, shouldn't clothing be included there? And so um, under uh, subcategory five, under the definition of personal effects, we've added in um, recommendation to include clothing here for the council's consideration. Then um, under um, 6.36.080J, this section says that when a um, encampment has been noticed for a week and belongings remain, that the city would be able to um, uh, go in and remove those cataloging them without, they're, they're essentially considered abandoned. Um, we are recommending based on comments that we received that this subsection be deleted. So if there are personal effects in the um, location, even if it's been noticed for, um, for uh, over a week, this um, notice you know, to just allow um, the items to be thrown away would not be allowed. So we're just proposing to delete this section. And I can go back if, if you guys wanna read this in detail, but that whole section is proposed to be deleted. And then the third one, um, we heard from the council to, um, when we establish this, and I'll, I'll note this is existing text, just so we're clear. We, uh, we heard from the council when we established these 150 um, shelter or safe sleeping spaces in the city, that they shall not be located adjacent to residential neighborhoods or schools. And um, we, when we added this language, we specifically stated um, safe sleeping, and we received some comments um, about a, a subsequent section where this wasn't identified. And our, our first review was that, okay, the first, but this just says safe sleeping. So what we're recommending is that down here where we talk about these, again, 150 spaces again, um, that, uh, and, but here we're, we're talking about shelter, managed camp, and safe sleeping spaces. Again, city owned or operated properties or facilities. And we're suggesting that this be added. Facilities noted in this subsection shall not be located adjacent to residential neighborhoods or schools. So it's the same um, as what we've got up here. Um, and, um, that would be a clarification that it, it also includes the managed camps or safe sleeping spaces, again, on city owned or operated properties or facilities. Um, that changes um, that we have responding uh, in response to comments that we've received. Um, but I wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about the new city services that are included as part of this and they relate to that um, last change, the safe sleeping program, a minimum of 100 in space. Um, that, um, as, I, as I mentioned, would be not um, in uh, residential neighborhoods um, or um, uh, schools. Uh, and uh, the, the, way the, word, the way the wording is read is listed as adjacent to residential neighborhoods or schools, which can also uh, equate to not being in. I think you might hear a question, a comment from the public about wanting to add in as well. Um, but 150 spaces um, would be established. Um, there would also be a daytime storage program established. We anticipate that wherever we have a safe sleeping program, we would also have a daytime storage program. They, they work together, but that may or may not be the case. You know, there may be shuttles, for example, to from one place to uh, another, and the storage program may fit best at that shuttle location. So um, that's still yet to be determined, but um, there, there 
is certainly a uh, synergy between those locations, whether the transportation locations or the physical uh, storage location. With respect to those storage facilities and safe sleeping, as well as um, managed encampments um, and some other services that I'll talk about in a moment, we are um, in the midst of preparing a request for qualifications. We were just um, uh, working with some of the other departments today um, on getting some of the finishing touches put together on that. And um, what we're asking for is for providers to respond with um, their background, their experience, their outcomes, their operating costs for um, how they would operate these facilities in a manner that is compatible with the goals and objectives that we have of serving the unhoused population and limiting impacts um, within the community. Um, we have um, identified in that um, in addition to the things that I mentioned before, also indoor shelter operations. Typically shelters are um, operated and funded by the county, but there could be, for example, a shelter uh, operator that says, hey, I've got a facility and I want to operate this and I uh, want to do it and we may want to explore that independently from the county. Um, similarly, hygiene services, um, the uh, restrooms, hand washing, showers, uh, uh, clothes washing. You know, we would hope to have a county partnership on those kinds of things, but there may be instances, um, you know, we could, for instance, um, contract with a, um, a, a group uh, separate uh, for, for a safe sleeping site, for have one operator providing the services at the safe sleeping, but another operator providing the hand washing and restrooms, for example. So we've got those separated out in there. And then um, the council specifically has in uh, the ordinance directed us to um, include um, outreach to individuals and, and, and to aim to precede enforcement activities with outreach. And so we've got some provisions in the RFQ that um, specifically focus on what's sort of the city side of things and not the county side, not the health and human services type outreach, but more on um, helping individuals understand what the rules are um, without an enforcement that, uh, that's typically associated with the police. And then finally, someone may have locations. They may not be an operator, but they may say, hey, I've got this building where I think uh, you know it's it's a, a vacant warehouse, and I think we could um, have some of these facilities here. So we um, open up those opportunities for responses as well, and um, by by broad possibilities for engagement, um, there is a expectation that's spelled out in the RFQ that the service providers will be facilitating connections to the county service providers who we expect will be regularly present at these facilities. And then um, there was also some related to um, community engagement and we want to learn from the experience that others have in operating similar facilities and so we're looking at getting together an advisory group on um, the facilities that we are looking to um, operate city. And then um, anytime that we are proposing a, um, a location for these facilities, we will be doing site-specific neighborhood outreach to the surrounding area to understand their concerns, to figure out how we can maintain constant communication with them if they have any concerns as it uh, as it uh, gets up and up and so forth. Um, two more things here. We have a um, general services and uh, standards webinar that we'll be hosting on the 20th at 11 a.m. And that's a broader, um, audience that, uh, that we're uh, looking to attract, and it's really a higher level overview of um, what we're doing. Um, and then we'll have a uh, pre-submittal 
RFQ Q&A, and that's really geared towards those um, organizations that are looking at submitting so that we can have that dialogue and um, uh, the questions that they have and the ideas that they have for um, the response to the RFQ. And I believe the last slide is um, next steps. Um, council has provided, um, this, is, this is the fourth time this ordinance has been in front of the council in the last few months since late February. And um, council has provided a whole range of, um, of uh, recommended steps. And I wanted to be clear that those steps are still um, valid and that we are um, looking to move forward with those. Um, and um, so that includes um, things like uh, a quarterly census of the homeless individuals um, and effectiveness review of the ordinance. So taking a look and seeing how are we doing with this? What things do we need to change? What's working well, what's not? Um, how can we make this better? Um, and then a semi-annual review of arrests and citations that occur pursuant to the ordinance. We are also um, pursuing uh, a lot of the items that council has directed us with respect to outreach and integration of the um, safe sleeping and managed encampments that we do, um, any shelters that we do, how we integrate that with the continuum of care. And we've already had initial conversations with the county about that. And um, the council has requested that we, we come back and provide updates on uh, the restorative justice approach that they have suggested. So we'll be back in, um, in ju uh, June related to that. And that, um, it's something that our police department and city attorneys have already been having conversations on and they are, um, uh, they've already uh, pinged the, the DA with some questions there. Um, and then um, also with respect to longer term solutions, there are a range of things that the city council has requested we collaborate with the county on like a navigation center. Um, and I wanna close by saying that um, in uh, one week's time, we will also be hearing from the county with respect to their three-year strategic plan and six-month work plan on homelessness. And so that will be another opportunity for the council to engage the, the county and to hear their feedback on um, the long-term approach and the short-term steps that they are taking in order to achieve that long-term approach. And so with that, I over to the mayor and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great, thank you, Lee. Yeah, and I might just say a couple of comments in the context, um, especially Lee, with the, with the last few slides that you shared. Um, and I think it's really important that, you know, the public understand that the ordinance is really the beginning of a, of a much broader management um, strategy that the city is rolling out, including committing to providing 100, 150 safe sleeping sites every night. Um, but more importantly, it provides um, many ways where the county and its services provided for um, outreach, for healthcare, for um, getting people, you know, resources in terms of shelter or you know methods to get people back home or and um, it provides all of that because we actually have much more touch points built into this management system than we have um, without you know per, you know with with versus sort of a, an encampment that's unmanaged or sort of on its own so um, I also want to uh, really recognize the work that the staff has been doing on the RFQ uh, you know, service provision is such an important part of the success of moving an individual or a family or someone in need um, is really, you know, the level of service provision 
um, the cap, the capabilities of our service providers, all of that really comes into play in really the success ratio of really actually helping someone move through the system and hopefully into more secure to a more secure um, situation um, here in Santa Cruz. And um, I think it's really important too to recognize that the governor's announcement today of $12 billion for homelessness in the state of California is Nothing has ever been done like this on a national scale. Um, this is the largest investment in homeless um, assistance of the United States. Um, I note specifically in his list that he's actually making $50 million available for encampment management in particular. And that's a really a recognition about um, how encampments are really places where um, People are not succeeding and, you know, they're very difficult to manage for governments, for local communities. Um, so his commitment and his call out of $50 million to really address the, um, the you know, this difficult um, issue with encampments is, I, I believe, really telling. And so I'm pleased to see that the city is, you know, on the verge, hopefully, of, of really setting a management policy that then helps us cue to these other investments, which include um, housing assistance, um, actually, um, you know, even employing people to look at how um, public rights of ways and even potentially other public lands may be used to um, do some job training and other uh, activities. So I would encourage the public listening tonight to really look at this package. Obviously, it includes um, tremendous amounts, over $1.75 billion to build new housing. Um, as well as other care and other services for homelessness. So I think it's important that the city is as queued up as possible with our policy framework to be a partner with the county, but also to be com com competitive as, as an, our own local government to look at these potential types of um, resources coming in from the, from the governor. So I think um, this policy is a really step tonight and I really want to recognize our staff work, um, both our city attorney's office as well as Lee and the city manager's team. Um, these kinds of policies are incredibly difficult to do um, and they're, um, you know, they take a lot of time and a lot of thought and um, I want to also recognize our community and how vocal they've been about when we got it right and when we got it wrong um, and I another sign that people are engaged uh, they want to see solutions. They want to support folks in our community that um, are suffering from homelessness, but they want to really understand and see some predictable management techniques that, you know, move people towards more stability in their lives. So I also want to just recognize our community tonight because they continue to be involved. They continue to provide feedback. I still get a lot of emails and calls and meeting and still a meeting with folks. Um, and so I think our community is really uh, ready to to um, try to figure this out, and so I think that's a good time to um, really look at completing a policy that takes that initial step forward. So, again, I want to thank the staff. I'll open up um, this now for council questions at this point regarding the ordinance. Um, and Lee, you know, I'm sure you'll be poised if, with any of those uh, changes that I think you put up, just in case council member has questions of those. So, I'm looking for any questions from council members at this time. I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor Myers. And I just want to echo the, you know, amount of work that's really going into us trying to figure out ways, you know, support um, the houseless community and also mitigate some of the negative impacts that we're, that our community is experiencing because ultimately we need to make sure that our community is a place where everyone can live and be supported and for people who are experiencing, whether it's mental health, substance abuse, or they're just down on their luck that we can really provide them and connect them to services that they need so they can improve their lives. Um, I do have a couple questions related to some of the comments that were presented in the staff report in the presentation and also thank you Lee for that presentation and um, and then other things that came up in, in the agenda uh, report um, my first question is I'm just curious so you mentioned that staff is still putting together the RFQ for the safe sleeping sites and for the storage program I'm just kind of curious what the anticipated timeline for 
you know, getting the RFQ out, identifying a provider, um, and then rolling this out. Um, and in addition to that, kind of combined with that is uh, what's the sense of, you know, what funding is available and what sources of funding could we tap into? Because, um, you know, I know there's some COVID relief that's coming, but whatever we're setting up, we don't want it to be a one-time thing that's just funded with kind of emergency funds. We, we really need to understand how can we long-term. So I'm just curious about my first question is, is those two items, which is the timeline for kind of rolling this out and then um, where the, the funding, where the funding is going to come from and also costs for the anticipated costs. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Great questions. Um, first off, um, we are targeting this week. Um, we're still getting comments for the release of the RFQ, I should say. Um, we're still getting comments back. We are working with our Office of Economic Development today and um, with our risk management team and finance, and then we still need to get that back in front of the attorneys for another final review. Um, but um, we are still hopeful that we'll be able to get it out this week. If it's not exactly this week, then it's you know imminently forthcoming following that. Um, but we're we're really close, um, dotting the last I's and crossing the last T's. Um, we are anticipating that um, we allow for probably a little over three weeks in that um, response time frame. And so um, by the beginning of June, um, we would have that first set of, um, of responses back. And hopefully we'll, we'll have you know, a, a wide variety of those from a, a lot of different organizations so that we can um, understand and compare and contrast those. And um, that gets to the cost. Um, that will give us a better idea of what the costs will be. Um, we've provided in um, prior um, uh, presentations to the council some estimated costs based on, you know, if the city were running the facility and we were paying $19 an hour, estimated hours and you know, estimated costs for restroom facilities and so forth. Um, but, you know, we are, we're, very curious to see um, what we get back as part of that RFQ and to, to see how um, those providers are proposing to staff the facilities. Um, and then um, with respect to funding, um, we are looking at a variety of sources. Um, CDBG is one. The um, special COVID relief funds, as you mentioned, are another. Um, and then, of course, you know, we do have a substantial amount of general fund resources that um, go to things like um, encampment cleanups and, and so forth. And, and so, you know, we'll be looking at a mix of funding and um, it's, it's going to depend on um, the cost um, in terms of how much of a mix we have. Um, but we are looking at leveraging those um, grant dollars to the extent that we can. And then a follow-up question to that. So in terms of the process around siting and identifying a site, would that happen concurrently with the RFQ process or would that happen after someone's been identified so that, you know, working with the provider, they'd be able to say what sites, um, you know, they'd be able to work with versus sites that, you know, are incompatible for them to work with. And then also along with that, obviously there's going to be, you know, community outreach and where this can and can't, you know, happen, where the community is okay with it and where they're not. That's, yes. So um, I think there's going to be somewhat of a parallel course there. You know, we've been focused on the RFQ and um, we haven't done any site-specific outreach, but we may also get sites back from the RFQ where we say, hey, you know, this, this wasn't on our radar. Um, but we could, you know, lease this vacant building and it would um, be a, a good opportunity for us. Um, so we do anticipate um, having somewhat of a parallel path on those. Once we get that RFQ out the door, then we can start looking at individual sites and um, start um, doing outreach to um, the uh, surrounding areas. Great. Um, and then I just have a couple other questions regarding um, the family. So there was, there was a, uh, in the agenda report, there was an item that came up regarding family shelters and really um, trying to deal with, you know, how are we going to, well, one, 
direction around prioritizing uh, homeless families. Um, and then, you know, at one point we talk about 150 safe sleeping sites. And then towards the end of the agenda report, it talked about breaking up those sites into potentially like three sites with 50 individuals at each site. And so I'm just, I guess uh, this is more of a comment than a question, but it might be worth us considering, you know, that approach and having one site where it's families and children, since that's a, a concern and that's one of the um, groups that we're really targeting. Or if, if that's not the case, um, you know, is there a way for us to provide um, uh, hotel vouchers? Because I know it was mentioned that um, the county is really trying to prioritize. I think, I think it was like 120 families this year. And so if there's a way for us to work with the county and provide hotel vouchers for families um, and then really connect them to services to get them into programs, that might be a way to address that, those issues around trying to, um, you know, to uh, prioritize homeless families. Thank you for those comments and questions. And yes, um, we do think that the county will play part in prioritizing those uh, families that are here and who are houseless. And, and you know, they've got a great resource in the Revley Family Shelter. And um, that, of course, is a much better setting than if someone is in a, a safe sleeping um, location. Um, and so, but that's where, as part of the agenda report, we were just requesting a little bit of a, a broader approach um, to the uh, prioritization of families so that um, we can you know, have the, the county resources and the county's prioritization um, potentially take um, that family and get them placed in a location that um, is a, a uh, more long-term setting. Okay. Uh, that concludes all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I have Council Member Brown and then Council Member Colantari Johnson. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation and for the materials we received in preparation. I um, I have a few questions, and the, so I just want to start with the so the discussion around. Um, or that comes directly following the RFQ discussion in our uh, staff report that we received provides, um, you know, it talks about various services and how they might be um, handled and who might handle them. And it, it's pretty vague. Um, and I, I understand that there's a lot up in the air right now and that you're working hard to have those conversations. And I appreciate that. Um, I, the, the question that I had on costs, uh, you, you answered. Uh, with Council Member Cummings' question, um, but I guess I'm I'm wondering um, how you, how you're thinking about the scope responsibility question for these various services. Um, is it are we thinking well we're just going to see what we get and whatever people can offer or they're you know have included as possibilities that they can offer as an op a contract operator and then we'll see what else we need or is there some kind of um, underlying kind of even if it's a you know just hope, our hopes and aspirations kind of plan for how that um, will will go um, and then another question related to the budget are the costs I, I'm just I'm wondering you know what do we have a plan for trying to make the actual co costs and and, and budget um, legible and transparent to the public or really even to council members you know I, I feel like um, you know, we hear we spend a lot of money in here are the general areas or, you know, it's too much. We don't have the resources for it. We, we kind of talk about them as like really, really big generalities. And, um, you know, I'm still hard pressed to be able to say how much um, money the city spends in, you know, the various categories. You know, um, it seems to me that much of what we uh, much of our cost has been and um, if we move forward in this way, is likely continue to be um, dealing with the fallout of, um, you know, houseless, uh, you know, people being in, in spaces that are not managed, that are not cleaned up, where there isn't adequate, um, you know, refuse removal, waste management. And, and so that's where we spend our money. And I don't know how much money that is. And, you know, and I don't, so in terms of comparing that to how much money we might spend um, for these proactive 
um, you know, model sanctioned encampment safe sleeping zones, which I obviously support. I've advocated for uh, my whole time on the council. But in terms of weighing, you know, where the money is going and helping the public understand, I think it would be really great to get some of those numbers um, in broken down in greater detail. So I'm just wondering if that, if you've talked about that, is there any, uh, you know, more detailed information we can get? I don't want to micromanage here, but I think that there's some pretty significant differences among the categories of spending. Sure. Thank you for those questions, Councilmember Brown. Um, and um, let me uh, let me tackle the second one first, <laughs> um, which is the budget info. So um, first off, um, we have been. You're, you're absolutely right. It's tough to get a handle on all of those expenses um, because there are a lot of things that are done just on a daily basis or in the course of um, uh, individuals' work that isn't necessarily categorized a homelessness uh, bucket uh, or homelessness response. Um, and, you know, we've got a team uh, from, you know, five, six plus departments that meets every Wednesday. And, you know, I don't think anyone's tracking their time for that. Um, and that's just, you know, one of many, many meetings that we have. Um, but um, we are um, aiming to um, be more deliberate about um, how we track this. And so we've started looking at how we can break that down and how we can look at that moving forward um, so that we can get a handle on um, not only what we're spending now, but what's a better way to spend that money. And um, that's what gets us to the, um, the RFQ um, uh, and how, uh, when you're saying understanding those expenses, the, the, some of those will be direct expenses. The direct expenses are, are much easier to track. You know, that's like, yeah, we paid for servicing of a uh, restroom facility and it was $5,000 a month uh, for, you know, five months and there's $25,000. Um, the staff time is, is more challenging, but we are looking at how we can get a better handle on that. Um, but the RFQ will uh, will have some of those, you know, direct costs that are very um, transparent and visible. So um, that's that's something that, um, you know, we'll be able to share. And um, we've got some information um, on our website and the homelessness response page, but, um, you know, it, it, we, we don't have that comprehensive view um, that we're trying to work towards. Um, and thank you for that, because that's something we want to do as well. Um, and, um, then with respect to the RFQ, you had some questions about that and um, how we're going to sort of gauge those um, responses that come in. So um, one of the things that we really, so we've got some of the standard things like, you know, okay, what are your qualifications? Have you done these things elsewhere? Um, but really want to look at it, you know, what were the outcomes? You know, how, how successful were you? Um, you know, how was this accepted in the community? What did you do to interface with the community to address any concerns that arose from, you know, the person next door? Or, you know, and how do you address problematic behaviors? We've got some questions in that RFQ so that we can gauge how these providers are going to fit into the community. And, of course, we've got costs in there and, um, you know, are you able to provide the staffing in this location, um, you know, in Santa Cruz to um, operate these facilities, those kinds of standard questions. But, you know, we really want to look at how this is going to fit into the overall community and, um, and hopefully um, there'll be a good, uh, a good mix of those because, you know, it might not be a one size fits all here. You know, we may have um, Council Member Cummings is talking about multiple locations, and there may be like, oh, this operator might be good for this location, this operator might be better for this location. You know, it's, we're going to have to wait and see once we get um, the um, responses back. But, you know, you also mentioned like things being vague. We also want, uh, we are kind of intentionally being a little bit vague so that we can get some of those creative responses back. You know, we don't want to necessarily dictate that someone has to provide um, these, this level of service 
24-7. You know, we want to understand how they're going to address services the entire time, but let's, let's hear how they're proposing to do that rather than saying, you know, this is the dictated way in which it must be done. Thanks. I have one other question, and then I'll stop. Uh, this is related to uh, the interface between the um, the ordinance once it is um, goes into a and the alternative you know spaces um, that we can direct people to, or the city can direct people to, or you know people will be aware of. Um, I I realize that the you know we are not um, what we're what we're doing here is not intending or trying to um, address the the issue writ large. So you know if we have like twelve hundred give or take people unhoused um, people in our community, and we're setting up one hundred and fifty spaces, um, they're probably I mean they're going to be get full, right? So I guess I'm 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 just still trying to understand um, that how that that interface will occur so that we ensure that enforcement when people actually have a, a space. So I'm just trying to figure out how kind of as I'm sure you all are, um, you know, in how that's going to work on the ground in real time. And I know there's no you know definitive answer, but I'm just I'd love to hear how you're thinking about that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to share. And um, you are, you know, a, a little of us in, in terms of that. But what I'll say is we've talked about things like, um, you know, all right, can we get an app that um, provides real-time information that each individual location then um, specifies that um, here's how many spaces we have available right now in real time. And then um, individuals out in the field have access to that, and they can swap specific individuals into those locations. And um, so that's, that's how we've been talking about it. You know, we haven't gotten to the point where we are, you know, making that a reality, but we think that, you know, that may be the approach that we ultimately move to. But, you know, really that is sort of a, a next phase conversation. Um, and it's, it's one that we've, um, touched on to make sure that, yes, we do need to do this. Is there a way that we can do it? Yeah, we can do something like this, um, but we'll, we'll, we still need to implement that and we still need to, to figure out a lot of those logistics. And, and ideally, you know, we would also um, have, um, you know, the, the county or if there is a nonprofit operator that isn't a city facility that we get them connected into, it, into this. Uh, um, you know, the county has their own um, uh, intake procedure um, for, for some of those, but there, there still may be opportunities through that. Um, so um, we, we need to explore all those avenues. And, um, it, you know, the city run facilities, that's going to be the easy part <laughs> uh, because, you know, we've got, we've got control over it. But, like, if, if we have a cool partner out there um, that's running these, like, are there barriers to entry, for example, that uh, we need to be aware of? And so, so it, it starts getting um, a little more complex, and we'll have to work through that as we um, uh, as we move forward. Thank you, Lee. Um, I believe uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson is next, and then I'm going to try to get us out to the public before it gets. Thank you. I'll be brief. I have many comments that I'll save until after public comment. I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge you, Lee, and the whole team um, of, I won't name all the names, but that you've worked with. What you guys have accomplished in the last few weeks is incredible. So I want to take a moment just to acknowledge that. I have one question. Um, can you describe what the selection process will look like for um, us once we get the RFQs? Because hopefully we'll get a, a good number providers that will be interested? What does the selection process look like? Sure. So what we're anticipating is that we have a, a short list of um, vendors that we can then go to and say, all right, we've got a location. At this location, starting at this time, um, can you run a safe sleeping 
and then we'll get the more specifics um, on here's how much it would cost, and then we can weigh those options to say here's here's the location. Um, we are working um, to make sure that um, we are um, that we want to make sure that we maintain grant eligibility um, for these, and so you know we're working through some of those procedures. Now that's that's how we're envisioning that process, um, and. Um, Subject to change as we uh, work through those grant requirements, <laughs> but that's that's uh, what we're trying to do as part of, as, as some of the finishing touches on this to make sure that we can still use, for example, CDBG funds as um, we roll these out. And and while I've got the floor, I'll take the opportunity to uh, go back to Council Members Brown's uh, question. Just broadly speaking, this year. Um, we this year is, is a little bit different because of the COVID uh, dollars, but roughly four million dollars this year that we've spent, with um, about um, three million in services and about a million in um, cleanup and hygiene. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, Councilmember Condor Johnson, is that the only question you had at this time? That was. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and take this out to the public. Um, if you are interested in commenting on this item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Um, and please press star nine uh, to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. For um, uh, for those who have been approved for extra time, there's just four groups. I'll have you speak, and then I'll go out to um, general public comment. And again, the timer will be set to one minute for general public comment. So first up um, under approved extra time for groups is Seabright Strong, and um, I believe that is Tom Brown. I see you're, you're unmuted there, Tom. So go ahead, and we'll set the timer for two minutes. Great, thank you, Mayor, and good evening, City Council. Um, I think the draft is a really good start to a very difficult and uh, intransigent problem, um, but I, I think it is the right approach. I do, though, have a few comments. I had three comments in particular. Uh, Lee Butler addressed one of them with respect to uh, Section 6.36.050D, which was the permitted camping section and excluding camping in residential areas there or schools uh, solves one of the really big problems that was in the draft ordinance. And so with that amendment, I think Seabright Strong would be quite supportive uh, of the amendment uh, of the, the ordinance. The other place where I think we have an issue is in uh, 6.36.050C. Uh, D basically says permitted camping uh, is, you know, uh, city-owned or city-sponsored uh, camping on city-owned property is what it addresses. Uh, C addresses private entities having camping in residential areas. And right now it does not preclude such camping in private areas. I believe that's a gaping hole in the protections that the neighborhoods were looking for from encampments and safe sleeping areas. And so we'd strongly suggest that C have the same addition that Mr. Butler proposed for D. Okay, so that's the two comments to the permitted camping areas. We also have one comment on the prohibited areas, which is 6.36.040, and our is to A2. And what that section says right now is that camping is not permitted adjacent to residential neighborhoods, but it conspicuously leaves out the words in residential neighborhoods. Having maybe been jaded by lots of litigation in my lifetime, I would stress if what we mean is that we won't permit camping in neighborhoods or adjacent to neighborhoods, we say the words in or adjacent to neighborhoods. And that concludes our comments. Thank you. Next up is the Santa Cruz Business Council. And that's, I believe, phone number ending in, let me look here. Uh, sorry, I've got too many notes tonight. Uh, where did that phone number go? Uh, 
let's see, I know it's uh, 707 area code. Just find that. Mayor, There's only one in the fourth. I see it. Yeah. yeah. I see it on there. Yeah. And yeah, 4546. number ending in 4546. This is for Santa Cruz Business Council. You'll have two minutes. Hello, good evening, Santa Cruz City Council members. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, thanks for hearing from me tonight. Uh, my name is Robert Singleton. I'm the former executive director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council, but this was a pretty important issue, so I wanted to go ahead and say a couple words about it. Um, so before I, I talk about why I support this ordinance, I wanna give a little context for folks, especially folks out in the public. Um, this is a major issue that's not uh, the city of Santa Cruz or Santa Cruz County. Um, recently, I've been traveling and speaking with a lot of city councils all over the Pacific Northwest and Western United States. This is a major issue that every single jurisdiction, big or small, is facing. Um, so we absolutely need a unified, concerted, and state and national efforts if we are to really make a dent, a, a major problem. Um, so. This, I support the TOLO ordinance as, as stated here. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about what this ordinance does right. So this ordinance does provide more housing options for unsheltered folks than what we had previously had. Um, I know there's been a lot of back and forth about where managed camp, but the fact that the city has, has gone and listened to neighborhoods, gone um, and talked to a lot of people and identified these clear sites is a big step in the right direction. It provides, this ordinance provides a daytime storage program, which is extremely needed. Um, when you actually talk with folks experiencing homelessness on the ground level about the things that they most need, it's a place to store their belongings so that they won't be stolen or impounded by the city. So I applaud the city for going forward and moving forward by developing a program. For um, this program collects better data. Um, by going out and actually talking to people who are gonna be in these managed and campsites, we will hopefully provide greater insight into what we're doing right and what we can do better. Um, having that quarterly census is gonna help us better refine our services and better tailor them to the needs of the people experiencing the ground. So I support this ordinance to get a step in the right direction and I appreciate the comments council have come up with. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Stepping Up Santa Cruz and I see Serge is on the line. Hi, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead, Serge. Good evening, my name's Serge Cagno of Stepping Up Santa Cruz. In a time when bring focus to marginalized populations, bring focus to the systemic barriers against achieving equity and success, this ordinance continues the marginalization of those with mental health challenges, suffering from trauma, and those suffering from poverty. Trauma-informed care is a required practice for nonprofits in contract with the county and those funded with state and federal dollars through the Homeless Action Partnership. Trauma-informed care is the idea that people suffer trauma through their services offered should have sensitivity and flexibility should be intrinsic in their design. They should not perpetuate trauma. Not all people who are homeless are criminals. They're living in poverty, have medical, mental health, domestic violence, and trauma issues. They have high numbers of adverse childhood experiences known as ACE scores. They often grew up in poverty from unhealthy home lives and very often from foster care. They deserve being treated with dignity and sensitivity to support healing. Trauma-informed care is a best practice because it's more effective and cheaper. Hiring people in the middle of the night to go to an available location without a requirement of providing transportation is setting them up for failure. This ordinance does not take into account our responsibility for our role in why people who are unhoused will not make use of our shelters and our programs. Many, many people are banned from ever returning to our shelters. This ordinance does not take into account our minimal level of support and lack of offer of management for encampments. There are innovative programs in other cities doing outreach and incentivizing picking up trash around one's campsite and for signing up for benefits and services. Any population camping without management will get out of control whether that's people with $300,000 RVs at a state park or people who are unhoused. This camping ban makes it more difficult for nonprofits and county services to engage, build trust, and to offer services. I applaud creating safe sleep locations and a storage program, yet we all know there will space for everyone. Then why is this ordinance making being homeless illegal? Criminalize crime, don't criminalize being poor and homeless. Please note, no work group, city work group has ever endorsed the camping ban. 
Thank you. Next up is Westside Cares, and I do not have a phone number, but if the Westside Cares person um, somehow indicate <laughs> who they are, uh, Bonnie, I'm not quite sure how to do this. Um, well, the only thing I can think of is if I lower everybody's hand okay. and you have them in your hand. Let's do that. So the West Side Cares person, um, we're going to lower everyone's hand and then we'll have you raise. Okay. Um, just the West Side Cares person that asked for extra time. Sabina, are you the West Side Cares person? Okay, go ahead. Hello, I'm calling on behalf of West Side Cares Neighborhood Group in opposition to the new camping services and standards ordinance, which will criminalize the existence of unhoused people using methods that have long proven to be expensive, ineffective, and harmful. Camping bans elsewhere have been marketed as a way to create services while enforcing with a light touch. However, research shows that when these types of laws are passed, the increase in services tends not to materialize, but fines, citations, and arrests increase. Then, when shelters continue to be overburdened and affordable housing not available, people are forced to break the law by either sheltering in public and risking harassment from the police or finding more isolated and hidden locations to avoid moving camp daily. This worsens public health by dispersing people and their belongings to more remote areas of the city with nowhere to discard trash or bodily waste. Much research demonstrates that camping bans do not inspire people to leave town. Instead, they travel longer distances every night in search of shelter and move more frequently between neighborhoods. The nature of having to pick up and move every single day is a well-documented destabilizing force in people's lives. In police report on homelessness, Andy Mills acknowledges that, quote, resources to help people just aren't there. Until we fix that, we're going to continue to move them from place to place or incarcerate them, which doesn't seem to be a good solution in anybody's book, end quote. It is widely acknowledged by experts that redirecting funds towards productive and preventative solutions is one of the most cost-effective weapons we have against homelessness. This means providing people with meaningful support, not proposing bare minimum services in order to justify criminalization. An example of what we would like to see more of is the Harvey West Agreement camp. By choosing to close it rather than support it, it is clear your only intention is to sweep the unhoused under the rug rather than lift our neighbors out of homelessness. We believe we are capable of employing creativity, compassion, and critical thinking to lift people out of homelessness instead of punishing them. Instead of wealth research policy, this ordinance was built from fear and animosity towards people who are unhoused. It ignores experts' evidence in the city's own point-in-time count. If enacted, we can expect to see increased police budgets, traffic, human waste, but more, most importantly, human suffering. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes our um, uh, available extra time, folks. And now I will go ahead and take um, people who have their hands raised um, just in the order that I see them. You'll get one minute. And the first person is Joy. Go ahead. Hi, this is Joy Schendeldecker from Sanitation for the People. This new ordinance continues to criminalize houselessness while offering the most paltry and vague remedies. It is misleading. People living outside are not camping. They are living and often working without housing. It's allowing people experiencing homelessness from seeking shelter in parks and open spaces day or night effectively privatizes public land from them. If essentially all land is private or privatized, where can people go? Day and night storage are important programs that should be put in place, but they do not replace the need for a resident to establish a home for themselves or to have the tool in their workplace, often their tent or vehicle. It doesn't add up. Where will the seven, several hundred people not served by safe camping find sanitation and waste management? How will you ever be able to enforce this ordinance when you have so few spaces? 150 safe sleeping spots is woefully inadequate. Sanitation and waste management are still not adequately addressed and too vague. Stop criminalizing houselessness. Next up is Ann S. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, this is Ann Simonton, and I want to thank Serge for their comments. I agree completely and wholeheartedly with their comments. It's very important for uh, the city council to hear that their comments. 
um, the major goal of this city is to eliminate large encampments. Why are you creating the bench lands, which is uh, gonna will be like the Ross Camp, uh, you know, again? And we need managed camps. I don't know how you can hear this, but what we need is managed places for people who are working and living outside, like the woman just said, and that we need to create something like friendship or agreement camp. This is incredibly important. Uh, the city spent $4 million with little or nothing for us to see as uh, what have we done? What has been accomplished? Moving them around and sticking them someplace else. It's very disturbing. It's disturbing that you can't come up with a policy that will allow faith-based groups uh, and, you know, nonprofits to create no uh, trauma-informed care. Thank you so much for your work. I know it's not easy, but I appreciate it. Listen. Thank you. Next up is caller with the phone number ending in 8443. This is Altera Hatton. Thank you for taking my comment today. I'm here today, as I've been many times, because I'm deeply concerned about your proposed ordinance, Agenda Item 21 to house our unsheltered population. You are again proposing ways to penalize their behavior. You are targeting behaviors that are inescapable acts of daily life, and you are creating a criminal class where there are simply survivors. Why has Santa Cruz refused state funding to help vulnerable helpless population in hotel rooms during this pandemic? You put our whole city at risk, not to mention denying our houseless population the transition to permanent housing, which has helped so many others in the pandemic across California. Why do you repeatedly introduce ordinances which violate Martin versus Boise? It's very nice sounding for you that the city and county have an agreement which places the responsibility for care, outreach, and housing with the county. But please understand that Santa Cruz is no longer a small town. We have a $104 million city expense budget, and a great many of us do not see the city as simply a neutral mediator between the houseless and county program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Bob. press star six. There you go. You're unmuted. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, yeah, I have, I want to comment on um, two kind of aspects of this. Uh, one is just that the city's approach to this ordinance has really um, fomented a lot of the wrong attitudes um, towards this problem by going forth with criminalization and trying to hide this a deep structural issue in our society. We're teaching our children to dehumanize uh, the people that are negatively impacted and are houseless. And second, as somebody who has survived, uh, whose family has survived a uh, wildfire, barely, um, the, the groups that have sprung up in support of the especially adopting, you know, name of locality strong. Um, it's been a gross misappropriation of that sentiment of community strength and sticking together and looking out for one another. And we should be leading with compassion. Thank you. Next up is phone number 4931. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, I'm calling as a registered nurse and lower ocean neighbor. Um, I work in oncology. I give chemotherapy to people. In regularity, I give chemo to people who are unhoused, maybe living in a car, maybe with a friend, occasionally camping outside. So we do our best to get people the housing that they deserve. Many don't want to use available sh shelter options. Most often, this is because they don't want to be separated from a partner or a pet. But whatever reason it is, it's a valid reason. So I wonder, when you pass this version of TOLO, and we all know in our hearts that you're going to pass it, even though we're desperate that our calls to empathy, evidence, and humanity will reach you, when you pass this new ordinance, I hope you think of my patients and the horrific impact that you and your ordinance will have on the little stability they may have in their lives when they have to pick up and move their stuff every day or else risk arrest or be forced into shelter that likely won't ever materialize, but certainly is unlikely to provide anything they actually need. Maybe instead I can send them to Renee Golder's house. No money in the budget, says. It's all in the police budget. If you put people in houses, you won't have to pay the lease to harass them. 
You won't have to be so grossly inconvenienced by having to look at poverty as you drive around town. Thank you. Next up is Sarah. Star six, you can unmute. There, if you're avail if you're available, if you press star six, you should be able to unmute and then you can speak. Okay, uh, I'm going to move to Edward Estrada and have Edward go, and we'll see if we can get Sarah to to um, be able to unmute. Go ahead, please, Edward. Okay. Hi, this is Edward Estrada, president of the College Democrats at UCSC. I want to highlight the qualifying disability section of this ordinance. My mother is disabled with an invisible disability, severe chronic pain. Proving disability even to physicians as a woman of color is difficult and many physicians have not believed her. I highly advise you to change the requirement that invisible disabilities require physician notes. Due to her disability for many years, we lived off of $500 a month and lost our home. If it wasn't for family support, we would have been one of the many unhoused people surviving on our streets. These people are just trying to live and criminalizing their survival is not a long-term solution for them, our communities. I stand with the ACLU of Northern California in opposing this criminalization of homelessness, and I urge you to look into further solutions to build more affordable housing in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, we'll try you again. If you press star six, that's correct, right? Bonnie, star six is unmute, is what we folks can unmute okay. with. Okay. Sarah, you're up. You have to press star six on to unmute yourself. Okay, well, we're gonna move to the next caller, which ends in uh, phone number seven, nine. Oh, wait, Sarah, there you are. You're unmuted. Go ahead, please. No, I don't see it. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 There we go. Go ahead, Sarah. Sarah, we can't hear you. Um, we'll, Sarah, I'll come back to you. I'm going to catch the next two callers. Um, next caller will be uh, phone number ending in. On seven. Hi, uh, my name's Deborah, and I wanted to make a comment. Um, the statistic I heard was that we have 1,200 unhoused people, so proposing 150 safe sleeping spots is obviously inadequate, and we really need to do more. I think at the county level, we need to change the building ordinance to make it easy to build tiny homes identify county land, build and manage tiny home villages, manage encampments, follow the models that have been working in other places like Washington, Oregon, Oakland, Santa Barbara. We can do this if we have the political will and the moral courage. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, it looks like you're unmuted, so you can go ahead. Sarah, are you using your iPad or um, other streaming device, or are you on your phone? <laughs> you need to be on your phone. And then you should mute your television or streaming device if you are calling in using like an iPad or something like that. Because we won't be able to hear you if you don't mute those. Bonnie, I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure how we help her, but I'll move on to the next caller. Um, the next call in person is user slash or underscore two. Not sure. And please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Marilyn Garrett, and I also oppose the criminalization of homelessness. As a retired teacher, I think of that bumper sticker that says, it'll be a great day when the schools have all the money they need and the Air Force has to have a big sale. That applies also for all social services, uh, 
housing parks, if we could take the approximately 50% of the money that goes to the military, what we could do with it. I also think of uh, experience I had in 1966 uh, to visit the former Soviet Union and my second cousin there. They paid about 5% of their income for housing in a little apartment near uh, a park. We have a structural problem here. It's called capitalism. And we need something, uh, something better that provides for everyone. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll try Sarah again. Looks like you're unmuted. Sarah, we still can't hear you. Okay, um, we're going to move on to the next caller, which is 3123, ending in uh, four numbers of 3123. Hi, this is Mark Kelsey. I'm a resident of the area and uh, wanted to echo my Tom Brown's support for and thanks for the work that Lee Butler and the Planning Department have done to revise the ordinance and offer um, an improved uh, uh, new ordinance regarding camping. Uh, and I support, fully support the council um, adopting this ordinance with the amendments Lee proposed and those also that Tom Brown suggested. So I think it's a very, very much a step forward and will be very helpful to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Any other attendees tonight wishing to, to speak? I am not seeing any. Oh, there's a hand. A um, couple other hands. Uh, I have a caller with the name, with the name uh, Skirt. Hi, council members. Um, this is Skirt Bonnegut, formerly of the Santa Cruz Derby Girls, and I just wanted to call in and um, thank Council Member Brown for her questions. Thank uh, Lee Butler for um, explanation of you know the app, it, it, the interface. Um, I am I'm still just sad to think that some you know council members will probably likely want to move forward with this measure, um, you know, without a clear understanding of, you know, I still understand how the city will avoid criminalizing the 1,050 people who will not be served by the, you know, safe sleeping sites. And I'm just really sad at thinking about walking to work every morning and, you know, passing by people lugging their belongings behind them, you know, all these things and that I walk to work at every morning downtown Santa Cruz. I'm just really sad thinking about having to, you know, witness that and just wishing my neighbors well. Thank you. Uh, next up is phone number ending in 6798, please. should be able to speak. We can't hear you. Have you pressed star six to unmute yourself? There you go. Press star six to unmute and then you should be able to go. There you go. We still can't hear you. Um, if you have uh, your TV on, you should be muting it or your streaming device. You should be able to speak. You're unmuted on our end, but we're not hearing you. Okay, it looks like you're unmuted, but for some reason we're not hearing you. Bonnie, do you have any suggestions? <laughs> No, except they can email the council with their comments that they would make and it would be submitted as part of the public record. Part of the record, okay. 
I'm sorry, uh, phone number ending in 6798. We can't hear you even though you're unmuted. So please go ahead and email the council. And with that, it looks like we've concluded um, those members of the public. I'll bring it back to city council now for further discussion and deliberation. Uh, I've got council member Watkins with her hand raised. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll just make a, a few comments and then I'll um, see if our staff wants to clarify some of the stuff that was brought up in the, uh, by the public. Um, I, I too wanna just really thank our staff for their hard work on this and our community for ongoing engagement um, and just really recognize the really large complex societal issue that we're really trying to do our best to address in the context of also learning from what we get right along the way, changing what we don't get right along the way, but continuing to find solutions to support the health of those who are unhoused in our community as well as the health of our entire community as a whole. I'm really encouraged that the state is uh, stepping up and hopeful that we can advocate that for small cities like ours to get a good amount of funding to support the need here. And uh, also really looking at prioritizing additional programming and restorative justice programming, thinking about a navigation center and ultimately really trying to find ways to support individuals either into supportive living environments or on a path to their independence and success in our community. I understand the concerns and I appreciate the input to help us refine that. Um, and I know that we've also spent a significant amount of time on this on this topic as well. And so I feel confident that, um, you know, unless there's any major major questions still pending from my colleagues, uh, I'm prepared to, to move the recommendation with the additional changes. I would also just add how I want to echo what uh, Councilmember Cummings brought up and really prioritizing families and seeing how we're continuing to align our interest in supporting families into the county's prioritization of families into the continuum of care. And however, that is built into this recommendation as well and encouraged by thinking creatively around things like how an app or technology can be part of our solutions too, in terms of really uh, on moment time of what's available to get people housed and in better sheltering. I also want to also recognize the the value of the next steps that were outlined, particularly around tracking data, identifying need, and uh, refining and potentially expanding based on need. And so I think it's something that we're going to continue to see brought forward. And continuous improvement has to be our north star. And so, uh, but also balancing the need to do something. So with that. I'm prepared to move the recommendation with the changed language as suggested by staff. Okay. Member Watkins, uh, I see Council Member Collentary Johnson has her hand up. I'll call. Yes, thank you. And I'll, I'll second that um, motion with um, one um, friendly amendment. Um, I, I heard Seabrat Strong mention uh, section, I'll look at my notes, 6.36050C. Um, and to make the same addition that um, added to 6.30.050D. So if um, you're okay with that, Councilmember Watkins, to add that as well to the staff recommendation. I'm okay with that, yes. Okay, and, and I did have some comments. Um, I too wanna thank, again, the staff for your incredible work, what you, you accomplished in the last um, few weeks is is really truly um, I'm I'm in awe. That was a lot of, and I know that there's other um, uh, other opportunities that you are working through with service providers in the community um, that haven't quite formulated yet. Um, and I want to thank the members of the community for your letters and your emails and your phone calls um, and and staying engaged on this very important issue. Um, I, I brought this up in past meetings around this issue, and, I, and I'm going to bring it again. It's just passion that is used all the time. Um, one definition I've heard of compassion, um, the word compassion in Sanskrit is karuna, 
And, and how that's defined is that my heart is broken to act. Um, and, and that is what I truly see us doing right now is we are acting, we are in action. It's not perfect, it's not complete, and it never will be because we can't do it alone. Um, Robert Singleton said this is an issue that's happening in all jurisdictions up and down the coast. Um, Mayor Myers uh, spoke to that as well. Um, we're not alone. We can't do it alone. Um, and yet we have to take action. We have to be um, moving forward. Um, and what I see that's shifted in the last couple of months since we've addressed this issue is that we truly have um, flipped it so that we're focusing on services. We're focused on um, solutions and we're focusing on contributing to the larger spectrum of services that are needed. Um, no 150 safe sleeping sites is not enough. And we know that there's going to be more that's going to happen. Um, one caller mentioned we want we want managed camps, we want faith communities and nonprofits to be involved. Um, that's exactly what we're pursuing with the RFQ process. Um, the city proposing to do um, to do this by themselves because we can't we can't do it by ourselves. Um, and we also we'll hear more about this next week from our county partners. But we know that the county has a, a, a work plan of the six, next six months that really truly ties into what we're doing. What we're doing is aligned with the county. We heard that the governor approved dollars for homelessness. Um, as a grant writer, I know what it takes to be competitive as a community. Funders want to see communities that are in action. Funders want to see that we are capable of moving forward with solutions. And so this is a step in that direction. And so when the state sees that we have made progress and um, we have set up 150 safe sleeping sites in a matter of months, they're going to want to fund us because they're going to want to see, see our efforts um, progress and, and expand. Um, so th those, are, those are some of my comments. Um, oh, oh, one other comment about public space. Um, I just want to reiterate what Chief Hyduke said at the very beginning of this council meeting, so some of our listeners may not have been on, that uh, one of the number one, maybe the number one source of fires um, are, are unmanaged encampments. In, and we all remember what happened a year ago. It was way too close. And so these efforts, this ordinance, um, are to mitigate the negative impacts that can cause harm to all members of our community, including those who are unhoused. Um, so I'll just keep my comments to that, but um, just remembering again, is my heart broken to act? Um, and I'm happy to see that our community is acting. Thank you. Thank you, council members. So we have a motion um, to, uh, by council member Watkins, seconded by council member Kalantari Johnson to, um, to go with the staff recommendation with the additional additions. Um, I do have one motion maker, there was also a suggestion for section 6.3, 6.04A2. Um, it's adding the word in or, I did check with Lee Butler, he does seem to be supportive of that. Can that be part of your motion as well? Yes, absolutely. And then um, I'll, I, I just have one quick, and then I, uh, I see council member Cummings and council member Brown. Um, the one thing I just um, didn't recognize in my earlier comments was, um, I also just want to recognize my colleagues because um, we've had this before us, I think four or five times now. Um, we've had, you know, literally thousands of letters. We've had hundreds of people show up um, to the meetings. Not everyone has been able to speak. Um, we've also just individually fielded um, literally hundreds of calls and hundreds of emails, um, met with hundreds of people. Um, and. You know, I looked back through my binder um, today and I see that every council member has actually been a part of building this ordinance. There is language from each and every single one of you in this ordinance. And so that is what it looks like to create a law together. Um, and I think that needs to be uh, really recognized is that it may not be perfect. It may not be what all of us want, but this is an ordinance that has been through a process of deliberation and addition. And um, I wanna just recognize my colleagues that you have all tried to add what you think are the most important pieces to this. And I think that it has obviously become much improved 
it is um, very much focused on service provision and being able to do outreach and some of the things that I think have been missing in past camping ordinances and in past kinds of efforts um, that I don't think really acknowledge that, unfortunately, because of the severity of the issues we have, we do have to spend resources to help people who um, are experiencing homelessness in our town. And so um, we have to balance that with a lot of other investments that we also need to be doing with our local businesses and into our parks and for our families so that they can take our parks and rec uh, programs and go to the team center. So it's a balance for a little city like us. but. Um, I do want to recognize that everybody's had a piece in this, and I appreciate everyone's work on this. And um, uh, just want to... so um, next up, I have Council Member uh, Cummings. Mayor, oh. if I could interrupt before we get too far, what, what was, was your friendly amendment? What was your friendly amendment? What oh, my friendly amendment add? was to add um, for section six three six point zero four zero a two. In the last sentence, it would say. Uh, safe sleeping facilities shall not be located in or adjacent to residential neighborhoods okay. or schools. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And I want to thank the members of the public who chimed in tonight. Um, I had a couple questions and then I had a comment. Um, my first question, a member, a member of the public uh, reached out and they want, this is a question for staff, they were wondering, um, and I know it might not be, this might not be the time for this conversation, but they were wondering if there are going to be any kinds of barriers for people being able to, um, you know, um, utilize these safe sleeping sites. So certain shelters, for example, will have certain conditions for being able to gain access to those shelters. And they were asking whether or not there'd be barriers in place. And if so, what those barriers might be. So I just thought I'd ask on behalf of this member of the public. Sure. Thank you for that question. So we want to have as many low barrier locations as possible. That's not to say all locations will be low barrier. Um, you know, we may have um, uh, organizations that offer to run um, facilities <clears throat> in a very um, effective and economical manner, and they, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> they themselves may have. Um, uh, certain uh, uh, thresholds that people need to meet with or um, <clears throat> certain barriers. Um, but we want to, as part of our facilities, um, <clears throat> have um, as low a barrier as we can, um, so long as you know it's, it's remaining a, a safe location for people to, uh, to be. Great, thanks. And then um, I just had one other question because this really um, gets to the, the comments that we've been hearing around um, sites going into neighborhoods and so like in or adjacent to neighborhoods. And maybe this is for the city attorney. Is there a clear definition of what is considered adjacent to a neighborhood? Because it's something that I'm trying to like really mm -hmm. understand. Like when we, because I mean, Santa Cruz is like, I feel like almost everything is adjacent to a neighborhood in Santa Cruz. And so um, when, we're, when we're considering siting and saying that you can't be in or adjacent to neighborhoods, um, I'm wondering if you can help clarify in terms of proximity what that would mean. So the ordinance does not um, contain a clear definition of adjacent to, and the thought is that the establishment of these safe sleeping sites and any managed encampments will be an iterative process. And so uh, through working with the community to, um, to, to bring forward uh, safe sleeping locations as they're identified, um, you know, we expect to hear about it if, it's, if a, an, uh, a safe sleeping site is, is set up in a way that intrudes upon uh, an adjacent um, residential area. So, so that's the intent. We didn't want to be too specific because you're exactly right in that case. Um, you know, the, the exceptions start to rule. So, so that's the reason for that. Okay. Thanks. Um, I just have a few comments and I actually um, have a, a substitute motion that I'd, I'd like to make. And I just really want to appreciate the mayor's comments, um, you know, around us being able to provide input into this. And I, I think that, um, you know, that's, that, um, 
you know, we, we've all been able to provide some level of input into this. Um, but the one thing um, that I've been hearing from the community and that I've been expressing throughout this process is that many people feel like they that there hasn't been enough outreach and opportunity for community members to, to weigh in. And so um, I have, don't have, um, I have more concerns around the process that we've uh, had with bringing this forward. A number of members of the public contacted me and, you know, this is a new, for many people, they feel like this is a new ordinance that's coming before them and they haven't really had a chance to look it over and weigh in. And um, in, while I, I think that, you know, we need to find a balance in the community around, um, you know, what we're going to, like, getting the impacts of homelessness, um, but then also trying to provide services to people. I think it's also really critical that we're providing people with an opportunity to weigh in in a meaningful way. Um, it's based on the conversations we've had. I mean, we started this conversation back in February. It's now May. Based on uh, some feedback we heard earlier from city staff, it doesn't seem like this is going to be up and running until probably late July, June, possibly even July. And with that, I wonder, if, just based on the timeline for the RFQ, identifying provider, signing contracts, you know, getting everything up and, and, and running, um, it's, it's likely going to take, you know, at least another month and a half, possibly even two months until we actually have something up and running. And I feel like, within, you know, for members of the public who have expressed that they would like to have more opportunity to weigh in, um, it seems like we could use that time to provide um, more outreach and more engagement with the community, uh, especially seeing as how what's before us tonight is, you know, of the first reading of an ordinance, and we agreed that we weren't going to bring forward, you know, what we previously had. So I think for a lot of members of the public, you know, they feel like if this is something different, they've only had a few days to kind of look it over. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll see if, Bonnie, if you could put up the um, substitute motion that I'd like to make. I, I emailed over some language, Bonnie. Oh, is it not sharing? No, well, we just yeah, your your word word screen. So given the, you know, we have some potential time to have more outreach occur, I thought, you know, what might seem like a good compromise would be to direct staff to continue moving forward with establishing safe sleeping and storage programs as previously directed, provide a minimum of two public meetings for members of the public, including us individuals, to provide feedback on the ordinance and input on what they would like to see come forward and their concern and concerns. Provide updates on feasibility of establishing safe sleeping and storage programs, including costs, potential operators, sources of funding, scope of work, and any other relevant information. And bring forward an updated ordinance along with an emergency ordinance for adoption when it is clear what programs are feasible and locations for sleeping and storage services after receiving public input. And um, the comments I'll make around that is that, um, you know, there's still a lot, there's Staff mentioned that there's going to be a lot of outreach going on in the community around what these programs will be and how we can stand them up and who the providers are. And, you know, it seems like we really want to understand what is feasible in terms of the programs before we have laws that um, we're creating around these programs. So it's not clear what we're going to – might be that we can provide more services. Um, you know, we can increase those beds above 150. Um, or it might be that we, you know, we can't find a provider that's able to um, provide those 150 beds. So uh, the thought here is that, you know, by providing this kind of direction, um, we can continue moving forward, provide the community with an opportunity to give us more feedback. And Tony, please correct 
maybe you can weigh on on this, but my understanding, just based on the years of being on council, is that you know if we were at a point where, for example, we have a storage, you know, we have a service provider for storage, safe sleeping, the council could potentially pass an emergency ordinance that would immediately take effect, and we could also pass the regular ordinance that would then take effect after a second reading in 90 days. Is that a, cor a correct? Um, yes, if the council makes findings uh, to establish the basis for declaring an emergency, then the council can adopt an emergency ordinance that takes effect immediately, uh, I believe, with the five vote majority. And just to follow up on that question as well, I mean, the council did the uh, homeless state of emergency back in, I think it was 2017 or 2018. So under that, you know, assumption we technically and we we haven't changed that so with that yeah. the council the council uh, uh readopted that in august of last year as well right. um but i would add that the, that the um that the homeless or the shelter crisis uh declaration really is designed to provide a mechanism for um establishing shelters uh without strictly complying with with um, building and zoning codes. So it's not really um, the exact same thing, but uh, but you have declared that there's a shelter emergency in effect right now. I guess it would also be safe to say, I mean, I'll, I'll just, my comment would be that I think it's also safe to say that we are in a bit of an emergency. The fact that, you know, with our current homeless situation. So um, that's a friendly or a, a substitute motion that I'd like to put on the table for consideration. And again, I want to thank all my colleagues and members of the public for hanging in during all the um, time we've spent on this item. Council member, Council member Brown. I'll second that. And um, given that I think I know where that's going, I'll just make my comment now while I have the floor. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, I'm not comfortable with moving uh, the recommendation we have forward for many reasons, and I'm not going to go th through all of them here. Although I will say um, that Sabina Holder, Ms. Holder, um, pretty much said what I would, what I'm thinking, and said it much more articulately. So that's kind of where I, I stand. Um, but so I'll just put in two categories. I'll start with the practical or instrumental. Um, and I think that uh, gets to part of why Council Member Cummings, um, I, I think, uh, um, brought this uh, substitute motion forward. Um, you know, passing an ordinance when we don't even know if we can actually do the things that have said we need to do in order to operationalize the ordinance just seems really cart before the horse to me. It's um, and potentially self-defeating, really. I mean, uh, we need a clear understanding. And I'm hopeful because, you know, we're hearing, and I, and I understand staff is working very hard, and, and I'm hopeful for that. But given that we have never been able to stay before, um, it's, it's hard to imagine that all of a sudden we're going to figure it out and make it happen in this short amount of time. Um, so I think we really do need a clearer understanding of what we can actually do, um, you know, what the city can do, what operators can do um, before we say we're going to do this. Um, otherwise, we're really kind of misleading the public, I think. Yeah, um, I, I imagine others don't agree with that, but I kind of feel like we are if we can't really, you know, operationalize an ordinance without, you know, a whole bunch of other steps. Um, and then the, you know, the other uh, kind of general area of concern that I have is, is obviously ethical, um, you know, leading with compassion. It, I agree, we, we should be leading with compassion, you know, and we should be focusing on trauma interventions rather than enforcement, um, you know, uh, enforcement-focused uh, interventions. Uh, the nurse who the uh, who said who talked about um, you know chemo her chemo patients um, you know thinking about them and you know the hardship this creates on top of multiple multiple layers of hardship um, and suffering. I mean that's not hyperbole. There, uh, you know there's at least one person <laughs> yes who was displaced yesterday um, who is going through chemo. And so that's, this is real. This is the experience people are having in the world. These are, they're humans, human beings. 
um, you know, to even the discussion about, um, you know, oh, you know, adjacent to schools and neighborhoods and basically, you know, trying to get us to their where for people to go is and suggesting that um, because one is without a, ho a house that they are somehow um, shouldn't be anywhere near a school is just, you know, it's just disturbing, um, that kind of narrative. Um, it was interesting, um, uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, uh, that you uh, you bring, and I'm really interested to hear that the word compassion in Sanskrit is really focused on, you know, my heart is broken to act, um, and because I feel right now, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go on any longer about it, but I just, I have to say that my heart is breaking with this act that we are considering here. Um, not all of it, obviously, but certainly um, the criminalization part without knowing that we can actually meet people's needs. I'll leave it there. Okay, so we have a um, substitute motion on the floor. Um, Tony, I believe procedurally we have to first take a vote to accept the substitute motion and then vote on it, correct? <clears throat> That is correct. Okay. Want to make sure new council members are aware of that. So um, the uh, council member Watkins, did you have a comment? I had a question. Go ahead, please. Is that okay? Tony, um, you mentioned the emergency ordinance. You'd have to make findings, but I'm confused that if we're planning to have an emergency ordinance, then isn't that sort of putting the cart before the horse because we then would have to retroactively like find the findings to make that happen? Like I feel like that usually comes as a consequence of the findings, not looking for findings to justify the ordinance. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, the, it's kind of complicated because the findings necessary to justify an urgent uh, an emergency ordinance are are sort of quasi legislative, uh, and 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 so. Um, the council's determination that that a state of emergency exists uh, is a is a policy statement that the council makes. Um, you know, the way I think about it is: is there a need to take immediate action that um, you know, that that the, so that the ordinance can take effect immediately? Um, I think our circumstance really. Um, you know, as a, just as a policy matter, I don't think our circumstance neatly fits into that because we're dealing with such a long-term uh, chronic problem. And, um, and the ordinance contemplates that it will be implemented um, as the city rolls out these additional services and resources. So, um, uh, sorry if I can't like answer your question more clearly, but but it's certainly not like uh, you know a, an approaching fire or uh, imminent weather event or something of that nature. I, no, thank you. I think that's really helpful information because essentially what I really read into a lot of this is um, that we a lot of the direction is the direction we're already moving in in terms of public outreach that's going to be forthcoming as well and and frankly having been on the council now for four years and just living in this community I think. You know, it's a, it's a really, it's been an often really circular conversation because it's just so challenging and nuanced and complicated and people are complicated and people are unhoused of all types and um, to the point where it feels sometimes paralyzing. And I um, just recognize the, you know, the wanting to have, um, you know, a balance between engagement and action. And I, uh, I think, you know, that it's individual, right? Whatever that feels like for the individual person who feels like they've struck that balance. Um, and and I think there's a real tendency and often difficulty around really moving from process to action and continuing to have that feedback loop in terms of how to, as I mentioned earlier, for continuous improvement. And I think that also by not doing anything, we really do run the risk of continuing to have nothing uh, as a tool to mitigate entrenched unmanaged encampments, which are significantly challenging for our community, uh, for those that are residing there, for those that are uh, surrounding it. 
and have not been the most healthy way for us to, to work on, on, on this issue in a meaningful way to help our community stay healthy as well as to help the individuals in those encampments. So I don't feel comfortable with this motion uh, uh, for those reasons. You, I see uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Did you have a comment on the uh, on uh, before we vote? Uh, this would be on the sub two votes. <laughs> vote to uh, accept the substitute and then uh, vote on the and if if that goes forward, then we would vote on the substitute motion. I had question on the substitute motion, and um, just for clarification. Uh, public meetings on the current ordinance in today. Is that your intention, council member Cummings? It says provide a minimum of two public meetings for members of the public to provide feedback on the ordinance and input on what they would like to see come forward and concerns regarding this current draft version before us today. Okay, and then, um, uh, bring forward an updated ordinance along with an emergency ordinance for adoption. Can you just explain that intention? Sure. So, um, Mayor, if I may. Yeah, uh, Tony, I just want to understand procedure here. Should we be taking the vote to accept the substitute motion? First, I'm just, I'm not sure if we should be dialoguing if the substitute motion might not succeed. That's my only, just for It's not, it's not required. Um, I, I might suggest that you, that if the council, uh, you know, that before the council debates the substitute motion, um, you might want to consider on whether to accept the substitute motion. And then you can debate on its merits uh, or, um, you know, uh, or advocate for or against it. Right, yeah, that, I think I, really that's the purpose of the um, the vote to accept it, right, Tony? Okay. Right. Before I accept it or decide to accept it, I want to understand just the clarity of the intention. Is Tony? that okay? I'm not debating anything. Yeah, no, I understand, Vice Mayor. I'm actually just looking for um, some of, um, uh, Tony, your thoughts on, I'm just trying to find, follow procedure. Tony, your yeah, thoughts? The, uh, the, both the motion, um, both the motion, uh, a substitute motion is debatable. So, um, so there, there can be discussion as there has been on whether or not to accept the substitute, substitute motion. It's not a, uh, it's not something that can't be debated. Um, I just thought that it might be a more efficient way to uh, actually get to the heart of what action the council is um, going to take tonight. Okay, um, so why don't we go ahead and, um, well, Vice Mayor Bruder, it sounds like you, yeah, why don't, why don't you go ahead and with your, um, your questions and then let, I think I'd like to, I've heard from council member Cummings, I've heard from council member Brown, I'd like to take a vote on whether to accept the substitute motion. But since uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, I, I, I don't wanna cut you off. So let's go ahead and finalize that. And then we can, we'll vote on whether or not to accept the substitute motion and then deliberate if it succeeds. So my, my question was the intention of adding a, uh, the direction of bringing forward an updated ordinance along with an emergency ordinance. And in addition to that, did you want me to provide clarity on the, to the public meetings? Okay, so to the first point, the public meetings, the idea behind this would be that we, we currently have a draft of an ordinance and that the staff would be directed to go out to the community, hold, you know, a minimum of two meetings, whether that's in person or online, where community members could um, provide back on the ordinance that's before us today. And um, I included also, you know, trying to have outreach with the unhoused communities for, to get feedback on the ordinance and provide people with more time to better understand the ordinance and review it. The fourth bullet is that should those meetings occur, 
and that there are um, recommendations. The staff would bring back an updated ordinance with those recommendations. And the emergency ordinance, the reason why I put that in is because if there's a circumstance under which we can, uh, if people are concerned with being able to act swiftly on this, um, an emergency ordinance could be potentially be used to make something happen more immediately. That was trying to get at the concerns around uh, council members feeling like if we delay, then that's gonna delay when we can implement this ordinance. And so the idea would be we have an emergency ordinance that's in place and then we adopt the official ordinance, which would then take a second reading in, in 90 days, 90 days, correct, Tony, to implementation? 30 days after the second reading. 30 days. So that's the intention of those two parts of the motion. Great, thank you for clarifying. Okay, um, so we will go ahead and we have a motion for um, a substitute motion uh, made by council member Cummings, seconded by council member Brown. So we'll go ahead and take a roll call vote on the substitute motion. We want to hear that. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins? No. Kalantari Johnson? No. Brown? Aye. Come in. Aye. Holder? No. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Myers? No. So that motion, um, grab my script here. So that motion fails with members uh, Kalantari Johnson, Watkins, May Myers voting against, and council members uh, Cummings, Brown, and Bruner voting for. So we do have a motion on the floor to accept the ordinance um, as uh, with, with the uh, noted annotations or noted um, um, that was, were pre presented by staff. And if there's not any additional council um, discussion, I see Lee has got um, some of these sections that we have just been edited. If there's no further questions or comments by council, um, then we will, okay. Uh, Lee, do you have those, all of those up so we can see them? Looks like you you do. Actually, um, Bonnie is sharing her screen and has those up. Okay. I wanted to uh, clarify um, one thing, um, and um, that is, um, so actually, Bonnie, maybe if I could share my screen for a second um, so I can find it a little more easily. Thank you. Um, Mayor, you had, and let me make this larger so you can see it better. Um, this is the version with the changes and you had um, suggested that this um, language um, in 040 um, include under two here. Right. The sleeping facility shall be, not be located in or adjacent um, there are other places down here um, where you may want to consider adding that um, this was what we had suggested here facilities noted in this section shall not be located um, you may want to consider adding in or at this location as well for consistency and then um, you suggested um, Someone, one of the council members suggested um, that this be added to uh, C as well. Facilities in this shall not be located. Um, and presumably the uh, approach is to also say in or. Mm -hmm. And I just want to, so, so I wanted to clarify that. Um, I also just wanted to note that um, for C here, um, we, this, this um, as a nonprofit, so the, the, um, potential here 
um, for, say, like a church to have a, a couple of pallet shelters if that church is located in a residential um, in a residential area that would be precluded by this addition. Um, and so I, I want to just put that out there for the council. It's a policy decision. Um, when the um, when the council provides us the direction to um, not have the city um, the city owned or operated properties or facilities. Um, that's where we had um, specified not in residential or not adjacent to residential schools. This one um, would also, it would preclude um, those types of facilities um, run by nonprofit. So, um, you know, there could be some limitations on creativity, but that is it's entirely a policy decision as to whether or not the council wants to um, to do that, and I don't know whether a church would be interested in hosting, you know, a hand of tents or pallet shelters on an interior portion of their property, for example. That may or may not be something that they would be interested in doing, but that was one of the things that we had thought about um, in, in not including that here. And uh, the last thing I'll say is that um, we, we did say as part of prior um, uh, staff reports that we would come back to the council with operational policies related to uh, to this section. So I can leave this up. I, I, I think we need we need two things. Um, one is uh, well, we really need one thing is you know do you want the in or in these other two sections, which presumably so. And then I just wanted to to call that um, the policy implication out for uh, to your attention. I think um, at least from my my request of the motion maker and, and Councilmember uh, Commentary Johnson, mine was focused on the D, and I believe that the Mr. Brown suggested that addition to C, but I wasn't completely sure. He just he he mentioned that, but I can see the conflict in C, um, so I'll I'll leave it to the motion maker. Um, in terms of that. And I believe she's taking a look at it right now. Yeah. Um, can, can you repeat, Lee, could you repeat the, the conflict in C? I'm trying to. Sure, it's not a conflict. Um, you know, this, this you could, you could implement, it's fine. Um, I just wanted to call out for the council so that they understand, um, you know, where, where this, um, it, without uh, this section, without, the, let me, let me highlight, let me be clear. Without this section, um, a, a church, for example, could say, I want to um, host, I want to put up two pallet shelters on um, an interior courtyard of my property. Oh, I see. Um, and if that church was located in or adjacent to a residential neighborhood, which many churches are, uh -huh. they would not be able to do that with this. I see. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to include that then. I would just point out that C also refers to managed encampments as authorized by the city manager or city council, mm -hmm. um, whereas subsection D is a little bit less structured. Okay, that's the got it. Okay, let's strike that then. Let's take it back out. For sorry, which part? Yeah, the the um, red um, text under C. I wouldn't want to exclude churches from I'm doing not, something I, like that. It's, it's what, o, o five O five O C Bonnie. What's uh -oh. highlighted on the screen right now? It, so are we that, we're we're just not including the in or or we're including the red Minus. We're, we're taking out the whole red part. The whole red. So we're not editing that section at all. That's correct. Because my understanding is that um, an instinct could be that church then couldn't stand this up, and I wouldn't want to exclude that. Okay. 
Thank you for that, Lee. Of course, yeah. I mean, there are there are policy considerations on either side. You know, the neighbors um, expressed concerns of, about this, and the council reacted and said, "Let's uh, preclude from residential and schools." Um, and you know, this, I think, if it were implemented, would have to be done so in a careful manner, so that um, it isn't. Um, creating impacts to the screening community. Um, but I, I do think that, um, that you know, we, we may get some creative responses and um, every, every bit can help. And so, you know, if a church wanted to do something like that, that would have impact, um, you know, having that opportunity, I think is um, something that we um, wouldn't necessarily want to preclude. So just wanted to put that out there. And I, and I think, Lee, your point earlier, which is that, you know, the city will be developing sort of sort of prescriptions in terms around operations and some of that. So, you know, if, if this situation did arise, you know, that activity would, would actually be permitted. And part of that permitting would be, you know, typical operational requirements, et cetera, et cetera, correct? Absolutely, and we would certainly have any, um, we would have in any uh, authorizations that we issue revocation uh, provisions so that if there are any acts that aren't being addressed, that we would have the ability to revoke that permit. Okay. Thank you. And, and again, we would be coming back to the council with some of those um, operational considerations so that the council can say, yes, no, these are, these are the kind of things, um, you know, have to have access to sanitation facilities, um, how are you dealing with complaints and um, who do people call, those kinds of things. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so we still have the original motion on the floor. We've clarified the um, uh, adjustments to the language. Uh, Council Member Cummings, do you have uh, questions or comments? I'd just like to make um, final comments and I just wanna again, express my appreciation for the work that's gone into this. Um, I'm not gonna be supporting the motion on the floor. Um, I think that at the, la the last time this was heard, there was a large contingency of people from the community who came out and uh, given that there's still time before any of this would be implemented, I feel like um, there's also opportunities to you know, take what we have before us and have more community engagement. Um, that is what was clearly expressed the last time we had something come before us was that the community felt like um, we were trying to do this quickly and we weren't trying to get as much input and they really were expressing wanting to be included in the process. And, um, and the people who you know, came to this meeting weren't just the homeless activists, it's many members of the community who um, want to see something like this happen. And I think we all really want to see how we can strike the balance. And so, um, well, I'm, I'm, you know, encouraged to see how this is going to turn out. I'm very supportive of safe sleeping sites. I'm very supportive of the storage programs. Uh, we've been able to make them work in the community. I think that um, we can make them work again. Uh, but I do believe that, you know, when we're creating laws that are going to impact people's lives that we really, especially when it comes to probably one of the most controversial topics in our community that we really need to do our best to have as much as possible. And then I'll just end by saying, you know, there was a comment and um, I'm not prepared to make any suggestions, but I do know that there was a member of the public who made a comment around um, qualified disabilities and people needing to, to, to provide doctor's notes. And that uh, pretty problematic. I think the way that it's stated currently, um, you know, many homeless people don't have access to doctors. And so, you know, for them to obtain a doctor's note, and money to pay for a doctor, you know, could be, um, you know, prohibitive and, and they might not be able to do it. So um, that's just one thing I'd like to point out that um, is probably a very big concern that will hopefully be addressed before this is voted on. Um, and I'll just leave my comments there and thank you all again for your time and, and for um, taking my comments and the community's comments and all of our work into consideration. Thank you, council member. Um, I have Vice Mayor Bruner next. Thank you. Um, I had some comments and uh, we were 
surprised with the substitute motion. So now I have um, comments and a friendly amendment I'd like to propose uh, at this point. So um, I think it's, uh, you know, all of this discussion has been really uh, valuable in um, all of us getting around this. And I know this discussion has been going on since the 2017 uh, homeless uh, report and the cash work. I mean, so much work and public input has gone into that. However, with that substitute motion that was presented, there was a piece that I think is very valuable. Um, I think the added time for public input was good. And I'm wondering if the maker of the motion would be willing to uh, ha make a have a friendly amendment um, for that added public input. Even though we feel that um, we've received so much input already, this is a new draft proposal. And while we expect to have it on a Thursday and ready by a Tuesday, the public doesn't always have that option or the opportunity. And I know um, the process for two readings, but I'm wondering if I just that added public input is valuable. Um, the second friendly amendment would be to address the invisible disability that was brought up. Um, uh, and so I'd like to, you know, give staff direction to address that doctor's note um, piece, I think is very important. We have invisible disabilities. Um, I would just hate for that to be uh, uh, not addressed. I think that's vital. This ordinance has many great components, the safe sleeping sites, the daytime storage, collaboration and access to county health services, human services, housing services. Um, there was a caller who called in about the $4 million uh, the city has spent and where has that gone? And I just want to applaud so much of, I know the efforts are, are almost invisible. Um, you know, the $4 million I know, uh, has gone into a lot of prevention and programs, security deposit, uh, programs, rent payments, um, uh, and housing matters, support to encompass community services. Um, there's so much that the city is addressing and continuing to support, and I want to just acknowledge all of that and all of those components are 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 still happening. This ordinance is not to solve the whole thing that all the needs that are needed. You know, there were a lot of callers tonight that kept emphasizing 150 safe sleeping sites is not enough. And no, it's not. Nobody is saying it is, but it's something and um, uh, it's a minimum. We hope to have more. We hope to keep that in context of the county also working on shelter sites. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be within the city. Um, all of us working together to address the pieces uh, that are needed. You know, it's not one solution. We have many solutions needed in this big structural uh, issue that is in our community. And we have a lot of affordable housing. Since November, I think, of 2020, we've approved and uh, the construction of so much affordable housing, uh, which includes transitional housing, permanent supportive housing, low-income housing. We need to have, and again, that, that speaks to the prevention uh, component. So all of those pieces are happening. So uh, I just hope that message is heard and understood um, by the community when those feel that this is not enough. Um, 
it isn't enough and um, it's a piece of all the other pieces. And um, so those are my comments and then I'll bring it back to the, the friendly amendment and ask the maker of the motion. So we have a friendly amendment. Um, I believe Vice Mayor it was to address the um, invisible disability piece. Yes, and the public time, public input time. I'll ask the um, make the motion. Mayor, sorry, yeah. if I can just confirm, uh, Vice Mayor, are you, can you specify the wording on the disability? Are you wanting them to look into the requirement for a doctor's note or? Yes, uh, the, the part, I don't have the number in front of me if, if someone could bring that up. Um, but where that would fall under if we can get language. There it is. Just making sure that any invisible disabilities, uh, oh, for OD, oh, for OD. Let me pull it up in front of me. There it is. So, are you wanting to edit the ordinance or are you wanting them to, to bring back? information on it I am uh, hold on give me one second to look at this so I can direct you I am wanting to edit that physician's verification uh, to the ordinance. Because it's speaking to the um, disability that's not apparent to city staff. So specifically, what are we changing that sentence to? Just delete the fact that they may ask? So, um I think you probably want to take a look at qualifying disability uh, definition. That phrase. In O2O, it means a physical or mental disability that prevents a person from being able to, on a daily basis, deconstruct and put away uh, an encampment. Yes, but the. Uh the wording in there that to provide uh, verification. It's actually section D. It's 3D, I think it's the language, um, Vice Mayor. Um, at the very end of that sentence, it says, a person who claims to have a qualifying disability that is not reasonably apparent to city staff may, ask, may be asked to present a physician's verification of a qualifying disability. Um, is that... Can, is that the language is yes does that need to be in there I don't I, I guess my question would be I don't know how uh, um, I just don't know how police would or I, I just don't know how anybody making contact would be able to maybe maybe Tony you could speak to that or Lee um, I would say that um, this, my thoughts on it are that this, I think, um, were, uh, this statement was arguably more, um, uh, carried more weight with the prior version of the ordinance. And that's because earlier versions of the ordinance, recall, had um, allowances for individuals who could not unpack uh, or pack their belongings um, to remain in place for 72 hours. Um, and the attorneys have worked in, and we've had some conversations back and forth. And, and I think um, we've, we've tried to um, do a lot um, to address this issue of individuals with qualifying disabilities. 
in terms of um, now providing reasonable assistance. And so that's really what this is related to now is if there's an individual who um, has a qualifying disability and they're not able to pack up um, that reasonable assistance would be provided to them. Um, that's a very different um, scenario than um, and, uh, being able to remain in place for, I think it was four days uh, that they could stay in place. So the implications of taking this out are um, less uh, now than they were mm -hmm. before. Um, there still could be um, abuse of this, sure. Um, but, um, you know, I, I don't think that of its removal um, are as, um, uh, as uh, much as they would have been in prior versions of the ordinance. I, don't know, Tony, you want to I would tend to agree. I don't think it would. I don't think it would um, uh, substantially uh, affect how the ordinance is implemented if we were to um, delete that sentence as suggested by uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Now, the, the challenge would be, you know, is there a safe sleeping location where someone um, says? You know, I'm unable to um, pack up my tent, and so I need assistance doing it on a regular basis. And um, you know, that that's that's the flip side. Is you know, someone could then abuse that scenario, frankly. And um, so, there's pro and con to it. Yeah, I I just don't. I I would like to see that the position not be a requirement and that someone would not be in violation of this ordinance um, because they don't have that. Is there, is there discretion in the way that that's written in that the word may is, is operative there? Yes, it was intentionally written that way so that, um, you know, a person in the field could make a common sense determination about whether or not a person had appeared to um, or exhibited the qualities of um, having a disability. And I would just add a disability that would render the person unable to um, relocate their belongings such that they would need assistance from uh, city staff to, to do so. I guess I would ask the maker of the motion if you're, I believe it's a proposal that that be struck. Given I think what I heard from staff, if I am not following or tracking exactly what is being said, is that if that were struck, then it doesn't substantively change that component of the ordinance because it's already sort of covered under the other language find it, which talks about reasonable assistance available. Is that accurate? Um, somewhat. Um, the, um, the issue here would be that, um, you know, if, if someone is um, capable of doing that, but is not to do so, then um, under the ordinance, they if this section were not there, and you know they they could say I need assistance every day, which you know can can result in you know staff time in assisting that um, individual. So um, you know that's where I think as. Attorney Kandati was saying, um, you know, it, this provides some discretion for the city. So if, you know, someone's seen, you know, if someone's biking and running around at, at one point and then, you know, an hour later they say, hey, I can't pack this up, you know, absent this, 
I think we would be um, we would be mandated to assist them in um, packing up their belongings. I, again, that's a visible example that you brought up. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, and they may or may not have a, a verif physician's verification. Um, it's still in the ordinance here for assistance, and there may be someone who will need daily assistance. Um, but the fact, the physician's verification should be irrelevant. Maker of the motion. I <laughs> know <laughs> um, I'm just trying to, um, I don't know if the seconder wants to add. I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable because I feel like to a certain extent we could take that out and then see how it goes. And if there is, a feeling not working as written, then we could bring back a potential for um, an amendment. But I'm also concerned that if we do it based on uh, individuals' words or uh, kind of misuse potentially, then are we not necessarily going to have an effective approach? So, I mean, I welcome uh, the, the seconder if they have any you know, any comments around. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. I, I hear um, your concerns, Vice Mayor Brunner. It seems like the word may, as um, Tony mentioned, gives the discretion. Um, so uh, I don't know. It, it just it seems like the word may there gives us the discretion to not require a verification. Um, I am also concerned of, of this being misused if it's taken out. Um, so that's my that's my concern there. And then and then. Um, I, I did have a comment about the engagement, but we'll wait till this piece is community engagement. We'll till, wait till this piece is resolved. So the May word, um, let's let's say they don't have, or let. Uh, so then, what happens? They're in violation, correct? Uh, they wouldn't be in violation. Um, required to to uh, pack up their belongings themselves. And they would have the opportunity to go to, uh, you know, if they needed a physician's verification, they could go to, for example, um, the HPHP offices at um, Housing Matters and um, get a physician's verification there if they needed that. Can, can I add to that? You know, typically staff will work really hard with individuals to provide them, to refer them to assistance uh, through. The outreach workers, we have the outreach workers, uh, obviously, as you're familiar with, mm -hmm. um, and they'll connect them to services. And, you know, the spirit of the ordinance is to give everyone the every opportunity to uh, access services, uh, including medical services, which are available at Housing Matters, uh, for example, at the, at the there. Um, and so those referrals will, will happen. I think the concern here really is that uh, uh, it's some, this is it would be an extreme example of somebody uh, that was really trying to abuse this potential, uh, and that's that would really be the concern. And that that would be an extreme situation. I think for the most part, staff doesn't run to enforcement uh, uh, until it's it's an extreme situation where somebody really is is trying to. And, and I think it'd be helpful to have a tool to be able to address those extreme situations uh, when they come up. And if they don't, we can always report back and if it becomes an issue, I suppose. But I think that's the concern that uh, there'll be abuse uh, and it'll be a loophole that people will take advantage I, of. So if the staff has the option to ask for a physician's verification as sure. it's currently written, and if they don't have that, staff can want to assist? Is that what's being implied? No. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, so if um, we would we would generally be assisting, and if there is a instance where we have reason to believe that um, you know a staff member has reason to believe the person is capable, they could say, hey, um, you know, can you get verification for this? 
And again, it goes back to the invisible disability, like for staff to determine something like that. Um, and they may not have a physician's verification, but they will, I think is the greater concern than the possibility of uh, ab abusing that. Uh, wonder if I could offer a suggestion, Mayor. Yeah. Oh. Or Vice Mayor, I wonder <laughs> if we could say that um, if it's, they may be asked to present a physician's verification at disability, um, and be open to receiving assistance uh, in regards to movement, and that it kind of covers that that they'll still be open to receiving the re receiving the assistance, but. Um, not necessarily not being able to provide the verification. Do you see this a little bit? Yeah, I just don't want the lack of verifi physician's verification to be an, uh, an obstacle to receiving assistance. Um, I don't think that. Or, or we could just explicitly state, state that, that the lack of um, physician's verification cannot be uh, an obstacle to receiving assistance or something like that, potentially. How would that substantively change the ordinance? Because I see I, you're looking for a safeguard in that regard, and I don't know if that could, how would that, I don't know what that would look like. I, I think that would, uh, if it's not, an, if that's not, well, I think it would essentially amount to the deletion of that um, section. Um, you know, just as an option, they, they could, um, you could have uh, staff um, track and report on how many times we actually request that. That was my other thought, that if we are try to see how it works and then have verification or, I, you know, an assessment of when it occurs and then review those cases potentially as needed or something like that to ensure that it's not, um, a, you know, an unintended consequence for a, a, this population potentially. That could maybe, I don't know, be a, somewhat of a, a tool that we could use, but I'm, I'm open to other suggestions. I'm just trying to see how we can kind of get, get, get kind of agreement on what I think is the intention and, around that. Yeah. Uh, can you say that one more time so I understand what you're suggesting? That essentially we would, given that we're going to have sort of uh, data collected and a, sort of a review of how this is working so that we can make changes, that we would ask uh, our staff to identify these situations when they, at, when they may uh, have to ask the individual to present a physician's verification of a qualifying disability in those circumstances, and then review those to see if it's an impediment to the population and or if, um, you know, if it, if it works, and then just change the language essentially as needed and, and adapt and kind of refine, right? That's kind of the hope I think with a lot of this is that we constantly learn and refine, um, but not right. completely change it substantively. We, we yep. get feedback from police or others, um, reach workers, service providers, collect that data and then refine as needed, yeah. needed versus taking the, making the revision tonight, the suggested revision tonight. Vice Mayor? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with um, the revisions, you know, and refining that we will uh, but it brings me back to simply deleting that last sentence and tracking to refine and revision in the future um, is is the simpler way without changing it substantively. Which way does the motion maker, which way would you like to delete the sentence and then assess um, via data that there is potentially um, folks not, you know, potentially kind of evaluating how that's working in the field, or do you want to keep it in and evaluate on the backside? 
Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I think maybe since I see a number of my colleagues with their hands up, I'd like to hear what some other people might have to add, you know, um, but I'm, I'm open to that. Um, can, can I make a suggestion? Sure. I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a comp- there are competing concerns here. Uh, one is uh, Vice Mayor Bruner's very legitimate concern that people um, such as the the uh, person who is receiving chemotherapy or has a heart condition or something of that nature that is truly a, a qualifying disability but is not readily observable um, will not be burdened unreasonably by this requirement. On the other hand, um, I think it is fair to say that a significant number of people that the staff encounters uh, on a daily basis um, in large uh, encampments um, are are not in every instance credible when uh, someone might assert that they have a disability. And so really the intent here is to give staff reasonable tools to deal with the person as Lee suggested, who's riding a bicycle or shooting baskets or doing something of that nature, but they can't fold up their tent. And so I have some alternative language that I could share that that it is my uh, attempt to address that. I will call on other, I, I have a suggestion for Vice Mayor uh, Bruner. Um, Position, maybe directly not identifying physician, but maybe there's also another category of a clinical advocate or a case manager. So um, someone under the care. Uh, uh-huh. Maybe. That could be an option. I know, um, you know, working with the uh, the and the mental health liaisons that uh, oftentimes there are certain individuals they are familiar with their cases. So maybe there's with with their situations, with their needs, um, and have been working with those individuals, um, and may know their story and and their struggle, their qualifying disability. Um, so maybe extending those types of categorizations of folks that may be able to provide some verification if it is an invisible a disability, maybe just by extending some of those other service providers that may have um, knowledge of the person with that. And then- yes, it, it's in the right direction. However, in the moment when you have to, what if no one's there to verify that or, you know, that you wouldn't receive assistance it's a burden on the individual when already we have to look at the burden. Okay. Okay, I'll go ahead and bring it out for other council members. Um, so right now I think we're trying to remedy this language and this particular language. I think there's also a motion for a substitute or excuse me, a friendly amendment to add um, some public hearings. Um, I'll call on Council Member Brown and then Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Council Member Brown, are you planning to address this particular change in the ordinance that we're working no, on? No, no, I'm not. I raised my hand quite a while ago just to make one comment. I can wait until we're, you're done with this. Thank yes. you. Uh, Council Member Colin Tari Johnson, did you have a comment on this particular item or on the public hearing piece? Uh, I, I had a comment about the public hearing, but it seems like this specific item isn't resolved, so I can I can wait. Um, and and oh, oh, I will I will just comment that um, adding um, clinical advocate or case managers, um, I think I really get maybe get to what Vice Mayor Brenner is um, is is trying to move us towards. And and then the other suggestion that Council Member Watkins brought up. Um, that we come back and uh, look at how this is being implemented. If, um, I like that suggestion and, and would recommend staff to direct staff to add that as one of the indicators um, that we would be tracking because we had a list of indicators. So not an indicator, but um, one of the specific Next. items that we'd be tracking. Yeah. Uh, I'll go to Councilmember Golder. Do you have uh, language on this particular one? 
Well, I just, um, I, I think that everyone's good intentions here. Um, I just want to everybody, uh, and people have brought it up already, but I think when someone's being contacted to clean up and they're saying, I have a disability, I would hope that whoever was helping them would help them that first time and direct them to the HPHP where they can have walk-in physicians um, um, get, get, go to a doctor's appointment where they have access to medical care. And and so I, I just, I guess, um, yeah, I would just, I, would hope that the whoever was contacting them to clean up would take into consideration if they didn't know the person that direct them towards where they can get a physician's verification and with that some assistance for whatever their disability whether visible or invisible is and so that's kind of what um and i and i also was wanting us to just look up the, uh, put this in and Reevaluate: Are people taking advantage of the, of the if it is a loophole that people are around or whatever? Like, I I, I don't know. It, that's what way. Sorry. Okay. That's what I'm thinking. Councilmember Cummings, did you want to speak to this item? Yeah, I just had because um, a couple things came up, um, and I, I do think that um, you know, case managers and other people providing notes probably. Sounds like a good compromise. I would, I do want to ask, and I don't know if Susie is available or somebody who's, or you know, um, but or if anybody on staff can answer this question. But I think this is an assumption that we have, which is that you know people who are experiencing homelessness can kind of just walk in to HPHP and get an appointment and get a doctor's note and walk out the door. And my, it's not that easy to get a doctor's note, especially when you're experiencing homelessness. And so I really, it would be great to hear from staff, you know, um, what the reality is around getting those notes. And then also, I think there's also an assumption that everyone experiencing homelessness has a case manager and many people haven't been connected to services. And I think it's, you know, really critical if, if you know, somebody, um, you know, has a disability and countered camping in unsanctioned areas, um, you know, what's the opportunity for us and the potential for us to connect them um, to case managers? Because ultimately that's what we want to do, right? Mm -hmm. We want to get people connected to services. And so I, I guess that's just a concern I have is that um, that we're working on a couple of assumptions here and I'd like to get, like, we can get a reality check yeah. around, you know, how people can see doctors and how we can connect people to case management and case workers. I do. Council member, I just, I just took a tour there less than a year ago and i was i was i asked that and they said there's a walk-in clinic and that you could get same day services if you need and that you could make appointments that's what i was told so yes assumption uh i see Susie o'hara has come on Welcome. yeah i thank you mayor um just um confirming that director butler would like me to weigh in i'm happy to do that if so go for it Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member, for um, the prompt. And I just want to um, express just some empathy around how challenging the subject is. Um, generally speaking, HPHP does have walk in hours Monday through Friday. Um, getting uh, a qualifying disability physician's assessment is not going to be a drop in situation. However, everybody who walks in does have access to clinical support. And so what I would say about the <clears throat> invisible disability or if there is an interaction with law enforcement or an outreach worker on whether somebody has a qualifying disability, it seems as if what council is trying to do is say, as, you know, under no circumstances could should first contact under this subsection be um, you know, lead to enforcement. And I think, you know, staff should have some potential to evaluate whether um, their conversation is happening um, with transparency and honesty. And I think multiple interactions will allow for that. I do think um, with a first interaction under this subsection, it would be really hard 
to um, assess how best to move forward. And I, so I do think that um, having that caveat might be helpful and, and alleviate some of this challenge. And then secondarily, I think um, as uh, Vice Mayor Bruner mentioned, you know, while not everybody has a case manager necessarily, most folks that are on, you know, have a disability or on SSI do have um, clinical support at the Homeless Persons Health Project or at the clinic at Emmeline. So um, I think in large, it's gonna be a very small fraction of folks that might fall into this loophole. Um, and and I, I do think the, the intention is to have repeated contacts and making sure that um, we're not you know, disrupting um, and or further challenging somebody who um, just simply cannot meet the expectations of this particular subsection. Okay. So I see language up, um, the language on the left side, is that from Lee or um, it looks like we're trying to get to this uh, qualifying disability that um, staff reasonably believe, based on objective factors that shall be documented, may be asked to present physicians, and then we could add clinical, um, we could add that language, um, just trying to, um, I, I, I provided that language and I'm realizing it's an incomplete thought, so. Um. I was wondering where that came from. Take that down, and if I get, if I finish my thought, I, I will try to put something back up. Okay. Um, Susie, I think your suggestion about no first contact interaction shall resort in enforcement of this subsection might be the key to what Count, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner is trying to achieve. So maybe using that language, um, Tony, is that correct? Yeah. Vice Mayor Bruner, does that sort of address your your concern? It just seems simpler to delete that that sentence. <laughs> a person who claims to have a qualifying disability that is not reasonably apparent to city staff may be asked to present a physician's verification of the qualifying disability. Like it doesn't serve a purpose enough to have it in there. Uh, the maker of the motion, are you, are you, I think we're stuck. So someone's got to move somewhere. Um, and I think we could debate these, probably this language for a while, but it, I think there's also that assessment on the backside that could be done if this, this does arise based on all the context that mm -hmm. there's language that maybe needs to be brought back in. But I'm trying to, we've been talking one for almost an hour now. So I think we need to, someone's got to, someone's got to, Someone's got to accept something. Um, mm -hmm. so sure. If the maker of the motion might be willing to uh, potentially uh, agree to remove that with, um, and then uh, hopefully on the with the data collected in the field, we could find out if that needs to be um, re put back in at some point. I think that yeah. might be the fastest thing to do at this point. I, I turned the language up here, but I would tend to agree with the comment that the mayor just made. Okay, I'm I'm fine with that. I, I mean, and I hear the concerns and considerations around around it. So obviously, we'll want to look at it and track it. But if that is the you know the consensus of where we're at at this point, then I'm then I'm fine with removing that language. Whoever's screen is up is we're seeing your house. <laughs> um, if the second girl also is, is the second girl amenable to that? Yeah, that's fine as long as we track it because it does seem like there was a purpose to it. So let's just make sure we track that. Okay. Okay, so we will strike that sentence. I think we, before we move into the public hearing piece, which was a suggestion around process, uh, if the maker of the motion might be amenable, I'd like to revisit um, the section that we just discussed earlier, which was 6.36.050. Um, let's see, it is item C, which we had struck all of the language um, regarding um, the statement of um, 
categorizing the facilities and where and, and whether or not they could be adjust, adjacent to residential neighborhoods or schools. So this is um, the, the language in this section is at events or in a manner that is authorized by the city council or city manager, such as managed encampments and or managed safe sleeping zones for overnight tent encampments, which may be managed by the city, the county, or an approved nonprofit. These may be authorized on any public or private property in any zoning district and in areas that would otherwise prohibit such uses. We had a suggestion that facilities noted in this subsection shall not be located adjacent to residential neighborhoods or schools. If there was one comment that was very clear in all of the dialogue we had um, a couple of meetings ago, um, it was the, frankly, the, the concern that, um, that residential neighborhoods or schools could potentially be impacted by these facilities. So I'm wondering if the maker of the motion, um, I'm wondering if a way to go about this would be to add back in that language where we say facilities noted in this subsection with the exception of neighborhood churches or churches shall be located adjacent because I think what we were really working on was trying to make sure that if a church in a residential area was going to potentially be a site for this we would be able to accommodate that but I think um, deleting it all together I think we we get um, people that who are also weighing in on the side of saying we support facilities we just don't want to see them adjacent to our neighborhoods or adjacent to our schools whether that's right or wrong, or you agree with that or not, I'm just trying to figure out a way to um, acknowledge that churches may play that role, but I would like to um, ask the maker of the motion to see if we could put that language back in, which would be, just, so the be facilities noted in this subsection with the exception of churches shall not be located adjacent to the residential neighborhoods or schools. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Okay, and a seconder? Uh, yeah, yes, and I just I have a question. Um, I know some communities have had schools who put up shelters, um, either in cases of emergency or um, yeah, in cases of emergency. So would this, would adding that preclude us to have schools step in in cases of emergency? Otherwise, I am okay with it. I would say as, as written, it would. I'll, I'll share my screen because sometimes it's easier to actually read. <clears throat> so I've gone uh, back to this section uh, C and um, facilities noted in the subsection with the exception of churches. Uh, and actually we should say uh, religious assembly uses may not be a, a church. What if what if um, what if we had um, school sponsored programs? Like if a school wanted to do something, facilities noted in the section with exception of religious assembly uses or school sponsored programs. Mayor, would would that work? I, I yeah. So are you a, for a school maybe that? Um, potentially had one or two safe sleeping, you know, maybe a few things for a student if there was, if we were found that that was needed or a student was, I, I'm fine with that. Yeah, and, and, I'll, I, and I'm just, I'm thinking of, um, you know, recently Cabrillo College put up trailers for the Tay Transition Age Youth Program um, as a shelter in place site. Um, so that's a, that's a college, but I think I think there are those instances. So we don't want to um, we don't want to use language that would exclude school programs that want to do something like this. Okay, I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, so the maker of the motion is okay with that language. Seconder is is okay with that language. Yep. Okay. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner had one other um, requested change to the motion or a uh, friendly amendment, and that was to include two additional public hearings. So I'd like to um, uh, provide an opportunity for the motion maker to respond to that request. And I wanted to see and get clear in regards to some of the outreach strategies that I think I heard or kind of were identified, but I don't have offhand specifically. Sure. Um, so 
So a few things that we're planning on doing um, coming up in the near future. Um, one, um, we will be um, engaging some of the um, technical experts in the field, people who have experience um, either operating or residing in these types of facilities to um, help us better gauge the um, responses that we're getting to the RFQ and potentially even, you know, to, to put an addendum out to the RFQ um, if um, there are things that, that warrant um, uh, uh, revisions to that. Um, and then um, we'd be doing site-specific neighborhood outreach. So anytime we're um, contemplating one of these locations, out to people in the immediate vicinity to um, engage with them, understand their concerns, see how we can adapt the, the uh, proposed facility to address those concerns. Um, and then we've got a webinar coming up um, uh, next week that is a broader webinar about the, the services that uh, the city provides. And then we'd be doing the um, uh, risk specific um, uh, webinar for those who are looking at um, providing the services that we're requesting in the RFQ. So that's, that's uh, the, the current slate that we have planned in the next um, few weeks. Thank you. I guess if I could get clarification of what um, what the two additional public outreach efforts look like beyond what was identified by staff already. So just so, just so I'm clear on what that translates to. I think for uh, my intention and um, and how I see it is we I have received uh, comments that it's it's difficult to have time to really go through this type of um, ordinance on from a Thursday to a Tuesday um, and have uh, for the public to feel that they are part of giving the input and not everybody has opportunity to do it within that time. Not everybody has opportunity to be on this call. Um, so just giving extra time um, for that input so that our constituents can feel that they've had a chance to weigh in. And I understand email, uh, we sure get a lot of emails and that is another uh, option. But really, um, you know, with everything forward and there is no immediate next week time frame and uh, that we need to adhere to, I think it would be a very appreciated um, thing to do to allow that extra time. And, you know, two public hearings, one public hearing, even that would be, I think, um, really important. If I may jump in as a seconder of the motion, um, Vice Mayor Brunner, is this, um, are you suggesting in addition to the webinar that is taking place next week, mm -hmm. something that looks different than that? I think so. Okay. Um, and, and the other comment I wanted to make is that um, I've also seen a number of emails that have um, indicated that there has been public outreach and engagement um, and there has been opportunities to voice um, input on what this ordinance should and shouldn't look like. So I've also received a number of those emails. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I would just say, I mean, it, to me, it seems like what staff has laid out in terms of engagement through the RFQ process, through the webinar, through direct outreach to service providers, um, um, feels like we cover our bases, but but I hear what you're saying, and I hear what um, Council Member Cummings has brought up as well. Um, I think as long as it doesn't um, keep us from moving forward with the programming that we have in motion, with the safe sleeping, with the storage, with the transitional shelter, um, I just don't want those programming pieces to be delayed. So as long as we can, um, if staff has the capacity to, to do public hearings while we're moving forward with programming, I, I would be okay with that. I'm gonna programming, yeah. I'm gonna Progr 
Go ahead, Mayor Myers. I'm going to call on Bonnie Bush. Bonnie, do you need to tell us something? Um, no, I'll need. I'll, I'm hoping to be able to go section by section on what I've captured so far. Okay. Before we take the vote. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have I I have Councilmember Brown. I'm not sure if you. And then I have Councilmember Cummings. I I'll just make a comment. Um, I'm not supportive of additional public hearings because um, the main, you know, I'm really hoping we will we'll obviously go through a second reading in two weeks. Um, and then we're trying to operationalize this. Um, I, I, I don't agree that um, this is going to go on forever. I think it's very likely we'll be in the yellow tier very soon. Um, I've heard really, really loud and clear, and I've talked to literally talked to hundreds of people, many of them in person. Um, our community is really ready for this, and um, to continue, keep saying we need to do more public discussion or have more public hearings, um, I just I think we're just sort of starting to lose traction on really, frankly, the severity of the conditions that people who find themselves in these encampments are experiencing. And this ordinance provides us a way to provide services and it provides us a way to make contact with folks. And I've seen our police officer, officers and other fields um, provide very good care and thoughtful care for people who are trying to, um, you know, even if we're trying to move them along um, or move them to another location or get them into a hotel, um, I think if, I, I just feel like having another public hearing is kicking the can down the road. We have a severe and acute issue with encampments. They are not good places for people to be. They're, um, they're, there's a lot of things that go on in them that we need to acknowledge. Um, and um, this provides a huge amount of service level that is tied to having an ordinance in place. Um, putting the programs up without an ordinance in place doesn't really make any sense um, because it's not going to address the acute issue of encampments. And that, again, if we go back to our goal, at least for this one part of our homelessness management, um, that is one of the established goals or stated goals of the ordinance. So that's just my opinion is that, um, you know, we've, we've had at least five, we'll have six hearings Yes, they're formal regarding the ordinance language, but each time we've made changes, um, and I just, I just think, I think we need to decide whether to adopt the ordinance and move on and get into a programmatic mode on this rather than continue to have more hearings. That's just my thought. Um, I'll uh, acknowledge uh, Councilmember Reddy, then Councilmember Cummings, and then Councilmember Golder. I am uh, so uh, just uh, mayor, if I may, in response to your the comment you just made, I, you know I I hear you and I, I understand um, the urgency, um, and I just I just want to point out that um, I I too understand the emergency, and I also believe that the way to address that is with the programmatic stuff, and I don't think we need a camping ban to give us <laughs> the political will to. Um, to you know, develop these this kind of programming. Um, unfortunately, that's what's happened. Here we are. Um, the comment that I was going to make, though, was um, <clears throat> why I had my hand up was uh, related to churches, and uh, I just wanted to say I was surprised to hear that staff is not aware of churches who um, would be interested in this um, because they, as far as I can tell, have been begging us for years to <laughs> have more of a role and. So, you know, I would really encourage you to get in touch with the, um, them if you haven't, um, because I think that you will find um, there is an interest there. And it's in some cases a resource question, but they do have lots of volunteers as well. So uh, it's a resource question, <coughs> the, you know, a more cost effective answer. Um, so that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Cummings? Thank you, Mayor. I just also wanted to comment that, you know, we, as we mentioned before, I know that we've had a number of these meetings, but, you know, we started this back in February, and I know even um, we, the council kind of rushed to put something on the books, and 
as a result of that, many people in the community weren't felt like they weren't aware of what was happening, and when they became aware, were pretty upset with uh, the direction we were going in. And as a result, we're back here today. And although I do understand that there's an urgency to with the establishment of encampments, um, but one of the things that's been pointed out, and this is you know for the community to take into consideration, is the fact that you know there is still time. Um, you know, the RFQ hasn't been issued yet and hasn't been finalized. And so between the final, between the time when we finalize that, when we get the uh, proposals back until a decision is made and then a time for rollout is actually established, that's likely going to be another month and a half to two months. And so, you know, we can't, there is time. It's, you know, it's May 11th. Um, we could have um, outreach occur between now and the first meeting in June. Uh, we could have the first reading at the first meeting in June and the second reading at the second meeting in June, and that would still provide us with time to roll everything out, especially because we don't have an identified uh, provider yet, and we haven't identified, you know, costs or, or any of these other um, things that are really important and critical for us to get these services up and running. And so um, I do understand the urgency, but I think that you know, one of the things that I'm hoping that comes out of trying to have more of these conversations is that we can rebuild trust with many members of the community who don't feel like they can trust us right now. I mean, and that's because we received, what, close to 1,500 um, emails regarding the TOLO and people not wanting to have the TOLO move forward at the, not the last meeting, but the one before. And so, you know, I just keep recommending that we have this opportunity to, to have further engagement with the community because that's what the community is asking us for. And it would go a long way to cut, to rebuild trust and let them know that we are trying to hear them out. And so I've been, I mean, I've been advocating for this for months now, and, and I'm going to continue to advocate and, and support the, the vice mayor's recommendation. So um, I'm hoping we can, you know, move forward and figure out a, a good path to make sure that we're having inclusive um, and transparent conversations with the community around this topic. Um, I will go ahead. I, I, I think I'll respond if that's okay. Um, again, I'm just wanting to make clear. Uh, it, there has been extensive outreach. There's been extensive opportunity for people to engage in this. Um, we've had extensive planning processes. Um, we um, we're writing a law, which by nature is a public process, includes um, public comment. It provides us the time um, to be able to make changes. We're doing those again tonight. Um, and I don't think that, you know, because we have an RFQ that's going to go out in a week and then maybe it's, um, again, we, we have to set the policy without the policy doing all of those things, you know, um, while it would be good to do all of those things, we also have to bring the policy in alignment with some of the goals that our community as a whole is expressing. And our community as a whole is expressing that they would like us to have a managed approach to homelessness. And this policy is providing a managed approach to homelessness. It's not criminalizing homelessness. It is providing a managed approach to homelessness. Um, and so I, I, that's kind of where I'm coming from in that it, 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 it does provide the policy that then builds the programmatic pieces that put the policy on the ground. Um, if we continue to just sort of talk about, you know, you know, sort of the, the need for more people, and, um, you know, we're just kicking the policy down the, down the, down the road. Um, and I, I guess I, I just end by really stating what I stated at the beginning tonight was, is that, um, I mean, I attended a statewide conference last week on homeless encampments. That was specific to looking at actual, the environmental damages associated. Um, and this conference um, with, you know, a lot of practitioners that work on water quality and environmental protection and things like that. Um, Everyone in, the, in that conference was very compassionate about the, this tragedy that's happening in California. Um, 
but everyone was also acknowledging that this is unsustainable. It's unsustainable for our environment. It's unsustainable for the people in the in these encampments. Um, it is a state responsibility. It is a national responsibility. And I think with the governor's announcement today that he specifically is offering local governments $50 million to address encampments. That is a signal that our management policy that we're crafting right now is in alignment with what the opportunities will be to bring resources to the folks who are in these encampments um, and that need to get into services and need to frankly get into housing. Talking about it for another month or two is not going to help. In fact, if we have this on the books, when we go to look to write this grant, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we can say, yes, we have an ordinance on the books. We have our management policy on the books. It's not perfect. We're gonna keep collecting data. We're gonna keep engaging with our community. Um, we're gonna get regular updates from our staff, but I can guarantee you, we're gonna be a lot more competitive for that $50 million than if we don't have this policy on the books. So that's, that's my pitch tonight. I get to do that. <laughs> So that's my pitch tonight. Let's not just keep keep kicking this down the down the road. I just I it we need to get ready. We need to get ready for this money and we need to take it seriously. We need to be ready as a community. I'm tired of talking and not doing anything. We've got to get assistance for the people who need it here in this community. I'm done talking about it. Okay, Councilmember Boulder. You you pretty much summed up everything I was gonna say, but I just I just don't have any grant opportunities that could be forthcoming. Um, and so, I, I don't. I don't want to delay for that reason. I, I, I see that urgency. Okay. okay. Uh, what do we got here? We have uh, Councilmember Watkins. The mayor. I, I I agree. I just, I appreciate your comments, and I my colleagues, and I I think we all share a real commitment to wanting to see movement here and wanting to see is improved and our community healthier and frankly we want to see us being poised to receive the services we need and that requires us to be bold and take action and to be um, educated action and do the for refinement and i think mary you pointed you you spoke to this point so we don't have to talk about it anymore <laughs> We don't, and I, I just want to say, as the friendly amendment uh, maker, suggester, um, I, I was really referring specifically to this draft. Uh, you know, I, I don't disagree with um, the points of moving this forward. It's, um, you know, the courtesy of this draft and, and giving people the opportunity to sit with this draft and to go through it and to understand it and to to give perspective that we may not see because we only have our perspectives as seven people. And so the community as a whole has a much wider perspective that is valuable as we've seen all of their input thus far in all the previous drafts have helped form this current version. It's pretty amazing the process we've gotten to at this point with this. So that was all. Uh, I was um, really just, you know, if it was until next council meeting, just having that draft out there um, and having people have that opportunity to have it more equitable. So. I wonder if between this first reading and the second reading, you know, our um, our communications person can help with getting it out there and that we encourage their input and feedback on this draft before we make a final decision before the second reading would be sufficient to what I think the intention we all share is. Yeah, we could do that. We could definitely, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, great. So with that, maybe we can kind of reach a compromise in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank great. You. So it sounds like that friendly amendment um, will hopefully be honored with, you know, some really focused communication and outreach. Um, so I think I'd like to go ahead and finalize and get, get our vote underway tonight. Um, Council Member Cummings, do you have another question? I just wanted to see if we could get a clarification on what the motion is before us since it sounds like the friendly amendment might have changed. And so I just want to make sure that we, um, that the motion's clear. That's before us. 
Yeah, just going to ask uh, Bonnie to bring that up so we can see it before we vote. Um, okay, Bonnie, you want to put that up um, and uh, ask the maker to make sure we captured everything on these language changes. Okay. Is it up or no? My Zoom is. I see it. Yeah. It um, it's not in red anymore. It looks like you're mostly noting it in underline, right, Bonnie? That's right. Okay. So the motion would be to um, basically just grab my sheets here. Um, so this would be a motion to consider introduction, introducing for publication an ordinance amending chapter 6.36 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code relating to campus camping services and standards with the following, um, uh, the following um, revisions as noted in these sections. Bonnie, do you feel like I need to read these off? I, I would like to just ask for a clarification on one. Sure, go ahead, Tony. Uh, O4OD, my recollection was that the council, um, uh, that the friendly amendment was to strike the last sentence of this. This is some alternative language that we were, that I was toying with, but, but the, I thought the friendly amendment was to strike it. Yeah, you're, you're correct. correct. All the way to a person, Bonnie, goes all the way to that. That entire sh section gets struck. Right. Okay. Thank you. The amendments um, are going to include um, uh, 6.36.040A2, the addition of the words located in or adjacent to residential neighborhoods or schools. I do have uh, a question about that. Sorry. What was that? The, I do have a question about that. The okay. edit you made here down below Um, is that? That does not capture. It's 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 not part of this. It's not part of all the adjacent sections, right? Let me just look. I think Bonnie, if um, I think you need to add the in or to the um, O or O C below. Keep going down. Where? Keep going down, yeah. O, o, o. Sorry, O50. Yeah. So uh, shall not be located in or adjacent to. So the other part, though, do I need to add with the exception of churches or not? Bonnie's question. Uh, oh, that. sorry. You do not need to add that there. No. That is related to uh, city um, owned or operated, city owned or operated properties or facilities, and we're not operating right. religious assembly uses, so okay. we should be. Okay. Thank you for checking. Yeah, thank you for checking on that, Bonnie. Bonnie, can you scroll back down to 050C, please? Um, with some language about school. Yeah, I think we put in, with the exception of churches and religious uh, assembly. Yeah. Instead of churches. Oh, wait. That wait I, can I, how should I put that? Church. Uh, with, the, with the exception of religious assembly uses mm -hmm. and school sponsored, sponsored programs. programs. Thank you. Yeah. And churches goes away, Bonnie. There we go. And that would be the same down below in the yellow. That looks right. Uh we actually do not need that exception in that section. This, this OD is also referring to um, city owned or proper, or city oh, right. owned right. or okay. operated properties. So that would just say facilities in this section 
shall not be located in or adjacent. Right, exactly. Thanks, Lee, for catching that. Yep. Um, you can get rid of the safe sleeping there. Right. Yep. So, yep, there we go. Okay. And then with that, um, my other question was about this one. I didn't know if we had left that one in there. I think that was Tony Condotti's language. That was not, no, but I it, think it's superfluous. It uh, now yeah. that it's something that's stricken that language. So that's so going on. Yeah. Yes. Bonnie, can you scroll back down to 050D again? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing that. Okay, never mind. Okay. Okay. So, um, quick question: the 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 bullet point on the provider minimum of two public meetings for members of the public. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Council what member. Part of that. The bullet above, the bullet there, middle of the page. Um, go back up to where you were right there. Oh yeah, that was my that was my question. If that right. was saying. I believe yeah. that was a friendly okay. amendment offered that I think was we talked about having our communication specialist right. be so the point person out. to get input from the community between this first reading and the second reading. Good Correct. Question. Thank you, Martine. Okay. I think we may be there. Okay. Hey. Um, actually, um, O50D does include um, private property. If of that, so or the the second line, city owned parking lot, closed portion of right away on private property. Um, so I, I, sorry, I missed that. I think that we should include that. Um, the o, the C, the same C sentence above. Yep. Okay. The uh, exception for um, religious assembly uses and school sponsored. Sorry about that. Cassie caught that, thanks to her. Or you could just post, you can just plug that in at the end of that sentence. Like that sentence, yeah. <clears throat> Any other things, Lee, that you've seen or we? Looks like we're there. Martine, does this look right to you? Yep, thank you. Okay. Okay. We do a roll call vote then. Okay. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Brown? No. Coming? No, and I'd just like to, for the record, state that I am supportive of the safe sleeping storage programs, many of the amendments, but um, many members of the public have not felt that there's been clear and transparent process to provide feedback and engagement, and uh, that's why I'm registering my no vote. Same. Uh, Brown, yeah, sorry. No, I mean, yeah, I, sorry, I. Is it? Vice Mayor Bruner? I. Um, I'm yeah. sorry for interjecting, but the council did also discuss um, deleting subsection J, which was um, <clears throat> subsection J of section O. 
ATO. Right. I, I have that. She's okay. got that. It was on there. I don't, I don't think All we right. made it that far down, but. All right. Sorry. I had a note that that, yeah, that that had been agreed. Uh, I think I was at by Brunner. Hi. And Mayor Myers. Hi. That um, motion passes. Excuse me, let me just grab this. That motion passes uh, with um, five yes votes and two no votes. And so that will conclude our um, meeting this evening. Um, just want to thank everyone and the public for being here tonight. And um, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Good night. Goodbye.